Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. And um, just before we <coughs> I call the clerk, I just wish to make a quick statement. This week a historic occasion occurred in our Senate with the presence of an Auslan interpreter for both Senator Pocock and Senator Shoebridge's first speeches. I would like to thank Michael Ferguson and the team at Broadcasting for their work. I call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Yes, President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I believe we're going to Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Do I need to leave seat leave or anything? Just no. head straight in. Um, I rise to again explain to the Chamber the strong measures being undertaken by the Albanese government in response to the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. I welcome oh, this opportunity to again uh, inform the Chamber about the range of strong measures the government is taking in response to this risk. As I've previously said, this is a serious situation that we now face, not just in relation to foot and mouth disease, but also lumpy skin disease, uh, which has seen an outbreak in Indonesia as well. And accordingly, the government is treating this matter seriously. As I've previously said, expert judgment has indicated that Australia faces an 11.6 per cent risk of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in the next five years, with a higher risk, 28 per cent, of a lumpy skin disease outbreak. It is worth noting uh, that these are not new risks. The last risk assessment conducted for foot and mouth disease in March 2021 indicated that we already had a 9 per cent risk of an outbreak here, not surprisingly when you consider that there are about 70 active foot and mouth disease outbreaks around the world at the moment. With respect to the first component of Senator Roberts' motion, as I previously conveyed to the Chamber on Thursday, 28 July, I am advised as follows. Uh, the exact number of doses for foot and mouth disease held in the vaccine bank is considered confidential information in the interest of national security, including to protect against bioterrorism threats. We hold enough vaccine doses to cover at least the four, uh, sorry, we, we hold enough vaccine doses in the vaccine bank to cover at least the four, first four months of a disease response, which gives us enough time to then order more vaccines. The vaccine manufacturer prioritises the production of vaccines for countries that are experiencing a disease outbreak, as you would expect. The Australian government has provided $1.5 million for Indonesia to purchase 1 million doses of foot and mouth disease vaccine. These are expected to arrive in Indonesia in the near future. While I accept that this may not be the answer Senator Roberts wants to hear, this information remains accurate, as it was when I provided it to the chamber last week. With respect to the second aspect of this motion, I have and will continue to listen to the advice of experts, including Australia's Chief Veterinary Officer, regarding the government's response to foot and mouth disease, including with respect to vaccines. I note that the Shadow Minister, David Littleproud, said exactly the same thing when he was the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, when the outbreak first, first reached Indonesia, Mr Littleproud informed the public that he would listen to the advice of Australia's Chief Veterinary Officer. Sadly, he seems to have abandoned that view when he went into opposition. 
Should an outbreak occur in Australia, time will be needed to determine the extent of the outbreak and logistics for vaccination, if it is indeed agreed to vaccinate. I am advised that for some outbreak scenarios, vaccination may not be used and regaining disease-free status may be quicker without vaccination. These are complex issues and I am being advised by the world's leading experts on the most appropriate approach. I am advised the choice of vaccine is dependent on the strain of foot and mouth disease virus. For example, should we hold prepared vaccine, which was effective against the strain of virus in Indonesia and a different strain of virus occurred in Australia, any prepared stocks may not be suitable. This is exactly why the vaccine bank contains a number of antigens which are effective against different strains of the foot and mouth disease virus. We do not want to repeat the mistakes of the previous government. The most effective use of vaccines at the moment is in assisting our Indonesian neighbours in managing their outbreak. While Senator Roberts may not like these facts, these are the facts. With respect to the final aspect of the motion, in direct response to the emergence and spread of foot and mouth disease to Indonesia, the Albanese government has strengthened biosecurity measures to protect Australia from a foot and mouth disease incursion. These include, for the first time ever, deployment of sanitation foot mats across all international airports in Australia for passengers returning from Indonesia. For the first time ever, declaration of biosecurity response zones in international airports in Australia, which empower biosecurity officers with stronger powers than they've had before. Biosecurity profiling of 100 per cent of all travellers, including extra assessment for passengers who have recently been in Indonesia. 100 per cent screening of all mail items coming from Indonesia. Redeploying biosecurity detector dogs to priority ports like Cairns and Darwin. And one million vaccines to Indonesia. Uh, it's worth mentioning, because this has been misreported before, uh, that the redeployment of those biosecurity detector dogs to Cairns and Darwin does not mean that we don't have detector dogs in other airports. We do, uh, but those airports were judged as requiring uh, supplementary detector dogs, and that's why they've been relocated. Uh, and as some people may have seen in the media this week, they're already doing a terrific job. Again, while I accept that these facts may not be what Senator Roberts wants to hear, these are the facts, and I'm not in the business of changing facts. I'll leave that for others to decide whether they want to do that. The government takes the threat of foot and mouth disease extremely seriously. That's why we've taken unprecedented actions to protect Australia's biosecurity. We will continue to listen to evidence and the advice of experts, including the Director of Biosecurity and the Chief Veterinary Officer, to inform our evolving response. Uh, having dealt with the motion, I might just add a couple of other things by way of update. Uh, as I have said repeatedly, the response that the Albanese government has put in place to this outbreak is the strongest biosecurity response Australia has ever seen in response to a biosecurity threat. It is stronger than anything the former government put in place, despite the outbreak reaching Indonesia while they were still in power. No sanitation foot mats were placed in airports by the former government, despite the outbreak reaching Indonesia. No sanitation foot mats were even ordered by the former government, uh, despite the uh, outbreak reaching Indonesia. The former government did not declare biosecurity response zones in international airports at any point over the last seven years, despite them having had the power to do so for seven years, and despite the fact we've seen 70 active foot and mouth disease outbreaks. Uh, and that, that is followed by the range of other measures that this government has put in place uh, that the former government did not choose to do, despite it having the power to do so. Uh, it is disappointing that One Nation and Coalition senators continue to play politics with this issue, despite the repeated pleas from industry for them to drop their political uh, activities and their politicisation of this matter. As I mentioned to the Chamber last week, a number of industry leaders have come out publicly on this. Patrick Hutchinson from the Australian Meat Industry Council has said Australia should not absolutely not shut the border to Indonesia. The continual politicisation of biosecurity in the media is unhelpful. Jason Strong from Meat and Livestock Australia said foot and mouth disease is one of those things you can make sound really bad and some of the recent commentary has been unnecessarily alarmist. Ian McColl, the New South Wales Farmers Biosecurity Chair said, I see some people out there using this outbreak as a weapon to further their own ends and frankly it's pretty disappointing. Farmers have argued for stronger, sustainably funded biosecurity systems for years. This isn't something that's just happened overnight. 
Those people out there suggesting we need to slam shut travel to Indonesia don't understand that would give a false sense of security, which would actually increase the risk of foot and mouth disease coming from elsewhere. Fanning the flames of fear will not help one little bit. I would encourage subsequent speakers on this motion to reflect on those comments from some of our most significant livestock industry leaders. And that's before we get the comments to the comments that numerous uh, farm and meat industry leaders have made supporting the government's response. Again, Jason Strong from Meat and Livestock Australia. The federal government's response to date has been very coordinated and collaborative. Patrick Hutchinson again. AMIC is very supportive of the Australian government's measured response and believes such a response is necessary in order to maintain strong relations with Indonesia, who need to manage this outbreak with our assistance, not our intervention. Fiona Simpson, CEO of National Farmers Federation. The NFF is working with the Agriculture Minister, Murray Watt, and the Australian government to make sure that we can do whatever it takes, whether it is in Indonesia or here in Australia, to make sure that we can stop the spread of this terrible disease. Now, as I say, if the, the, the politicisation of this uh, matter is already damaging our international trade reputation, and Senator Mackenzie, among others, knows that because she, among others, Order. has received the same calls I've had from industry leaders. But unlike Senator Mackenzie, I am listening to those industry leaders. And it is ironic, and it's very Order. telling, that Senator Mackenzie and her colleagues only began to be interested in this issue after they lost the election. As I pointed out yesterday. Uh, point of order, Senator Mackenzie. Reflecting on senators uh, incorrectly, as usual. I'm, I'm not sure that I can uphold that point of order. Um, the minister was um, comments were I found very general. Minister, go on. Um, as I pointed out yesterday, Senator Mackenzie said absolutely nothing on social media or anywhere else about the outbreak until the 19th of July. Uh, she didn't say anything when the outbreak reached Indonesia when she was still in government. She didn't say anything about it for another two and a half months until the 19th of July. Senator Roberts didn't act, comment on this matter publicly until the 28th of July. Again, playing politics. Uh, this demonstrates that the opposition and one nation aren't serious about this issue and are only about playing politics. So while those opposite continue to play politics despite the pleas from industry to stop doing so, we are acting. We are acting in ways that they never did in nine years in power. We have done more in nine weeks than the former government did in nine years, and we'll keep acting after this. Senator Hanson, I will need you to move to take note of the minister's answer before you commence your contribution. Okay, I move to take note of the minister's answer to this. Thank you. You have the, you have the call. Um, through you, the chair, I've got to say, um, the minister, Murray Watt, is so out of his depth with regards to this. He could have more to say on the opposition benches, but now that he's actually on, on the front bench and he has to respond to this in his ministerial role, he's so far out of his depth. He lives on the Gold Coast. His pups never even looked a cow on the face. He's never birthed a calf. He wouldn't have a clue what he's talking about. And talking about advice, we've all been through the COVID pandemic. He says he's listening to the experts. Well, experts have actually shut down our country. Stop people from having jobs, and he thinks that he knows best what's right for this country. He actually said yesterday that it is the strongest response by any government. Well, again, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This has not been the strongest response that we've seen from any government to any biosecurity threat in our national history, as the minister said in his chamber yesterday. Um, he's forgotten about the COVID-19 pandemic where we actually closed the borders to protect our country from COVID, and apparently the minister has no knowledge of history in Australia's response to the influenza ep epidemic a century ago, when ships were quarantined, schools were closed and millions of vaccine doses were produced here. In his efforts to deflect attention from his misleading the Senate, he's misled us yet again. Foot and mouth vaccines stored in the United Kingdom cannot be used to inoculate animals in Australia until they are brought to Australia. Bring them now. That needs to be done. You know, he talks about um, there is apparently one million va vaccine doses are not enough for these are the figures: 74 million sheep, 26 million cattle, 2.6 million pigs, and one and a half million dairy cows in Australia. We knew how many doses of COVID we had in the country. Why don't we know how many vaccines we have for the animals? Why isn't he telling us that? 
Oh, for security reasons. Why? I don't understand security reasons here. Because he doesn't want to be seen that he's, that he's got such a minimum amount of vaccines for the amount of, of cattle and sheep and um, pigs that we have in this country because we've got nowhere near the vaccines need to protect us. Let me also tell you that if this gets out, we actually have over 24 million feral pigs in Australia. 24 million. Probably none of you know this either. That pigs are virus factories. When it comes to foot and mouth disease, they produce 3,000 times the quantity of the virus than a cow does. They're everywhere. National parks. You shut the national parks down. You haven't culled them. You've done nothing about the pigs. If the pigs get the, it's, the virus gets in the pigs, you've actually got a real problem in this country. Then you've got the camels. We actually have over a million um, feral camels in, in Australia. Then we have about 2.3 million goats, feral goats, and we've got about 2 million wild deer. All these can be carriers of it, and yet you're not talking about this. This is an important matter. He tells, he's, the minister also says to, tells the chamber that we are actually, um, he's got support from these industries. The M NFF, really? Do they, do they really support and um, speak on behalf of a lot of these farmers? I don't think so. I don't think so. They don't. And I and also tell you another thing too. I just got off um, speaking um, with a there is a dairy um, dairy here in Australia, and they are really concerned. This is a dairy industry, a corporation in Australia, who is actually very concerned about it. They said if it gets into the dairy cows, it's worse than it can be for cattle because they will not be able to put dairy cattle onto their properties for three years if it gets into the dairy herd. Now, dairy cattle are very hard to, to breed the cattle that we need for the prod production of milk that we get from them, so it takes a lot longer. You have no idea of the damage that can be done to this country if we get foot and mouth in here. Also, you think of the export. We are regarded as clean and green. If we get it in here, Japan and those other countries won't take our produce. We'll lose the dairy industry, the export of meat, but then that's right up your alley. It's right up the Greens alley and, and probably the Labor Party too. The fact is that you actually want to. Point, yes, point of order. Senator, to um, uh, direct her remarks through the chair. I know there's been a few um, uh, opportunities this week for people to shout you across the chamber. I don't think that's appropriate in this circumstance. Senator Hanson, just please take note that your comments come through the chair. Sorry, sorry um, Deputy President, but my response has been nothing other than referring to what is before us on, the, on this uh, issue. Right? So anyway. They didn't like the fact that I'm referring to the Greens and the Labor Party um, because their policy is they, they haven't been supporters of the agricultural industry. Never. They haven't supported it. It's been one nation, I've got to say the Coalition and the National Party, that have been really fought for the agricultural industry in this country. If it was up to the other side and this chamber, they would shut down our agricultural industry. They want to see cows and the beef cattle destroyed in this nation. They want to see emissions reduced, whichever way it comes about, because it's going to make them look good. Well, you're going to destroy our food security. This is a pathetic response from you, and I'm sick of hearing, but what did you do about it? You didn't speak about this. You know, that, what a ridiculous response that is. You're in government now and all you can do is throw it back with you. What did you do? What did you do? You know, it's like when I move into a house, the electricity bill wasn't paid. Well, you know what? I've got to pay the bill if I want the electricity on. And I just go and do it. So it's got nothing to do with it, blaming the other side because of their response to it. And I'll tell you another thing also. You say foot and mouth is around the rest of the world. That may be the case. But barley is totally different to other countries because cattle roam the streets. Cattle shit on the ground. People walk in that shit. That shit then is brought back in their clothing and in their, on them, their person and back into this country. 
There is a hell of a difference with what happens in Bali, so close to us. Bali is one of our biggest tourist destinations for Australians. Yes, it not, does need to be considered and looked at on the grounds of the damage it can do to this country. And the minister says yesterday, well, if it gets into Australia, if it gets into Australia, right? Well, then we'll deal with it at the time. That's going to be too late. Once it gets in here, we've lost our, our biosecurity um, forever. We will not be able to eradicate it. You can't just say, well, we'll compensate the farmers, because if that's your answer, that's ridiculous. Because the Australian people have had a gutful of actually picking up the pieces with their tax dollars and compensation and remuneration paid to so many people because of our bloody mistakes that are made in this place. If we can close the borders to the COVID, well, then we can close the borders to this until it is eradicated. Yes, by all means, we are fully supportive of defending and you know, stopping it from coming into Australia, but we also must um, ensure that it doesn't get here and it can be brought in very easily. Actually, people, travellers can carry it up their, their nose, the nostrils, for a, a period of about 26 to 28 hours. So that can be brought in the country that way. What is the problem with closing the borders when we did it so easily for COVID? Why not for this? Why not till it is eradicated or under control in Indonesia for the short period of time? Another thing I must question is, why aren't we actually giving heavier fines at airports that people bring in this produce into the country? They make the excuses, oh, I couldn't read English. Me don't understand no English. And that we just wipe it and we give them a chip. Oh, well, that's okay. Oh, no, my wife packed the suitcase. I didn't know what was in it. And until we actually get serious about border security and start charging these people and really being hard on this matter, nothing's going to change. And we are taken like bloody fools and idiots that they can do and say whatever they want to do and say, and we just accept it. The other side. The Labor and the Greens have no idea how serious this issue is. It is so important. It will destroy a lot of our farming sector, the cattle, the industry that we have. And I'd just like to say, if we're propping up Indonesia with this, I hope, I hope it is coming out of the foreign aid that we give them. The foreign aid was well over 650 million. It was about 650 million. It could have been reduced to about 400 million. I'm not sure, um, but anyway, I hope this is coming out of the foreign aid that we give to Indonesia and not another uh, handout to them. But um, I'd uh, I'd like to say that um, One Nation does support this, and you know we probably have been. Um, cut back in our staff, of course, saving monies and everything like that. You know, one and a half million dollars to save monies to the to the taxpayer, but you've just given a hundred million dollars to Ukraine. You've given fifty million to Sri Lanka. You've given money to the South Pacific. So for us to actually do our jobs is extremely Thank hard for Thank One you, Nation Senator to do our. Thank you, Senator Senator Ginger Price. Thank you. Sorry. No, I. She caught my eye. You, I'll give you the call next. Okay. Well, I, I, I set the point. I set the point. Uh, I'll give you the call, and we'll come back to the other senator. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, acting um, deputy, uh, deputy president. Um, very fortunate to be speaking on this um, important matter in the Senate today, and to correct a few um, factual mistakes from the senator, um, who's leaving the chamber, not um, caring to listen about the truth of what's going on. Um, it's important for, for the Brockman, facts to be laid Blair on Border. the table. Uh, Mr Deputy President, as you well know, there is a very strong convention in this place that we do not reflect on whether senators are in the chamber yes, or I not, take, take or whether senators order. are leaving the chamber or not. Thank you. I, 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 the point of order is well taken. It's not appropriate to reflect on the absence of a senator or their leaving or coming to the chamber. I'd ask you to restrain yourself. Except that, but uh, I, I, do, I do believe it's important to reflect on the interest shown um, by members. It's a fair point of order. Uh, it's it's a, it, so, we're now, the Senator, we're, we're now, no, it's not Senator going to listen to your ruling, Chair. Is it going to listen to your ruling? Senator McKenzie, it's not a tick. Uh, 
I, I take that we take the point. I, I've asked the senator to reflect on the comments. If you're reflecting on their interest in a broad sense, that's fine. To reflect on whether they're in the chamber or not is not okay. Senator Green. I understood your ruling, and I will um, maintain that in the chamber here. And 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 it's important to reflect the facts that um, have been so clearly lost in the previous contribution. Um, members on this side care about the agricultural industry in Queensland. We understand fully that 46% uh, of the national head of cattle are placed in Queensland. 11 million head of cattle in our home state, and Beef manufacturing is the largest manufacturing sector in Queensland, and we understand what is at risk. I don't know how many times those opposite have visited our beef manufacturing industries and spoken to workers in that industry, but I am very, very aware. Order, I am order. very, very aware. Oh, you've never known a manufacturing job you wouldn't want to casualise. But we know on this side of the chamber that there is a lot at stake, and that is why. We are taking this issue incredibly seriously, incredibly seriously, and ensuring that we deliver on the things that need to be done to make sure that we protect our beef industry in Australia. We understand, as the previous senator raised, that there are many factors to this, and, and the senator may be inclined to, to take up the report of the Senate Environmental and Communications Committee from last year about our feral pig industry. I know Senator Roberts probably did have a read of that um, because this is an issue where we need to do our research, we need to collaborate. I'd encourage the mover of this um, uh, motion to, to accept the briefings from the minister, to work collaboratively with the minister, to ask the questions. I appreciate that this is a, an area of interest for Queensland senators who care about our industries. But, but we need to understand what the facts are and not listen to the people on the other side of the chamber who did nothing when it comes to biosecurity, who did nothing to protect or prepare the resilience of our biosecurity measures. I am sure that the chamber will join and we have and we know we know that now this and now we know that these that the members opposite are showing an interest in this issue. But for a very long time, for a very long time, they didn't say anything about foot and mouth disease, they weren't interested in the facts. So now I'm here to correct the record, to make sure that people that that members that people in Queensland understand that we are taking the steps to protect the industry and that we have been taking the steps to protect the industry since this started now let's remember that this outbreak did begin under the former government it did begin under the former government and we are accepting our responsibility stepping up as the new government but we know that on the Thursday, the 21st of July, the former minister, um, the, the minister facilitated a briefing for the leader and the deputy leader of the opposition on foot and mouth disease. That's how seriously we are taking this, and we are working collaboratively with those who want to work collaboratively with us. Last week, the minister hosted a briefing with officials, updating members of parliament, working collaboratively, making sure that people know the facts, understand where we're at. Just last Thursday, the minister also updated the chamber on the measures to place protect on Australian farmers. In direct response to the emergence and the spread of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia, the government is ensuring that we have measures in place to protect our industry. For the first time ever, there are deployment of sanitation foot maps in international airports. For the first time ever. For the first time ever. For the first time ever, declaration of biosecurity responses and zones are now in place in international airports Order. for the first time ever. And biosecurity profiling of 100 per cent of all travellers, including extra assessment for passengers who have recently been in Indonesia, is happening. Order. And 100% and 100 per cent of screening on all mail items are coming in, and we're redeploying biosecurity detector dogs to priority ports like my home of Cairns and in Darwin, and the biosecurity responsibility of all Australians, and including those who sit opposite. And I, I, un, um, 
I referred to the comments of the previous senator in regards to fines at um, uh, airports for people who do break the rules and bring in um, uh, items that are not allowed. Well, just this week, just this week, a passenger coming back from Indonesia was heavily fined. A very expensive McMuffin, as it was referred to at the time, but he was fined. He was fined for for breaking those rules, and it shows that the system is working. But unfortunately, while this government has sought to be constructive, transparent, making sure that briefings are happening, making sure that people have the information that they need, then those on the opposite side have chosen to be political unnecessarily on an issue of grave importance for our country. I take this opportunity to remind those opposite that while they are happy to accuse those opposite of not caring about this issue and not understanding the facts, not appreciating how important our industry is, what they're saying isn't actually correct. Because we know that we are taking further steps. We are, con we are considering what the actions are that need to be taken. We are implementing those actions and we are thinking ahead because we need to be prepared and we are making sure that all options are on the table. We are considering how we prepare our industry for this threat. It is something that we need to work together to oppose. Farmers on the broader Australian community would be watching very clearly in this place to see what is happening here. And I think what you saw, particularly during COVID-19, was an expectation from the community that people in this place would work together to overcome threats to our health, to our economy and to our country. And that is what the community expects now. The community, particularly the agricultural industry, expects people in this place to work together and, of course, to ask the hard questions. And Senator Roberts, I, I understand why you are asking the questions and making sure that we are being transparent and accountable. But I'd encourage you to not listen to the, to the, um, the noise at this side of the chamber, who literally did nothing when they were in charge, but to, to understand that this is something we are taking incredibly, incredibly seriously, incredibly seriously, and making sure that when the minister is given advice, he is sharing that advice with the people that need to understand what are the what are the um, what are the measures that need to put in, be put in place, and putting those measures in place. Unlike those opposite, unlike those opposite, the measures have been put in place. Under those opposite, no foot mats, no powers, no plan, nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. When they, were, when they were in power and there was an outbreak, no measures were put in place. But on this side of the chamber, when the minister understands the, the threat, takes the advice and ensures that measures are appropriate, that they are constructive, they are not alarmist, that those measures are put in place. And we do have the support. I know it's very uncomfortable, but we do have the support of the agricultural industry from the National Farmers Federation, from the people who know this industry better, we know. Oh, <laughs> well, look. I mean, I think it's Order. fair. I think it's fair. I think it's fair. And I take that into I take that interjection, Order. and I'd ask the chair to bring the chamber to order so I can finish my contribution in the small amount of time I have left order, to senators. make sure to make it clear to all Australians to understand that the agricultural industry is on supporting the measures that this side of the chamber is taking and they are telling that they are telling those opposite those opposite that they are wrong that they are not helping that making this a political issue is unhelpful to the problem Order. and that they want to see everyone work collaboratively and make sure that we do everything in our power to protect our important industries. That is what we are doing on this side of the chamber. That is what the agricultural industry is supporting right now. And we, and we, know, and we know that it's difficult to be over there on those sides of the, of the chamber, and you're trying to find reasons to stand up and beat your chest, but the truth is that you didn't do anything when you were in power. You didn't have a chance. You didn't put in foot mats. You didn't put in biosecurity zones. Order, we Senator have taken Green, that action. Your time is expired. I'm sorry to say
Uh, before I call Senator Price, I will remind senators that interjections are always disorderly, and if we could try and listen to the contributions of other senators without making interjections, that would be appreciated. I recognise that this is an emotive debate. Senator Price. Thank you, Acting President. I rise to support Senator Roberts' motion. Uh, and I absolutely and utterly reject accusations that we on this side of the chamber are politicising this issue when this current government has sought to scrap the Committee for Northern Australia, which deals in supporting issues exactly like this. <coughs> As a representative of the Northern Territory, it is deeply insulting, and it's insulting to suggest that such an important issue is something that we would play politics with. I would also like to remind uh, the, the president through, through the chamber is that prior to being sworn in as senator for the Northern Territory, I was very proudly part of uh, a coalition announcement on the 23rd of March, uh, that we, we were providing funding of $61.6 million to boost our biosecurity efforts in Northern Australia, which would take our commitment to $1 billion. Order. I, would also, I also uh, reject comments from uh, Senator Rich Wilson yesterday. Uh, and, and, I, and I certainly would not um, <laughs> support his comments around the fact that uh, we're behaving childishly in front of children in these, in these chambers uh, for a party that supports the, the drug use uh, and, support, and actually encourages our school leavers to smoke marijuana, given the effects that it has uh, in terms of marijuana-induced psychosis. So I don't, I don't take those sorts of comments. Um, very kindly, take to those sorts of comments very kindly, nor uh, at their accusations that we're not taking this issue very seriously. As, again, as a representative of the Northern Territory, I'm very, very aware of how important this industry is for the Northern Territory. In the Northern Territory, the cattle industry and related services industries contribute $1 billion annually to the Territory economy. There are 2.2 million cattle across 45 per cent of the Territory's land mass. The Northern Territory pastoralists manage up to 700,000 square kilometres of the land mass. 8,000 head of cattle is the average Territory size herd. The average Territory cattle property is approximately 3,000 kilometres, 3,000 square kilometres. And on average, around 600,000 cattle are turned off territory pastures annually. And let's not forget the fact that the Port of Darwin is the busiest live export port in the world. So these measures are very, very important. And it alarms me that um, Minister Watt, acting president, is more concerned about uh, governing through social media than he is governing through his portfolio, uh, claiming that uh, senators on our side of the chamber didn't make mention on, um, on this issue through their social media, and, and, and that is enough of an argument to claim that we don't care. I reject that. I utterly and absolutely reject that. And I would also like to remind the chamber, uh, acting president, that on the 15th of July, Minister Watt made the pu following public statement. He said, foot baths are not particularly effective. <laughs> this is laughable considering now that they're claiming that they, they are the champions of foot baths. Often people have got more than one pair of shoes. The chemicals for effective foot baths are dangerous to human skin. This is his very own comments made on the 15th of July. Now, on the 15th of July, I happened to be at the Catherine Show, speaking directly with members of our pastoral industry 
who are gravely concerned, gravely concerned about this issue, and as a result of these comments, were ex extremely fearful that this government was not taking this issue seriously enough. They were so concerned, and it is not us um, pushing this, this fear agenda. It was these very comments that sparked the pastoralists, the Northern Territory Cattle Association, members of the Northern Territory Cattle Association, uh, who, who I, ha I haven't heard the minister refer to at all as, as anybody he's um, had consultations with, and perhaps he has, but he's failed to mention them in these chambers, probably because the Nor Northern Australia isn't important to the government, uh, hence why we had to move a motion yesterday to refer the scrapping of the committee to an inquiry. But his comments uh, created a reaction where the pastoralists, the Northern Territory Cattle Association, then at the showgrounds themselves established foot mats for the purpose of uh, demonstrating to uh, this government well, the fact that they really don't have a clue about uh, the importance of this issue, but to demonstrate that foot mats, foot mats and foot baths uh, are not dangerous to human skin. Uh, comments were made to me directly that they were gravely concerned uh, that we needed to jump on this, we needed to bring it to the attention of the wider community of Australians to understand that citric acid is, is, is a natural acid, naturally occurring acid. You can, you can use it in your everyday households, uh, but clearly the government doesn't have any idea about uh, the fact that this could be uh, certainly a, a biosecurity measure to support the industry and that it is an effective tool uh, in, in using it in this way and that it is not harmful to human skin. Or, or, or to anyone's skin, by that matter, to, to animal skin, for that matter. So, I would like to uh, remind. Obviously, the minister is, is is not here, but I'm sure he will um, he will catch up with these comments later. That it was these very comments made on the 15th of July that prompted the industry to demonstrate, out of fear, out of deep concern for the industry, uh, that um, he was wrong. That he was wrong and that they needed support. And it demonstrated that the government was not taking this seriously enough on the 15th of July. And since the minister is more concerned about governing through social media, he might want to join my Facebook page and, and view the post that I made on the 15th of July, speaking to uh, a vet who delivered a session on, on the very concern of biosecurity that day at the show in Catherine on the importance of this government acting promptly to deal with this issue. So I will not accept that we on this side of this, the chamber and those of us who represent Northern Australia and the interests of those within the industry are playing politics with this issue. We are gravely concerned because it is our backyards that are in the direct firing line should this get out of hand. It is our backyards that will suffer. It is those within our industry, and we know that this, this has further effects within those in our industry. When, when our pastoralists, when our agriculturalists, when our farmers are down on their luck, it's not just about, it's not just about the industry uh, and, and how it will affect uh, the wider Australian economy. But this is about people's livelihoods. This is about their lives. This is about their ability to care and look after their families. These sorts of things, when people feel so uh, destroyed under these sort of circumstances, can very well lead to issues such as suicide. And we don't want to see that occur for anyone within our industries, within our pastoralist industries, within our cattle industries. So I find it deeply insulting that it would be suggested that we're playing politics on this particular issue. Again, I ask this, this government to take very seriously the issues relating to Northern Australia. We need a voice in these chambers just like everybody else. 
We are affected by decisions or decisions that aren't made going forward by this government. And it is our responsibility to hold this government to account. And that is exactly what we're doing on behalf of these industries, on behalf of the little people, on behalf Order. of those Senator who would Price, be affected. Your time has expired. Uh, I saw Senator Roberts before Senator Wish Wilson, but before I call Senator Roberts, I will remind senators that understanding orders, they shouldn't be uh, referencing wh the, whether or not other senators are present in the chamber. Uh, Senator Chisholm, was that a point of order? Yes. Um, around the long-standing convention of the rotating of the call, um, the previous um, deputy president in that role acknowledged that before um, and gave the call to Senator Green over Senator Price. Uh, I'd encourage you to reflect on that now. Apologies, Senator Chisholm. I wasn't uh, listening along to the previous deputy president. Sorry, Senator Brockman, were you going to debate the point of order? Oh, I'll be uh, indeed, Senator Brockman, that was disorderly. Um, my apologies. I take your point, Senator Chisholm. Um, I will give the call to you, and then Senator Roberts, and then Senator Wish Wilson. If I'm still in the chair by then. Sorry, yes, I'm Senator Acting McKenzie. Deputy um, Chair, my understanding is Senator Chisholm didn't stand to request the call. You were standing for a point of order. It was Senator Ciccone behind you, Senator Chisholm that stood for the call, Senator Wish Wilson stood for the call, and Senator Robert stood for the call. Senator Davey, um, Brockman, and Mackenzie still want to make a contribution in the uh, limited time we have in this debate. I'm going to try and make everybody happy here, and I will undoubtedly fail. I did rule on giving the call to Senator Roberts first, and I will do that because I gave it to him first. But Senator Chisholm, I take your point, and if you can seek to be quick on your feet next time around, I'm giving the call to Senator Roberts now, and then whoever is next up. Senator Chisholm, yes, point of it's order. It's been pointed out to me that you also did a similar thing last night. Uh, in not rotating the call when it was appropriate. Um, we've got form again today. Uh, it isn't acceptable for you to not rotate the call. I'm just making the point, through a point of order. That Senator McKenzie, I'll call you in a minute if you are debating that point of order, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I'm urging you to reflect on that and actually rotate the call uh, as is appropriate in this debate and as, as deputy presidents and presidents have done. Thank you, thank you Senator Chisholm. I I take the point of order. Orders, Senator. I am rotating the call around the chamber. We just had a contribution from a National Party senator. I'm now going to a One Nation Party senator. If you are quick on the call next time around, Senator Chisholm, I will uh, be, get in your eye line. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, my intention in advancing this motion was to protect the people's interests from the economic devastation that will result from foot and mouth disease if it enters Australia. There's no time to waste. It's a distinct possibility that given the substandard response from this government, foot and mouth may be in Australia before the next sitting. Suspending standing orders to debate this matter today was essential, and I thank Senator Gallagher and the government for this. Senator Wish Wilson yesterday suggested that this matter could wait for discussion at the inquiry into the government's foot and mouth response. No, it can't. That's weeks away, and we need to act now to get these vaccines into Australia. I know the minister appeared on radio earlier this week and alluded to the scaremongering coming from some people around this issue. It is not scaremongering to want to save the lifeblood of hundreds of communities in rural Australia. It is not scaremongering to want to preserve $80 billion in exports. It is not scaremongering to want Australia to provide our beautiful red meat protein into the international market to feed the world. It is not scaremongering to want to protect the thousands of jobs, including union jobs in transport that the livestock industry supports. Why on earth did the Prime Minister give the job of Agriculture Minister to an accountant and lawyer from the city? That decision was a gross insult to the Australian agricultural sector. The Minister's actions in his very first test shows that the Minister hasn't a clue. The minister misleads and uses false slurs to cover up his own deficiencies and to divert attention from his deficiencies. The minister misled the Senate and the public when he answered my question on bringing vaccines to Australia just in case. 
The minister replied with the answer, quote, this would cause Australia to be considered as having foot and mouth disease. Rubbish. Having the vaccines here is not considered having foot and mouth. Using them does, and clearly these would not be used unless we had an actual outbreak. Now I've repeatedly called on the minister to correct his reply, and he continues to ignore that request. Truth doesn't matter. The minister misled the Senate when saying vaccine production had to wait until we knew the strain that arrived in Australia. That specious reply ignores the likelihood that the strain we could have in Australia is going to be the same strain present now in Bali. If we're making vaccines for Bali, make some more for us and store those vaccines in Australia ready for any outbreak that comes here from Bali. Minister Watt's answer ignores the simple question. If we need to know the strain before making a vaccine, what are the million doses of foot and mouth vaccine Australia is storing in the UK right now that he told us about? The minister called into question my support for vaccines yesterday in another diversion. The minister was clearly not listening. In my question last Thursday, I did reassure the public that these vaccines are safe. The first thing I did in drafting my questions was to check that and to add the fact that it it, it does look after people's safety. I have never spoken against vaccination. I have spoken against and strongly and will continue to speak strongly against experimental gene-based treatments for humans with grossly inadequate safety testing. Experimental vaccines injections have caused so many horrendous human injuries and human deaths the government has had to implement a compensation scheme. In contrast, the foot and mouth disease vaccine is not an MRA gene-based vaccine. It is a normal vaccine, a real vaccine. According to New Zealand health authorities, it's safe to consume meat and milk from a vaccinated animal. So once again, for clarity, before the minister misrepresents me again, I'm suggesting we get these one million doses of vaccine that we already own and any others we need to produce for this strain stored here in Australia, ready to vaccinate 48 hours after a foot and mouth outbreak occurs should one occur. After taking this precaution, we'll meet the procedure in the minister's own manual. It's on page 18 of the Foot, Foot and Mouth Ausvet Plan Edition 3 manual, in case the minister wants to look it up. I asked the minister to explain why these vaccines are being stored in the UK rather than Australia. The minister has failed to explain this very strange decision, despite repeated requests. In the event of an outbreak, it will take seven days to get the vaccine from here from the UK. Yet vaccination is supposed to start after 48 hours. After one week, it will be too late. The livestock industry will be done for. He said he had tabled a response. He did, but it was scant and did not answer my basic questions. Was he really badly advised or did he lie? We need the truth. People need the truth. There are two issues now, thanks to Senator Watt, foot and mouth, and trust and truth because of what he has done and not done, and what he has said and not said. The minister's briefing on foot and mouth last Tuesday appears to have made a factual error. It was in a casual reply, so I'm only going to mention this in passing. The comment was made that foot and mouth disease stays resident on hard surfaces for hours. The American College of Veterinary Pathologists briefing sheet on foot and mouth puts the residence period at one month. Hours? One month. Hell of a difference. Huge difference. If it's indeed one month, then the protocols we're following for foot and mouth need to be much stronger, more like the disinfectant protocols the government rushed to implement for COVID. Some of these issues can be covered during the Senate inquiry. Vaccines, though, cannot wait. We must have them here now. We must have stronger airport screening now. How can it be that after all these weeks the virus has been in Indonesia that we still have several international flights arriving concurrently directly from Indonesia, all at the same time, then no flights for hours. If you do not have the staff to check every passenger from infected areas, Minister, here's an idea. Work with the airlines, with the airlines, to stagger their arrival so we can screen every single person. I have no confidence that this Minister, in being in charge of the department, is working from a set of protocols that are designed to stop foot and mouth. Rather, these protocols seem to be about looking like government tried to stop foot and mouth. Perhaps this has something to do with the left's policy to reduce livestock to save on carbon dioxide production. 43% reduction in carbon dioxide output over 2005 levels by 2030 must include substantial reductions from agriculture. 
I'll speak to this absolute nonsense, this garbage, on many occasions in the years ahead. For today, let me say that cows are not climate vandals. Graziers are wonderful custodians of the land, as Senator Price just pointed out. The government is not a wonderful custodian of the land. I'm aware there is work that suggests foot and mouth will not spread amongst feral pigs and other feral animals that can get foot and mouth because of the space, sparse population. What utter rubbish. These researchers for hire clearly have not been to the national parks I've been to. Nobody in the government seems to care that infestations of pests in national parks encroach on farmland, putting hardworking farmers under enormous strain when all they want to do is grow food and fibre to feed and clothe the world. Why the political left want to stop farmers feeding and clothing the world is beyond me, and it's clearly beyond Senator Price. I know your climate gods need the ritual sacrifice of farmers to reach a target that makes no scientific sense, no moral, ethical sense, no human sense. And really, how can rewilding productive farmland be more desirable than feeding and clothing the world and the people in our planet? This agenda dovetails very nicely with Premier Andrews' recent agriculture bill that allows the Premier to declare quarantine on part of, or all of rural Victoria based on the threat of a disease outbreak. Animals can be culled on the threat of getting a disease. Farmers can be to told what they can and can't produce. Lockdowns can be hard border, hard border lockdowns extending for years. Victoria is coming for their graziers in the name of sustainability. All it will take is one disease outbreak. What could that outbreak be? If every rural media outlet in the bush is not getting onto their local uh, Labor, member, uh, Labor member or Greens candidates and asking them what is the go here, then I don't know why they're not doing it. There's a story here. It's a story that is so much more than an inexperienced minister with no knowledge of his portfolio tripping over the first hurdle. It's more than a minister who refuses to accept he's made a mistake and as a result refuses to fix it. That's not honest. It's more than, on, than Australian farmers being thrown under the sustainability bus by wealthy city dwellers anxious to make others pay for their climate religion. It is about the very future of our Australian agricultural sector. And that's terrifying. Minister Watt made this an issue by misleading the Senate, quoting others about foot and mouth disease, does not change a thing in the, what's happening with the government, continually de de derailing the discussion, diverting the discussion onto what other people are doing or not doing, does not answer questions. It, does, it shows the man lacks accountability and responsibility. And I will continue to do my job for the people. I've been elected by the people, not the people that, that Senator Watt quoted. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's easier to get a human being vaccinated in this country than to get a cow vaccinated. We have one flag above this parliament, we are one community, and we are one nation. And Labor and its policy on foot and mouth disease is a clear and present danger to agriculture. Well, thank you, Senator Robert. Senator Ciccone. Much uh, acting deputy president for the call, and uh, look, I um, I do have a lot of respect for Senator Roberts uh, in this place, but I must say um, that some of the line of questioning that's been put to uh, my friend uh, Murray Watt, uh, Senator Watt, uh, as the minister for agriculture, uh, is quite questionable, and I, I, it's fair to say I don't agree with um, I guess the the line of uh, inquiries that Senator Roberts has put to Minister Watt. Uh, but it is important to note in this place that Minister Watt, time and time again, for the last two weeks in this place, has been open, has been honest, has put all the facts on the table before this chamber, before all senators, before the Australian people, uh, and not just here in, in Parliament, but outside of this building as well, on numerous occasions. Uh, but with the greatest respect, I, I think uh, Senator Watt has tried to answer your question and no doubt will continue to answer your questions as they come towards him. But the Australian government is not pretending that this is an easy issue. But what we have said for the last two months that we've been in power, and it is important to always put things into context. Context is so important in this place. But it is so interesting to see that those opposite, particularly the opposition, have become experts, all become experts in foot and mouth disease. For nine and a half years, for nine and a half years, they had many opportunities to fix our biosecurity arrangements, particularly around how we fund biosecurity in this country. 
And I know Senator Wish Wilson has been uh, a very long standing member on the Rural, Regional and Transport Committee, who has had several inquiries, several inquiries into all things agriculture, and no doubt I look forward to his contributions uh, later this morning. But the government of the day had failed, had failed to seriously address the issues. And this is not just us saying this. This is not the Australian Greens saying this. This is peak bodies. Peak bodies from agriculture. This, the National Farmers Federation, you know, supposedly from those opposite, they don't represent farmers now, but they did two and a half months ago. Grain growers who have come out publicly and congratulated this government for finally establishing an inquiry into biosecurity. Ag Force coming out congratulating this government on finally doing something about addressing the inadequacies of our biosecurity funding arrangements. And there is a list of other peak bodies around the country, Cattle, Red Meat Council and so many others that, quite frankly, I could spend the next seven minutes of my time listing. But what we hear from those opposite, that there are some farmers, and yes, there are some farmers who are quite concerned, and, and rightly so, but it hasn't helped when those opposite have started and created a bit of a campaign, a political campaign for their own internal purposes, have created this hysteria, this panic, this sense of the sky is going to fall in if we don't do something now, without actually being honest with their constituency, the constituent that they claim to represent, the Australian farmers, that we are actually doing something. The Australian government is actually doing something to address the foot and mouth disease threat. Now, touch wood, we have not had that, that outbreak here in Australia, and we are working very strongly with our friends in Indonesia, particularly in Bali, to ensure that that foot and mouth disease does not come into this country. But it is also worth putting on the record about these mats. You know, they talk about these mats like somehow it's going to stop everything from coming into the country. If they were so concerned about the sanitation foot mats, and not foot baths for the record too, Deputy President, but the foot mats, why didn't they put an order in and actually bring these foot mats into the country? Just like our vaccine rollout that we had during COVID. You can't just overnight expect these foot mats just to arrive on our front door. You actually got to plan and put the orders in to get these mats from overseas, because we don't actually have a domestic manufacturing sector in this country anymore. Therefore, we can't produce these mats in the country. So we are reliant on overseas supply chains. So for nine and a half years, for nine and a half years, what did the National Party do when they had the portfolio of agriculture? in terms of these foot mats? Nothing. Same old business, wait till an outbreak occurs and then we'll see and assess what the situation is. But they had the opportunity to actually address the concerns that they are now raising and blaming this government. This government's only been in for two months and now trying to fix their mess that they have left us with. So it's important to put the facts on the table, the facts on the table. Having the vaccines, well, we do have enough vaccines. We have enough vaccines to address the initial shock should that virus get into the country. But I think it's also important to get the vaccines overseas into Indonesia, where there is a threat, where there is a threat to our uh, agriculture industry. So I'm not going to cop, and neither will Labor senators cop, the scaremongering, the political stunt that the National Party, particularly the National Party, but the opposition collectively, have put on today in this place. But it is interesting to ask the question, when are they, the opposition, going to listen to the experts? The experts that they relied on when they were last in government and now criticising. When are you, as the opposition, going to listen to the same experts that government is relying on? Listen to the peak bodies, the National Farmers Federation and the many other peak bodies that have said, Labor, you are doing the right job. You are doing what we had been calling on, consulting, working with Indonesia, working with the industry. And I'll just take the interjections from across the aisle, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, to say that uh, we've been too slow. Well, we haven't been too slow. 
We've actually been doing what is expected of us, what industry is expected of us, what industry has actually called on us to actually do, and we now have the strongest biosecurity measures ever in the history of Australia. So well, so well are our measures that Footmouth has not arrived here. In fact, we picked up a traveller recently, as you would know, uh, um, senators across the aisle, about a traveller from, from Indonesia who had a dodgy Big Mac or a cheeseburger. So well are our measures working that people are actually saying, yes, yes, we do have products that we should not be bringing into this country. We've got new ads now on aeroplanes, new ads on aeroplanes warning travellers to Australia that should they arrive here, they will receive a hefty fine. So someone who's you know, bringing back a, a Big Mac Happy Meal manages to, to cop a $2,600 fine because, because they brought in some product that they should not have into this country. So again, Senator Watt has, he should be commended for the work that he has been doing, that his department has been doing, that our biosecurity officers have been doing on our border to protect our borders, to protect our agriculture industry, because it is very important. It is so important that we protect our, ag our agriculture industry. But just to also put on the record that we are now also screening every single piece of material, mail that is, coming from Indonesia and China. And that should also be noted in this place. We've also reviewed the import, the import permits of in Indonesian products that may carry foot and mouth disease. And, and the Australian government is now providing direct support to the Indonesian government to purchase vaccines to control the outbreak, particularly over in Indonesia. We're also acknowledging that um, Meat and Livestock Australia deserves additional funding, and that is why we are providing the additional funding that Meat and Livestock Australia deserves to help coordinate industry's response to the outbreak. There's also advice about our biosecurity responsibilities that I, I just also want to flag in this, in this place today, that the new biosecurity laws um, that were enacted back in, I think, 2016, uh, Deputy President, the first time that this government, that the Australian government, is actually using them. The same powers that the Liberal and National Party had, chose not to use back in 2016, that the Labor government is now using for the very first time. Again, when you had the chance, when you had the chance to actually fix the mess that our biosecurity arrangements are in, you did absolutely nothing. You did absolutely nothing. And that is why I'm so very proud that this Senate supported my motion, and with the support of many others in this place, to have an inquiry into our biosecurity arrangements. And I look forward, I look forward to working with all senators in this place to actually address our biosecurity arrangements once and for all. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Coney. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. And this is a very serious issue that we are confronting. Order, Senator Chisholm. Senator Wish Wilson, I will allow you to make the point of order anticipating what it is. It would be nice for you to listen to, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I've been on my feet three times now, and I know I haven't got the call. That's your, your discretion. But I do think the Labor Party have just spoken. Uh, you've been to the other side of the chamber. I think it's fair for you to allocate the Greens' uh, spot in I, this. I take your point, debate. Senator Wilson. I did see Senator Chisholm first that time, and I'm giving him the call, Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. And this is a very serious issue that the country confronts. And Senator Watt, or Minister Watt, has been uh, detailing the thorough actions that he has taken, uh, the urgent actions that he has taken as the minister responsible in the Albanese government. But it's also, I think, an exhibit A of the fact that this opposition have learnt nothing from this election campaign. The way that they have come into the chamber today, the way that they have done this over the first two weeks of this sitting, shows you that they have learnt nothing from the election result. And they've also observed nothing of the last three years in terms of how the Australian people react to these sorts of issues. And with the opposition, all we have seen is politics. Uh, they have played politics with this issue consistently since they've been in opposition, and they've actually done nothing constructively. Uh, they've offered no solutions, nothing constructively, to actually help the country get through it. So I think it goes to show that they've learnt nothing from their, their time, 
uh, in government. They learnt nothing from the election campaign, and they're going to continue on. Uh, well, we are not going to fall into that trap. Uh, we are going to do the right thing by the Australian people. We're going to act in the national interest, uh, and we are also going to uh, do the right thing by the country uh, and work collaboratively with the industry as well. Uh, and there's been numerous quotes that my colleagues have raised about them being supportive of the action that we have taken. Uh, but we all remember what the previous government was like. We all remember why they were rejected at the last election campaign, because on any issue that confronts them, they always played politics with it. It was always politics first. The national interest played a very distant role in that regard. So Minister Watt has uh, continuously answered questions in this chamber, uh, in, answered questions through the media and explained the actions that this government is taking uh, to deal with this issue. It's really disappointing that the government teaming up with one, the opposition teaming up with One Nation have learnt nothing from the last election campaign and are going to continue um, to play politics with this issue when we actually need a national response to this of everyone working constructively together and putting the national interest of the country first. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, again, I, I ask senators to reflect on the fact that when this debate started this morning, uh, in a committee room, only 50 metres away, uh, those who were interested were receiving evidence from department officials as to exactly how they are conducting their response uh, into uh, you know, both the Varroa outbreak in New South Wales, which is very serious, and the measures put in place to reduce the risk of a, a very potentially very serious uh, foot and mouth disease outbreak. Um, I'd also ask like senators to reflect on the fact that I understand it's important to put pressure on any government and to, to needle them and make sure there's transparency uh, and that they know uh, they're being watched very closely and they have to do everything they possibly can. That's an, a, a critical part of, of politics. But it's sounding to me in this chamber this morning, uh, you know, when we've had uh, debate ranging from marijuana psychosis uh, through to um, you know, mad Mao's vaccine uh, denial and, and a whole range of other— Set order, Senator Wish-Wilson, please refer to your other colleagues in the appropriate manner. Vaccine denial. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, withdraw, sorry, I withdraw that, com Thank you, I withdraw that comment. Thank um, you, Senator Wish-Wilson. Sorry, I do have Senator Scar on his seat. Was that on this point of order that I just ruled on, Senator Scar? With respect to a fellow senator from yes. Queensland, I think Senator Wish-Wilson Wilson should specifically yes. withdraw the comment in relation to Senator Malcolm Roberts. Yes, I and did I, specifically withdraw that, that comment. Scar, so continue, I'll say Senator, senator Roberts and One Nation's uh, vaccine denial, uh, as pointed out by the minister yesterday, hardly the political party you want to be taking advice from. Uh, complete disregard from experts. The, the comment that somehow uh, the experts who have given evidence to senators and MPs about the risk of this being spread by uh, you know, a feral species, uh, uh, you know, scientists for hire. Uh, look, really? It's almost sounding like the opposition wants some kind of foot-and-mouth outbreak so they can make political advantage out of it which I, I think is appalling. I think it is absolutely appalling. He would be forgiven for thinking that if you'd listened to the quality of debate we've had from these people on the other side of the chamber yesterday morning and this morning. You would be forgiven for thinking they actually want an outbreak in this country so they can turn it to their political advantage. It has been pointed out continually that this kind of fear-mongering uh, raising anxiety and alarm is not helping anyone. It is counterproductive. I'm all for holding a government to account. The Senate is going to do that. The National Party and Liberal Party will be chairing that inquiry, and we will look at this very closely. But do not make Order. this situation Senator worse Wish for your own political your advantage. Your time has expired. And the time for the debate has expired. I will therefore put the question, uh, which is that the Senate take note of the explanation provided by the minister. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk to call on business. Government business. Order of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures Number 1 Bill, second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator McKim. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures Bill 2022. As Labor said ahead of the federal election, we will always work to provide certainty and clarity on tax for Australian businesses and working families, particularly during challenging economic times for our country and around the world. President, Acting Deputy President, our focus has always been and always will be on making sure we build an economy that works for people, not the other way around. An economy that fosters aspiration, hope, opportunity, an economy that holds no one back, supported by a tax system that provides certainty. The Treasury Laws Amendment Bill 2022 is going to provide certainty to stakeholders about their tax obligations and benefit entitlements. Reduce risks to the Commonwealth associated with uncertainty in existing laws and limit the retrospective application of proposed new laws. This bill contains a number of measures across four schedules. Schedule 1, the recovery of grants for Cyclone Saroja. Schedule 2, transitional provisions relating to the repeal of Superannuation Act 1993. Schedule 3, income tax and withholding exemptions for the FIFA Women's World Cup. Schedule 4, modernising business register delay and other minor and technical amendments. So, about, so more about Schedule 1. Schedule 1 will provide an income tax exemption for qualifying grants made to primary producers and small businesses affected by tropical cyclone Saroja, which happened in April 21, just last year. Tropical cyclone Saroja had a devastating impact on a number of communities in Western Australia. Affected primary producers and small businesses were eligible for recovery grants of up to $25,000, which were activated as a Category C measure under the Joint Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements 2018. In 2021-2022, the Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook included a measure to make these recovery grants non-assessable, non-exempt non income for tax purposes. Schedule 1 makes these qualifying grants non-assessable, non-exempt exempt income for tax purposes where those grants relate to the impact of tropical cyclone Saroja, income, income tax will not be applied to these grants. These grants provide additional support um, to communities as they build and recover following the devastating event. Schedule 2. In 2017, the then government agreed to the recommendations of the Ramsey Review. This is to establish the Australian Financial Complaints Authority to replace the superannua Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. The SCT ceased operations on 31 December 2020, with six remaining cases successfully transferred to the AFCA. The SCT formally closed on 5 March 2022. These amendments ensure that administrative arrangements are in place to allow Australian Securities and Investments Commission to undertake ongoing management of SCT records and that any outstanding cases in the federal court are able to be appropriately remitted back to the AFCA. Complaints will not be adversely affected as AFCA is now the primary external dispute resolution body responsible for handling superannuation related complaints and is appropriately resourced to resolve outstanding SCT complaints. The AFCA will, Act will be amended to allow for the transfer of, of F, SCT records and documents to ASIC for ongoing records management, and will also allow for the federal court to remit appealed cases back to AFCA, where previously these had been remitted to the SCT. Schedule 4. Along with a number of technical and minor amendments, Schedule 4 also makes changes to the legislation that supports modernising business registers, the MBR program. The program is significantly delayed and will be well over budget. The MBR program will deliver an important piece of economic infrastructure that will be leveraged to implement several of our policy objectives. Our business registry IT systems are well beyond the end, their end of life. The outdated 90s era technology in which the current business registry now resides isn't just clunky and inefficient. It's simply not equipped to deal with the modern day cyber threats. The modernising business registries program was supposed to cost just under half a billion dollars and be completed in full by 2024. Early estimates suggest that the full delivery of the program may cost up to $1.5 billion and, full, and the full transfer of functions will no longer be able to occur until 2026. The previous Liberal National Government had plenty of opportunities to level, level with the Australian people about the time and cost delays in implementing these, this program. 
that they were aware of under their watch. This billion dollar stuff up is now for the new federal government to fix, and we are in the early days of assessing options. This bill delays the full transfer of functions to the new registrar to, to the 1st of July 2026. We will keep Australians informed as we go about the important business of getting this project back on track. Schedule 3. However, so it's Schedule 3 in this bill that by, that by and far will have the most influential impact on our community, particularly for women and girls. As many of us know in this place, the FIFA Women's World Cup will be held in Australia and New Zealand in 2023. As part of a package of commitments to host the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023, the government is providing an income and withholding tax exemption to FIFA and, local, and a local Australian subsidiary. The exemption will be limited to income earned in relation to event activities, for example, in planning, holding and winding up the event. This will strengthen Australia's reputation as a host for major international sporting events and play a genuine and meaningful role promoting women's sport. Because it is through major sporting events that we can inspire the next generation of young people, particularly young women, to participate in sport. And when it comes to major events for women and girls, there is frankly nothing as big as watched and as supported as the Women's World Cup. The FIFA Women's World Cup is the largest women's sporting event in the world. The 2019 event in France was viewed by an incredible 1.12 billion viewers across the world, with next year's event in Australia likely to be the biggest ever, with many firsts. It will be the first Women's World Cup to be held in the Southern Hemisphere, the first to be co-hosted by two federations, the Asian Football Confederation, the AFC, whom Australia belongs to, and the Oceania Football Confederation, OFC, whom New Zealand belongs to. With 144, with 144 women's national teams entering the original qualification process, next year's, Australian, next year's tournament has been expanded for the first time to consist of 32 teams, who will play a record 64 games over a five-week period. The 2019 World Cup in France was viewed by an incredible 1.12 billion viewers globally, and next year's event across Australia will be bigger than that. The 2019 final between France and the USA was viewed by 63 million people across the world. Just to put this into perspective, the men's AFL grand final in, in 2021 between Melbourne and the Western Bulldogs was viewed by 3.91 million people nationally. And day one of last year's men's Boxing Day test for the cricket was viewed by 1.26 million people nationally. With the event to be held from the 20th of July to the 20th of August in 2023, Football Australia has forecasted the economic and social benefit of hosting the tournament to be at least $460 million, supporting thousands more jobs, skills and opportunities, especially for our tourism sector as it continues to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. The tournament will also provide for tremendous trade and investment opportunities, which we can leverage particularly across all of our host states and cities. For my home state of Victoria, the event will provide for significant benefits. Led by former Minister for Major Events and Sport, John Aaron, Victoria proudly secured six matches to be held at Melbourne's Amy Park, which will also feature the Matildas. Along with the new $115 million home of the Matildas and home of women's football training base, which is currently being constructed at La Trobe University in Bandura, Melbourne, will be the epicentre of this global event. Australia, of course, will be proudly represented at the tournament by the Matildas, who are ranked as the number one sporting team in Australia for emotional, and emotional connection and familiarity. Captained by 2018 Young Australian of the Year, Sam Kerr, the Matildas will be cheered on by all Australians to go all the way and will be sure to inspire the next generation of women and girls to play football and get healthy and active. As stated by the Matildas captain, Sam, Sam Kerr, and I quote, the opportunity to play in a home FIFA Women's World Cup is something every footballer dreams of, and I'm looking forward to seeing those dreams come true. Playing for the Matildas in Australia will be the highlight of my career and an opportunity to inspire girls, both in Australia and New Zealand and all over the world, to play football. We have seen great progress in the women's game, and Australia and New Zealand will take the game to a whole new level. Participation in football across Victoria among women and girls is growing substantially. The most recent Ausplay data showed the number of females playing club-based football or soccer 
for those AFL uh, supporters in Victoria had more than doubled in five years to 55,000, including 25,000 girls. And while the Women's World Cup, supported by measures, measures contained in this bill, would, will undoubtedly encourage more females to participate, I must also acknowledge the Victorian Labor government's landmark female-friendly change room program, which has played a driving role to get more females involved in local sport. The tournament will also help to inspire more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young women to play sport, with many First Nations players already having blazed their trail through football. Football Australia estimates that approximately 40,000 uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the country currently participate in football, with many more set to be inspired through the 2023 World Cup. Harry Williams was the first Indigenous Socceroos player and in 1974 was also a member of the first Australian team to play at a FIFA World Cup. Since Williams, a host of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander soccer players have made their mark on the game, including A-League and Socceroos star and Olympian Jade North, Matilda's goalkeeper Lydia Williams, Kaya Simon, as well as Travis Dodd, James Brown, Jada Wyman and Alira Toby. In conclusion, President, I commend this bill to the House and I commend the measures contained in it, but I particularly commend this, the support this bill will provide to help Australia and New Zealand host a successful 2023 Women's Football World Cup. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, Minister. Thank you. He's busy doing another job. Thank you. Um, I'd like to be my thanking senators who have contributed to this debate. Uh, Schedule 1 of the bill provides an income tax exemption for qualifying grants made to primary producers and small businesses affected by tropical cyclone Saroja, which had devastating impact on communities in Western Australia between 11 and 12 April 2020. One, affected primary producers and small businesses were eligible to receive recovery grants of up to $25,000, which were activated as a Category C measure under the Joint Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangement 2018. Schedule 1 makes these qualifying grants non-accessible, non-exempt income for tax purposes. These grants provide support in addition to other assistance that the Australian and Western Australian governments have provided to assist communities as they begin to rebuild and recover following this devastating event. Schedule 2 of the bill amends the Treasury Laws Amendment, putting consumers first establishment of the Australian Financial Complaints Authority Act 2018 to support the practical closure of the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal and any transitional arrangements associated with the Australian Financial Complaints Authority replacing the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. Schedule 3 of the bill is a part of a package of commitments to host the FIFA. Women's World Cup in 2023, with the government providing an income and withholding tax exemption to FIFA and a local Australian entity. The exemption will apply to income in relation to the event. This event is a major international sporting event and will strengthen Australia's international reputation, pr promote women's sport and provide opportunities to support Australia's economy. Schedule 5 of this bill amends various laws in the Treasury portfolio to ensure those laws operate in accordance with the policy intent, make minor policy changes to improve administrative outcomes or remedy unintended consequences and correct technical or drafting defects. The amendments have been identified by Treasury portfolio agencies, the Office of Parliamentary Council and policy divisions within Treasury. This includes amendments that clarify the law to ensure it operates in accordance with the policy intent, make minor policy changes to improve administrative outcomes or remedy unintended consequences and correct technical or drafting defects. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. We'll now move into the committee stage. Apologies, no, we won't. I need to put the question that the bill will be read a second time. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. 
bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation to make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the statute law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Uh, we have some amendments circulated, so we will, do any senators require a committee stage? Uh, if they do, we will go into that now. Um, and I'll get the script. Um, there being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Amendments in my second reading contribution yesterday, and I now move the amendments standing in my name on sheet 1596 and 1597, and I move them by leave together. Is leave granted to move the amendments on sheet 1596 and 1597 together? There being no objection, leave is granted. The question is that the amendments moved. Uh, by leave together by Senator McKim on. Oh, Minister, do you wish to respond to the. I'd like to speak to the amendment. You may nothing. indeed, Minister. Oh. Please do. Uh, that. Thank you very much um, for the call. Uh, the government will be supporting the amendment. The amendment represents long standing Labor policy, and we appreciate the Greens' assistance and eagerness in uh, working with us on delivering our policy commitment to tax transparency. The amendments remove grandfathering arrangements that exempt certain large proprietary companies from submitting audited annual reports to ASIC. There is no clear economic or policy reason for continuing this exemption. The amendments will remove the exemption, improving transparency and removing an information asymmetry between exempt proprietary companies and their competitors who are not grandfathers. Removal of this was recommended by the Senate Economics References Committee in 2015 and in subsequent reports in 2016 and 2018. Uh, we believe there was no clear economic or policy reason for continuing this exemption in 2015 when senators from the Greens' political party, I'm advised, voted against the exact same amendments as moved by Senator Ricky Muir. We appreciate that in this case um, the Greens have decided uh, to change their position and vote in accordance with this amendment. And, uh, the government, unlike our predecessors, will always stand up for greater transparency and accountability. Thank you very much, Minister. Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. If I could just um, uh, acknowledge um, the government's response to the Greens amendment, thank uh, Senator Gallagher and, uh, and the government for accepting the Greens amendments and I uh, hope that we can work constructively uh, into the future to uh, improve uh, corporate transparency and uh, even uh, corporate tax arrangements. Uh, Senator Smith. Deputy President, in regards to Senator McKim's amendments 1596 and 1597, the opposition won't be supporting these amendments, specifically in regards to Amendment 1596. As I said, the opposition will not be supporting the Greens amendment. The effect of this amendment is to increase red tape on Australian-owned companies. By lowering the thresholds, this amendment will equalise the reporting obligations of foreign-owned entities with Australian-owned entities. The opposition supports reducing red tape and the regulatory burden on Australian companies to support a prosperous and productive economy. For these reasons, as I said, the opposition opposes the amendment. In regards to Amendment number 1597. Again, the opposition will not be supporting the Greens amendment. The effect of this amendment is to increase red tape and compliance burden in the economy. It further removes regulatory certainty for a limited class of companies and constrains the ability for ASIC to make instruments to implement its regulatory decisions. The opposition support reducing red tape and the regulatory burden on Australian companies to support a prosperous and productive Australian economy. Again, for these reasons, the opposition will oppose Amendment 1597. Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Uh, thank you. I don't need to seek leave to speak again? No. Okay. Well, that's tremendous. Uh, well, I'll take it then. Uh, I didn't speak to uh, Amendment 1596, because um, so, I understand they've been moved together, but I would just put on the record that the government will also support uh, 1596. The amendment aligns with the government's multinational tax transparency election commitments. Um, transparency is a key factor underpinning the integrity of the tax system. This amendment is a targeted and balanced tax transparency initiative. It will provide enhanced public scrutiny on corporate information, which will help to change how corporates view their tax obligations. Um, uh, I would also just say in conclusion, um, and it would be remiss for me to not acknowledge that 
um, the former Senator, um, Senator Rex Patrick and his, um, his uh, support for the amendments like this. In fact, I think he moved them to every T-Lab under the previous government, uh, and so I'm sure uh, that he will ver be very pleased uh, to see this amendment pass, and I acknowledge the efforts he took uh, to try and, and put these arrangements in place. Thank you, Minister. There are no other que uh, senators wishing to speak on that question. I will put it. Uh, and the question is that the amendments moved by Senator McKim on sheet 1597 and 1596 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator McKim on sheet 1596 and 1597 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Pratt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Askew, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 37, noes 27. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Uh, if I could just seek the advice or seek the um, advice of the chamber, I suppose. Um, we have one remaining amendment from Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I withdraw my amendment because it's essentially the same as the Greens, based on Senator Rex Patrick and Very the Greens' good. work. Uh, 
If leave is granted to withdraw that amendment, it is so withdrawn. Uh, the question now is if there are no further senators wishing to uh, make contributions on the committee stage of that bill. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 measures number no. one, Bill 2022, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Thank you. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Is that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those of, the, that, all those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation to make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the statute law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Uh, are you seeking the call, Senator Dunham? I'm just waiting to see who's seeking the call. The minister? Oh, probably. Is this the selection of bills? No. <laughs> so, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, Senator Urquhart? No. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to move to the selection of bills. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, uh, President. I present the third report of the 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. The uh, report be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart. Are you seeking the call, Senator McKim? Yes. Senator McKim. Um, I uh, understood that the government may have an amendment to, um, to this report. I'm just seeking clarity on whether uh, that amendment will be moved by the government. Thank you, Senator Kim. Minister. Thank you. <laughs> I'm all over it. Um, thank you, Senator McKim. Always got my back. Thank you. Um, um, I move. Look, I need to move an amendment to the amendment that I have circulated. Um, so apologies for this. It's just a last-minute request um, from the government, but we've uh, from the opposition. We have circulated uh, the amendment, um, and I move the amendment first, but seek to amend the amendment slightly. And can I talk to that now? Um, yes. The amendment is. Uh, if you move it in the amended form and then speak to it, okay. that would assist the chamber. Okay, I'll move it, the amendment in the amended form, uh, which uh, at the end of the motion adds, in respect of it doesn't make any changes to the Human Rights Commission legislation amendment bill, uh, that that not be referred to committee, but does uh, extend the reporting date of the CDC to the 31st of August. Uh, 2022, which would still allow the bill to be available for uh, debate in the next sitting. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, President. Um, whilst I um, thank the the opposition for the the small extension of time to the uh, to the reporting on uh, the inquiry on the cashless debit card bill, um, I want to put on the record how disappointed the opposition is in relation to the amount of time that has been made available to, um, to review and consider these bills in committee. I think it disrespects the important work of the Senate uh, and I also think the disrespect that the Labor Party has shown by not consulting with the very people that this measure is going to impact is extraordinarily insulting to them. In the trial sites of the Goldfield, the Kimberleys, Harvey Bay and Bundaberg and Sejuna, these communities actually asked for this particular measure to be put in place 
um, and we are, they are seeking to remove this measure without even bothering to consult with them. And now they want to rush this legislation through this place, uh, and I think this is absolutely unbelievable that this appalling decision does not even go back to uh, the communities that have asked for it. And I would also draw into my attention the attention of the chamber that in my home state of South Australia, in Sejuna, the CDC was actually put in place in response to a coronial inquest for the really tragic death of a number of people uh, on the west coast. Uh, they wanted the card. It was a recommendation of the coron coroner's report uh, into those deaths, and it was it was something that that community asked for. Um, in the other sites that had previously had their clunky, outdated basics card, uh, the government is now going to deny those participants in those communities the ability that the new technology of the cashless debit card offers them. I mean, they're not intending to remove income management because if you listen to the answer to the question asked um, of Minister Farrell uh, last week, he said income management was not going to be taken out of the Northern Territory. Instead, they want to send them back to having only the basics card, the clunky old basics card instead of providing them with the advanced technology of the cashless debit card. And in doing so, they also deny the uh, traditional credit union in the Northern Territory the opportunity to support many of their members um, with the, this particular and new uh, form of technology. In the Cape York, totally transitioned, transitioned voluntary, a number of people on the card voluntarily. They've linked it to their amazing award-winning Palmer platform that supports that supports them. This is a decision of that community. This is not a decision of government. It's a decision of that community. Once again, they want to send them back to the clunky old basics card without really any thought. Uh, it's a reminder. Uh, you know, this is absolute abject hypocrisy. Um, and you know, to come in here and not be able to answer questions like, we don't know how the government is intending to transition off this card. The supports that are going to be needed for the people who have currently got the support of this card, what's going to happen to them? We don't know what's going to happen to the people who voluntarily Senator Rustin, are on Senator Rustin, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Senator Thorpe, Senator Rustin has the right to be heard in silence. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. We do not know um, what is going to happen to those people who voluntarily are on this card. We don't know what's going to happen to those people who voluntarily have transferred from the, the CDC, from the basics card to the CDC in the Northern Territory. What is going to happen to them? We do not know what is going to happen. Um, you know, what was the research that underpinned this decision? Uh, and what is the research that shows what the impacts of the withdrawal of this particular mechanism is going to be on those communities? We don't know what advice has been taken that underpins this decision. All these unanswered questions, and this Senate wants to give us four weeks to be able to go and ask the people who are at the coalface, the people who have this card, the people who are impacted by this card, the communities that are impacted by this card, the communities who ask for this card to be in their communities in the first place. And at the same time, at the same time, they still intend to keep income management in place in some communities but not in other communities. We do not understand the rationale behind why the people in the Northern Territory, the people Senator in the Northern Thorpe. Territory are still going to be kept on income management, but people in other communities are not going to be kept on income management. We do not understand the difference. This is a really, really important piece of, of, of inquiry that I think Australians need to understand, but most particularly we need to respect the, uh, the views and ideas of the people in the communities where this card is currently in place, understand what they want, how they want it to be Senator implemented, Rice. and to understand the impact of removing this without any thought whatsoever, no consultation with these communities, and I say no consultation with no. these communities, before the announcement that the Does card Cameron was going this? to be removed. Order. I think we owe the respect Cameron to this, this chamber for review, and we owe the respect to those uh, communities to consult with them. Thank you. Time has it. Are you seeking the call, Senator Chisholm? On this Chisholm? matter, yep. Senator Chisholm. Well, we are not going to get lectured to about consultation from the former government. They provided no consultation, zero consultation, with the people of Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. I know that because I've been there multiple times. They imposed this from on high by their local member, Mr. Pitt. There was no consultation that was taken with that community uh, before this was imposed on them. 
And I went there and did forums in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. I took the, shadow, the then shadow minister with me as well, Linda Burney, uh, and we consulted with those people on the ground that were ignored by this government. The local member, Mr Pitt, the member for Hinkler, wouldn't even meet with constituents who raised issues about this. That is how arrogant that he was. So for this opposition to come in here and try and lecture us now about consulting is completely outrageous. Um, this is something that we consulted in opposition over many years. Uh, the shadow minister travelled to many communities so that we could listen to evidence on the ground, because that's what a good opposition does to actually learn the lessons, hear from people directly, and we formed our view about this policy over that period of opposition before we said that we would actually go to the election and say that we would end the cashless debit card. So we consulted widely. Uh, we were productive in how we used our time in opposition, uh, and we took a policy to the election that the Australian people voted for. So we're not going to get lectured to by the opposition about how we do it. Uh, we know that uh, the committee has enough time to provide a report um, so that this legislation, which has already passed the House of Representatives, um, can get debated in this place and ultimately, uh, I hope, will lead to the removal of the cashless debit card and the impact that that has had on communities. Uh, the the uh, trauma that this has caused people and the stigma that it has caused people who have been forced onto this card uh, and the way that they have been treated in these communities is not acceptable. It's not something that this current government stands for, uh, and we absolutely urge the Senate, when the vote comes, uh, to remove the cashless debit card. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I'm going to Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, President. If I could just indicate at the start that the Australian Greens um, would like the questions put separately uh, on. Um, on the government's amendment, because we intend to vote differently. Can I indicate um, in regards to that that we're happy with the change of date um, in regards to the reporting date for the social security uh, repeal of the cashless debit card and other measures bill? So we'd intend to support that um, amendment to the report with the amended date of 31st of August as flagged. Um, by the minister, but could I also um, say that we uh, have our own amendment in regards to Part A of, um, of uh, the government's amendment to the report, um, and I, I now move that as an amendment to the government's amendment, and that report has been uh, circulated in my name in the chamber, and just for uh, the benefit of colleagues in the chamber, what uh, this amendment would do if it were accepted by the chamber is to refer the Australian Human Rights Commission Legislation Amendment Selection and Appointment Bill 2022 to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for an inquiry and report by the 31st of August 2022. And I know that my colleague uh, Senator Shoebridge. Um, would like to make a contribution to the debate, so I just offer that to senators in terms of uh, perhaps um, some courtesy in terms of um, um, taking up the time of this chamber. And I won't be taking my full five minutes because I would like the chamber to be able to hear from Senator Shoebridge on that matter, and also briefly Senator Rice uh, on the matter of the cashless debit card. But briefly, briefly in regards to um, the Human Rights Commission legislation amendment. Bill. This is a really critical legislation, and I note that Senator Shoebridge um, has um, articulated um, very well publicly the need for an LGBTIQ plus commissioner on the Human Rights Commission. This is a gaping hole in the structures of the Commission, and it should be filled. And Senator Shoebridge has quite rightly um, identified an opportunity to make that happen. And I think it's really critical that we hear from the LGBTIQ plus community through the mechanism of a Senate inquiry so their concerns can be heard and their deeply held and genuine wishes for an LGBTIQ plus uh, commissioner on the Human Rights Commission can be understood by the government and by the Senate and ultimately um, by the whole parliament. So, um, so Madam, uh, Madam President, uh, I repeat again the Greens' request for these questions to be put separately, and I do move um, my amendment to the Minister's amendment. Thank you, um, 
Senator Bakima, just to be clear, so everyone's clear, we have an amendment moved by Senator Gallagher, which is basically in two parts, part A and part B, and Senator McKim is moved, has just moved an amendment to part A, and you wish those two to be put separately. Uh, Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to express my utmost absolute disappointment at this government's ham-fisted approach to attempt to smash the cashless debit card, an income management which I will remind the government was an initiative of the Gillard government to begin with. And to attempt to now call this racist is utterly ridiculous because Jenny Macklin, as the previous minister, defended it, defended it and did not call it racist at all, but a measure that needed to be put in place. Talk about consulting at the grassroots level. As a Warpri woman who is engaged with people from remote communities, out of sight, out of mind, with people who don't speak English as a first language, not that this government seems to care at all for these individuals because they're out of sight and out of mind and don't have access to media, don't have the ability to articulate so they can be easily ignored, I find it very distressing. But as part of a research group in 2001, when it all began, income management, I was part of actually investigating, speaking to income management recipients. In the first trial on income management, rolled out again by the, La the, by the Labor Gillard government, the investigation, the purpose of it was to seek the views of the recipients on the program. And I can tell you that speaking directly to Indigenous women, they said that this was very helpful for their lives. I spoke to one woman who stated that she was able to stop drinking and stop gambling and feed her children, and she could say no to family members who were demanding access to her income as a result. I spoke to a non-Indigenous woman who said she was able to halt her addiction to methamphetamines and to then gain custody, regain custody of her child and ensure that her child could go to school. These are the people that I speak to every single day. I've been fielding calls in my office every day now, since, since this is what the Labor government has proposed, who are deeply concerned. I had an Indigenous man call me from Western Australia yesterday who had grave concerns for his father-in-law, who, who is currently having his income stolen from him from his drug dealer son. You're all ignoring this. I think it's disgusting. So you're going to, this government is going to ensure that Addicts have complete access, can take away the income, the, that can smash the human rights of these vulnerable people in those communities, and you have, you have absolutely no idea. And not only this, but you're changing your minds on this particular issue. So I will also state that in 2020, uh, Senator Lyons, yourself, President, called this, call the basics card racist. Again, when your own minister defended it and did not call it racist. Now this government is, is trying to say that only Territorians will be subject to income management. So it's all right for blackfellas in the Territory, but nobody else in the country. This is creating two, two classes of people in this nation. We as the coalition decided that it would be, that it would be for all Australians, equally. And let's not forget, income management and social security is a temporary measure for people to get back on their own two feet. And ultimately, we want people to have jobs so they can stand on their own two feet and use their income as they wish. In the Northern Territory, it's 50-50. You have 50 per cent cash. So those who are addicts, yeah, they can go ahead and buy alcohol if that's what they want to use for it. They can deny their children a feed. They can do that. The other 50 per cent is quarantined. So maybe they can cover their bills. Indigenous Australians, especially those whose first language is not English, don't have the same sorts of opportunities and freedoms and understanding of, an, of a cash economy. They don't have that. They don't have income literacy. This is one of those measures and one of those tools, and I find it absolutely disgusting that you're denying them this. And I suggest that you get out to some of these remote communities where people are out of sight, out of mind to you, who can't clearly articulate to you because English is not their first language, and stop towing the ideological line. I will bring to these chambers over and over again the messages from those who are continually calling my office absolutely distressed about their loved ones whose, whose welfare payments are being stripped from them as we speak. 
and you are leaving them vulnerable and open. But as I mentioned, some of you argue it's racist. Well, perhaps this government is racist because they're suggesting it's all right for black fellows in the Northern Territory, but it's not all right for the rest of Australia, for those that are having a whinge over on Harvey Bay. We're trying to save lives here, not toe the line of ideology. Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge. President, I rise to speak in support of the amendment moved by my colleague Senator McKim, which is to refer the Australian Human Rights Commission Legislation Amendment Selection and Appointment Bill to committee for inquiry over the short recess between the end of this sitting week, this sitting week and when we return. It looks very much like a stitch-up has happened between the opposition and the Labor government to prevent stakeholders having the ability to engage with an inquiry over the next fortnight to improve the government's bill. Let's be clear. The government's bill does little more than suggest there needs to be a newspaper advertisement when there's a new, when there's a new, uh, a new appointment proposed for the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, you actually don't need legislation, last time I checked, to put an ad in the paper, but it is useful, and we don't, we don't oppose the bill. Indeed, we support the bill because it's useful to have an ad in the paper, at least. We know what the previous government did, just appointed their mates quietly without even any due process. So yes, we support legislation that requires an ad to go in the paper. But this government has said in moving this legislation that they're implementing the Paris principles. And that is so far from the truth that it is close to embarrassing. Because Australia's Human Rights Commission is at risk of being downgraded from class A to class B, going below the human rights framework of Iraq. And that is because of the action of the previous government, but it's also because of the structural inadequacies in our human rights framework. So the Greens are proposing to actually respond to that criticism, because the criticism that came from the subcommittee included, and I'll just read the list, that Australia's Human Rights Commission does not have explicit requirements to a publicise vacancies broadly, b maximise the number of potential candidates from a wide range of social groups, c promote broad consultation and or participation in the application screening selection and appointment process, d assess applicants on the basis of predetermined objective and publicly available criteria, and e select members to serve in their own individual capacity rather than on behalf of the organisation they represent. There were multiple criticisms that the UN has made about the way in which appointments happen and the nature of appointments to the Australian Human Rights Commission. And all this government does in response is say we're going to have a newspaper ad going forward. Well, we've heard from a series of stakeholders that they want this legislation to go further. They want to implement the Paris principles. And one of the key issues, one of the key lacks in our human rights framework is the absence of a commissioner representing the LGBTIQA plus community. Now, we can't understand why the government is resisting our amendments, which we've circulated, to lift the protections for that community, the LGBTIQA plus community, to lift the protections and give them what they deserve, which is someone in their corner, a commissioner who can respond to what have been some quite hateful attacks, some of it driven by the previous government, but those hateful tax won't necessarily end, and we want to see the Greens, on behalf of that community, a human rights commissioner who's in their corner, who can hear their concerns, respond to their concerns, and give this government and this parliament direction in how to improve the law and protect and ensure that their status is fully protected in our society. So, of course, it looks like the Labor government with the coalition, one of the first acts they do on human rights is to get a stitch up and prevent an inquiry for even asking the question and hearing from stakeholders about the need for that commissioner. That's a pretty poor act from the government in one of its first actions on human rights. So we'd ask the government to reconsider voting with the opposition on this and opposing an inquiry, opposing letting stakeholders have their views heard about the establishment of an LGBTIQA plus commissioner and reconsider with one of the first acts they'll do in this parliament on human rights is actually vote with the coalition given their appalling back track record. Because that's likely what's going to happen here. And that's a tragedy for the community, but it's also a really poor indicator for where this government is intending to go over the next three years. So I'd urge 
the, the Labor government to clo look closely at Senator McKim's uh, amendment and don't take this first step. That your first step you do on human rights is vote with that mob yeah. and shut down the discussion. Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I am going to go to Senator O'Sullivan, but I am going to also remind all senators that the purpose of this debate is to talk about the amendments before the chair and why they are necessary, not the substance. Now, I do appreciate, Senator Shoebridge, you are new, uh, and I was uh, giving you some leniency, but sadly, Senator O'Sullivan, you are not new. And so I do remind all, all senators that it is about why these amendments are necessary or not necessary, depending on your point of view. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, on, on the matter that is before the Senate President, uh, which is, of course, the, uh, the time that we will have to scrutinise and to allow public uh, input into the legislation uh, regarding the abolition of the cashless debit card. I think it is absolutely appalling, appalling that proper time is not being given to allow for the community and in particular the communities that are involved with the cashless debit card to be able to input into this decision that we all need to make here into this place. And it is a uh, it is an absolute travesty. Now we saw we saw through the election campaign uh, many comments from those opposite and around the country calling for greater levels of transparency and accountability. And here is the first opportunity for, uh, for that to be enacted, for that to be on display. Yet sadly what we're seeing from this government is a ramming through of this legislation. Now, granted, they took this decision to the election, and the Australian people the Australian people, of course, did make their decision. But let's look at the particular communities where this cashless debit card is in operation. We know that the member for, for O'Connor, Mr Wilson, uh, he's very, uh, very much out there when it comes to his support of the cashless debit card. Well, he was re-elected. He was re-elected. You look at uh, uh, the member for Gray. Uh, he's also someone that's very supportive of the cashless debit card. And Sejuna is one of the communities in the, 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 uh, the western part of, of South Australia, is one of the cashless debit card areas. Uh, he was re-elected. You, you look up in the, the north, uh, west of, uh, northwest of Western Australia, right up in the very top in the um, eastern uh, east Kimberley, uh, where we have uh, the, a part of the, the seat of Durack, where Melissa Price, uh, the, Ms, Ms. Price, the, the member for Durack, uh, also someone that's very much on the record in support of the cashless debit card. She was re-elected. So, so what we, it's really important that we actually hear from these communities, from these communities, where the cashless debit card is in, action, in operation. Now, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, you started off really well talking about the amendments, and I've given you fair time. You've strayed a bit, so thank you. If you come back to the amendments. Thank you, thank you for bringing me back, uh, Madam President. Because this, of course, is about the amount of time that these communities will be able to have. Now, these are busy people, right? Uh, and and to, to just rush this through and not allow for proper consideration of this bill is disrespectful to these people, in particular the people that this bill is going to impact the most. Now, we hear a lot about uh, consultation. We hear a lot about the need for it. Well, I know now, unless something's changed in the last five days since I last spoke to people in the uh, up in the, the northern goldfields, no one from the government, no one from the government, Senator Chisholm, no one has been in the goldfields to discuss the cashless debit card and the abolition of it uh, since since the election. Now, this is a, a a real shame. So this will be an opportunity. We should provide them with the opportunity to be able to have a thorough, uh, uh, be given the full opportunity to be able to put in uh, thorough submissions that will detail very clearly, very accurately, what their views are on the abolition of the cashless debit card. There does seem to be a very uh, ideological uh, driven approach that this government is, is putting to this. We know that members of the government, or when they're in opposition in particular, called this policy racist. 
They call this policy racist. And so there is, a, there is a, an ideological driven approach to, to this policy rather than focusing on what is necessary. So I would also like to uh, uh, move um, a, an amendment to uh, this motion and I'll just get some it's been circulated in the chamber. Do I need to read it out? I'll just move the motion um, then as circulated. It and we'll come back to Thank it once you. we've dealt with the various other bits. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe, uh, you have about one minute. Thank you, uh, President. I uh, agree with the government's reporting date. However, I must say the cashless debit card is racist. It's racist. And it is a form of oppression right. on First Nations people in uh, this Thorpe, country. Senator Thorpe, I did remind all senators you are to uh, talk about the merits or not of the amendments before the chamber, not the substantial matter. Which Thank you. That's why we need an inquiry at this date. So, mission management happened when our people were rounded up and put on concentration camps in this country. What Senator were they Thorpe? given? They were given rations. Senator Thorpe, it's rations. Uh, resume your seat. You are to constrain your remarks to the amendments before the chair. Please continue. There are Aboriginal people on this card that are being denied their human rights and dignity to self-determine how they live their lives. They need to be heard through this process Thank because you, we Senator will not Thorpe, be mission managed anymore. So I remind senators that uh, there was a request that the amendments be split. Um, so we are dealing with a part A first and we're dealing with Senator McKim's amendment. So the question is that the amendment as Senator, moved by Senator McKim to part A be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. A division required. Um, ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that order. So the question is that um, the amendment to part A is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order, there being 12 ayes and 44 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'm now going to put part A uh, as unamended. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher um, on part A be agreed to. The, uh, uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to part B and I call Senator O'Sullivan. You've got an amendment to part B, I think. Oh, Senator Rustin. And, and I move that at the end of the motion, in respect to the. Just uh, about, I don't think your mic's on, Senator Rustin. <laughs> uh, I'll call you again, Senator Rustin. Yeah, so at the end of the motion, and in respect to the Social Security Administration Amendment repeal of the cashless debit card and other measures, Bill 2022, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee report by the 5th of October. Thank you. So I'm going to put that amendment. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Rustin to Part B be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. One. One minute. Uh, four minutes, sorry.
lock the doors. So the question is, the amendment as moved by Senator Rustin to Part B be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 27 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now put um, that, motion, that part of the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher, Part B. Um, the question is that Part B be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And now move the selection of Bill's report as moved by Senator Urquhart. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it uh, desired to postpone or arrange or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart? Um, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Wong for today on account of parliamentary business and Senator Stewart from the 22nd of August 2022 to the 29th of January 2023 for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that order, those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Tyrrell. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Tyrrell. I move leave of absence be granted to Senator Lambie. She is in Hobart for business relating to the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Tyrrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Am I, am I doing this? Thank you. Um, Speaker, I'm uh, President. I move that today, um, government business order of the day number three be considered from 12:15 p.m. and general business notice of motion number 20 be considered during general business. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senator Macdonald for the 4th of August for parliamentary business, and Senator Payne for the 3rd and the 4th of August for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by yes. Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I'll go back to calling the clerk. Uh, President, a postponement notification has been lodged as shown at item eight of today's order of business. That's to postpone business of the Senate notice number one to the sixth of December 2020, uh, September 2022. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, we'll go to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Scar. Senator Scar. President, I ask the business of the Senate notice motion number two 
proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Scar. I move the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Scar be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business uh, notice of motion number 16, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. General business notice. Motion number 16, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. Mr. President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A uh, bill Senator Wish Wilson, I'm not Mr. President. Oh, you're absolutely correct. I'm, my apologies, uh, President, President. President. Thank you. I'll start again. President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 to stop seismic testing and oil and gas drilling in our oceans and for related purposes. Uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is, the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 and for related purposes. Senator Wish Wilson. I move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, I'm going to now move to committee memberships. This isn't valid, that's coming later. The President has received a letter nominating senators to be members of a committee. I call the Minister. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Minister. Thank you. I move that senators be appointed to the Select Committee on Work and Care, as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. For indulgence from the Senate, we're just a few minutes off 12.15, which we designated for the ballot. Um, so I'd, I would ask the Senate uh, if we could move to the ballot before we commence other business. Is there any objection to that? Required for the crossbench position on the Northern Australia Committee, and the bells will now be rung for four minutes. Thank you, Senators.
Order, lock the doors. It is necessary to hold a ballot for the crossbench position on the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia. I understand it is the wish of the Senate for that ballot to be held now. The Senate will now proceed to a ballot. Ballot papers will be distributed to senators. The candidates are indicated on the ballot paper. Senator Ormond Payne. Uh, I, President, I seek leave to make a short statement in support of my candidacy. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Ormond Payne. Uh, thank you, President. I'm proud to put my name forward to be a member of the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia. I have a deep abiding commitment to Northern Australia, its people, its places and cultures. The Select Committee on Northern Australia requires members with a deep knowledge, understanding and respect for the region. As a regionally based senator who has spent the majority of my life living and working in Northern Queensland, I bring these qualities to the role. I have spoken extensively about my time spent as a teacher in Northern Australia, but my experience doesn't only come from decades of living and teaching in the North. I also have significant commercial law experience working in trade and transport with a focus on marine industries, which are critical for many communities across the North. I also hold the portfolio of Northern Australia for the Greens alongside the portfolios of industry, transition and regional development. I'm well placed to make a meaningful contribution to the important work of this committee. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I seek to make a short statement. You're seeking leave? Yes, uh, please. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Thank Senator you. Roberts. Uh, I have lived and worked in, in northern Queensland, and I've been all over northern Queensland and much of the rest of the country in the north. Uh, I understand what makes the North tick, and I've been to every community and every town in North Queensland, and I listen to the people there. I've contributed through the previous committee on Northern Development, and I believe I'd make a valuable contribution to this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, I now ask that the ballot papers with the candidates on them be distributed. Have all senators now voted? If so, I shall ask the clerks to uh, collect the ballot papers.
no one connect no. I now invite Senator McKim and Senator Roberts to scrutinise the count.
Order. The result of the ballot is as follows. Senator Ormond Payne, 36. Senator Roberts, 31. Therefore, Senator Ormond Payne is elected as the uh, member of the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia, nominated by a crossbench senator. I call uh, the clerk. Government business order of the day number three. Governor General's opening speech, address and reply. Thank you. Um, I, if people can just move um, out quietly, that would be great. And I will give Senator Rice the call as you're in consider, uh, continuation. Thank you, Acting Senator Deputy Rice. President. As I was reflecting and as I began this contribution the day after the, the Governor General had given his speech, and reflecting upon this government's agenda, and I wanted to reflect on. Sorry, some... Senator Rice. Can I just ask uh, yeah. senators if you could keep the tone down as you're moving out of the chamber? I'm finding it difficult to to hear Senator Rice. Senator Rice. I was wanting to reflect on four key elements, which is the Greens' agenda, which is reflected to some extent in this government's agenda as well, and to to contrast the ambition. In particular, I wanted to talk about First Nations justice, about climate, about nature and about inequality. And to begin with, First Nations justice, which has got to be at the heart of everything that we are doing in this place. And it is good to see the increasing attention to First Nations justice that this parliament has compared to the previous one, but it is still not good enough. We need to be centering rights, justice, truth-telling, treaty, as well as a voice to parliament at the heart of everything we do, to be viewing through a lens of First Nations justice all of our considerations in this place, and to be remembering at all times that we are working on stolen land, that this is stolen land, that here in this place that we're on Ngunnawal, Ngambri, Miradjuri country, and sovereignty has never been ceded. This was, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. As I speak today, debate is almost completed, I understand, in the House, and there is about to be a vote on the government's climate bill, which will set a target of 43 per cent carbon reduction um, in our carbon emissions um, by 2030. We as Greens know that this is so far from what is necessary, but we as Greens also know that it is a step forward. It is a massive step forward from the climate denialism that we had of the previous government, where their target was clearly completely out of step with the rest of the world, completely out of step with what the science requires. But we also know that a 43 per cent target is basically going to be baking in the most extreme climate change, the most extreme heat, global heating, double what we've got now. It is just not enough. As people know, the Greens announced yesterday that we would be supporting the government's climate bill because it is a step forward. But as Adam Bant, our leader, said, it's like bringing a bucket of water to a house fire. It's a step forward, but it's nowhere near enough. We need to be doing so much more if we are going to have a safe climate for us, for us and for the people of the future and for all the other species that we share this planet with. We know what the science says, and that says it's not just the Greens saying this. It is scientists. It's the um, International Energy Agency. It's certainly the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is countries all around the world that know that we need to be having at least a 75 per cent reduction in our carbon pollution by 2030. At least. And even that is going to bake in a one and a half degree of warming. We've seen what a one and a half degree of, less than what a one and a half degree of warming means in the climate, in the weather that is being experienced around the world now. We have seen it in our black summer bushfires, those extraordinary fires that killed billions and billions of animals, that caused deaths around the country from heat stress, that caused massive impacts on our natural environment, the huge fires, the burning of our native forests, where in the East Gippsland region of Victoria, 80 per cent of the forests burnt in those fires. 
We've seen the heat waves in Europe. We've seen the temperature in England reach 40 degrees. We have seen the hundreds, if not thousands, of people dying there. We've seen the heat waves across Pakistan and India. We've seen the floods here in Australia. This is what's going to continue. This is what we need to be tackling, and we know what's causing this. We have known it for decades. Certainly for me, I came into this place with a history of having worked on climate and knowing that this was the number one existential issue that we needed to be acting on, and that was to be getting the serious action to be reducing our carbon pollution to zero as quickly as possible, and in fact having ne net negative emissions. And that means getting out of coal and gas and oil, because it is the burning of those fossil fuels which is causing the climate crisis. So our position, of course, is that we are going to keep on talking about the need to lift our level of ambition and to be getting out of the burning of coal and gas and oil as quickly as we possibly can here in Australia and also not contributing to the world um, burning of coal and gas and oil by continuing to open up new mines, to continue to open up new coal and gas, because we cannot afford to do so. We just can't. One of the problems in terms of decision-making in this place is, is such a short-term approach, just thinking, well, what's going to happen in terms of economic um, profits for a very small number of people over a fairly small period of time? When that's not the decision-making framework that we need to have, we need to be thinking about the reality of what the burning of those coal and gas reserves is going to mean for our future. And it's not a happy future. I mean, the science is really clear. Every tonne of coal and gas burnt increases the intensity and the speed of changes to our climate, which means more floods such as those experienced across New South Wales and Queensland this year. More intense droughts, more heat waves and more frequent bushfires. So the, the positive thing, of course, in terms of the, a, a government agenda and what we can be working together is that Australia is so blessed with renewable resources, both for ourselves as a country but also for export to the rest of the world. We, have got, we are probably best placed in the whole world to be leading this, this transition, and that's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be um, working towards, rather than hypocritically using the drug dealers' defence about our coal and our gas, that, oh, if we don't uh, um, burn it, if we don't mine it, if we don't export it, that somebody else will. Because not only is that immoral, and not only is it completely un <laughs> substantiated in terms of um, it will, are completely unacceptable in terms of what the impact of that will mean on our future it's just not true because we are the world's second largest exporter of thermal coal Australia's the third largest fossil fuel exporter behind only Russia and Saudi Arabia and in fact if we had a planned transition out of coal and gas we've got our coal and gas mines at the moment we have a planned transition out of those, and we absolutely do not open up any of the 114 new coal and gas mines that are currently being planned. If we did that, did that in a planned and measured way, actually that would have a massive impact on the world supply, and it would turbocharge the shift which is already happening around the world to renewable energy including so much Australian renewable energy, Australian electricity, Australian hydrogen, created with Australian jobs in a future-focused Australian economy. That's the direction that we need to be putting all of our efforts into, to be saying this is the sustainable future for us all. This is what's going to be bringing wealth and well-being to Australia as well as to the rest of the world. The Greens are imploring the government to be listening to the science and to be lifting their, their ambition. And we will keep on talking about the need to be getting out of coal and gas. The bill that's going through the House today, which will come back to us in the, in the Senate in the coming months, is just the first step. There is so much more that needs to be done. We implore the government to listen to the voices of the community rather than listening to the big coal and gas corporations. 
and particularly listen to the voices of young people who, unlike most of us, I mean, I don't know whether I'll still be around in 2050, certainly in 2070 I'll be long gone, but the young people who are, who are talking about their future, they are going to be here in 2050. They are going to be here in 2070. They are the people that are going to have to be living with the consequences of our decision today. When the Governor-General gave his speech, we had young people here in this parliament on our opening day on Tuesday last week. They came to parliament to have their voices heard on these urgent issues of climate and inequality. However, very sadly, in an attempt to silence them, these young, peaceful protesters were ejected by the parliament by police for singing, for singing, mind you, in peaceful protest. And I'm so glad that I, the following day that I, got out, I was able to get out and meet them and to sing with them on the lawns of Parliament House, to tell them that we heard their voices, that we, were go we listened to them, that we were going to keep on acting and be their representatives in this place and to try and get the government to listen. So I want to use some of my time here today to actually elevate their voices and to give you the words that they were telling us their message to us all um, on Tuesday last week. They are a strong and growing movement of young people from all over the country, and they want you to hear this. They were telling us, with people across the country facing unprecedented climate disasters, rising costs of living and a housing crisis, we need climate jobs for all, and that solving the climate crisis is too important to be left in the hands of big business. We need sustained action coordinated by the government in the hands of the public, and a climate jobs guarantee will end unemployment and get our economy back on track. It will solve the climate crisis. It will prepare us for climate disasters. And they said that our politicians have a choice to make. They can either bend to the will of big business or choose a people-first recovery that makes society better than what it was before the pandemic. So I pledge to those young people from the Tomorrow Movement that we Greens are listening, and I implore everybody else in this place to listen to them as well. One of the other things that was really notable um, in the Governor-General's speech was the absence of any commitment to be protecting our native forests, which are one of the, protecting our forests is one of the most efficient, effective and immediate ways to take climate action, because our native forests are excellent carbon sinks. There was a recent study on Tasmania's forest by the Trees Project, which revealed that by pr protecting native forests could provide $2.6 billion worth of carbon sequestration by 2050. And alarmingly, the study also found that annual emissions from native forest logging in Tasmania are equivalent to the annual emissions of 1.1 million cars. And experts have also warned us that logging our precious native forests also increases the frequency and the severity of bushfires and driving threatened species further into extinction and placing Australians in danger. We're, and yet we are in a situation where we are not protecting our forests. We must protect our forests or we risk a climate catastrophe. And yet native forest logging is being facilitated by state and federal governments who are recklessly destroying our forests. Native forest logging will never be sustainable. It destroys First Nations countries and country and totem species, destroys habitat and robs our future generations of the right to our environment. And yet, again, as I'm speaking here today, this afternoon in the Victorian parliament, there is legislation being passed that is going to put, um, make the people protesting about and people defending our forests could be imprisoned for up, for up to a year or receive up to $21,000 in fines. And we've got similar anti-protest laws that have also been debated in the Tasmanian and the New South Wales Parliament. So I'm calling upon this government to speak out about these state government laws. These log we need to be scrapping our logging laws. We need to be protecting our native forests, but at the very least, that this, what this Labor government could be doing is to speak up for people's rights and, the, and to speak up for the environment, and they should be making the strongest representations to Victoria to abandon these laws, which are an attack on people's rights as well as an attack on our forests. Thank you, Senator. Senator Marielle Smith, you have the call. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'm also rising to make a contribution in response to the address by the Governor-General at the commencement of the 47th Parliament. And to hear the bold, nation-changing agenda of the Albanese Labor government reflected in his words was a really proud moment for me in this place. We as a government have so much work to do. We took a plan to the election that would deliver considered and serious reform across Australia. Our plans for early education and care will ensure 97 per cent of Australian families have better, cheaper access to care. We're committed to the development and implementation of an early year strategy to identify how best government can coordinate the various government services impacting the early years. This is about delivering real outcomes, better outcomes for our youngest Australians, something I am deeply passionate about. We've promised to rebalance the industrial framework in Australia, to provide more job security, stronger wage gro growth and to close the gender pay gap. Deputy President, as a proud and parochial South Australian, I have seen close hand the impact of declining manufacturing in this country. It has affected my state perhaps more than any other. And at times during this previous government, we've seen that decline in manufacturing be aided and abetted by the decisions that they have made. The collapse of our car industry in South Australia had consequences which will be felt in South Australia for generations to come. But it's not just the car industry, it was the uncertainty given to the workers at Osborne in the submarine program who were left uncertain year after year, Christmas after Christmas, about the future of their jobs, about the opportunities for them in our state. Australia should be a country that makes things great things, and our government will make it one again. Australians also deserve to have faith that when they go to work, they get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. This is a pillar of fairness in Australia. It's part of who we are as Australians, something else that we will deliver. Another pillar of fairness, Medicare, which after a decade of the coalition government has been run down in the face of growing demand. This pandemic that we've all been living through the past few years has been a stark reminder of the importance of a well-funded and robust public health system which only Labor prioritises, only Labor delivers in government. And I'm proud of our commitments during this election that will strengthen Medicare further. We built Medicare, we believe in it, and we will protect it. We're going to make it easier to see a doctor, cut the cost of medications for millions of Australians. We've got reforms to children's health care, including ending the newborn health screening lottery and providing better care for children with hearing loss. The task of Labor governments is always urgent. And once again, we've entered government at a hugely challenging time for our nation. I am absolutely committed to meeting the moment in which we find ourselves in as a government and as a community. And I know every member of the Albanese Labor government is as well. We don't intend to waste a single day of government in, in facing and tackling the challenges facing the Australian people and our community. I was elected in 2019, and since I've been elected, I've travelled all over our state, talking to families, talking to workers, talking to kids about what they wanted out of their government and what our plan was for South Australians. From Sejuna to Murray Bridge, Gawler to Paynham, the message was clear that South Australians wanted better. They wanted more from their government, and they wanted something fairer. And particularly, over the last couple of years, they've wanted change. They felt unheard unlistened to, and they felt like the government, the previous government, didn't have their interests at heart. Aged care workers have told me about the desperate conditions they've faced every day at work, feeling underpaid, overworked, not given the respect that they deserve. I will never forget the incredible privilege I had to join a group of aged care workers in Adelaide as they bust from their workplaces to the CBD to protest the government's failures on aged care. I was invited by my good friend Donna, a proud and fearless advocate for the hard-working and dedicated aged care workers she works alongside every day, and of course the residents that they adore too. As we bust into the city and we got closer into town, some of these workers started playing music on the bus. And one of the songs they put on was a song by Sir Elton John. I'm not going to sing it, but uh, the words were, I'm still standing after all this time. 
It was a light moment on a serious day, but I couldn't get those words out of my mind because what apt words to describe a workforce which had been pushed to breaking point, not just during the pandemic but in the years before it, where aged care was treated with nothing sh short of neglect. For these workers, for the residents they care for, for the families who love those residents, we finally, under this government, have a chance to do better. I heard from countless families and caregivers disheartened by their ability to access affordable, quality, early learning and care where they live, in the, in the communities where they live. Families weighing up the financial implications of another day of care, making huge decisions about their lives, their work and their children because the costs of care were crushing. But not just families, our early learning educators left completely behind during the pandemic who felt unseen and unvalued by government, a government that in what was one of the lowest days I think we've had in this building where we had reports of members of the government labelling childcare as outsourced parenting, one of the most vile attacks our early learning educators have experienced and of course deeply offensive to the families who rely on them. I've been really proud to stand up for our educators. We've got a big agenda for early learning, but I'm keenly aware that it's not everything. My ambition for early learning knows absolutely no bounds and it's something I will continue to fight and advocate for in the years ahead because it matters. It matters to children in care, their opportunities and their outcomes. It matters to productivity. It matters to the kind of nation that we want to build. It matters when we're looking at smashing intergenerational disadvantage. And it matters for the amazing workforce which deliver this profound service to our community in educating our littlest minds. Now, before the pandemic caused such great devastation in South Australia, we had another kind of devastation with the summer bushfires that struck Kangaroo Island and the Adelaide Hills. With homes and businesses destroyed, we had lives lost. Now, these sorts of disasters are devastating and they're only going to get worse. They're only set to get more severe and more frequent because of the effects of climate change. And my community in South Australia knows it. South Australians want action on climate change. They're sick and tired of the climate wars and they voted for us because they want these wars over. And I'm so proud that in the other place we've seen the start of that work happen today and we have more to do. We're going to end these climate wars. We're going to get the action that we need and we're going to do it in a way which brings business, which brings workers, which brings environmental groups together on a journey to meet our responsibilities and do what we know we need to do for our planet and our environment. I also heard from young South Australians, I have heard from them over the past few years and still now about the difficulties they face with housing, either buying their first homes or continuously dealing with ever increasing rents. And that's just gotten much worse since 2020 in South Australia with prices skyrocketing and rental availability going down. And on top of these challenges, they had a government forcing them to drain their superannuation accounts to tap into that limited resource when they were doing it tough. I heard from small and medium businesses who rely on the pipeline of defence manufacturing in South Australia, but fearful for their future with the, the continuous delays to decisions around the future of work at Osborne. Businesses who now have a new assurance from our Defence Minister, who's committed to manufacturing the nuclear submarine fleet in Adelaide. Each of these stories paints a picture of an Australia tired of nine long years of a government with no agenda, no plans and no desire to build a better future for Australia. And these people represent just a fraction of the community I represent, who I talk to, seek to represent, to help, to assist in my work as a senator. It's one of the best parts of what I get to do, is getting into different communities in our state, talking to people, finding out what's going on the ground, and then bringing that back into this place and fighting for change. And there's one community in particular in South Australia which has absolutely captured my heart during my time as a senator and that's the community of Sejuna and the surrounding areas. In this community, I was shocked to learn that their pleas for help in replacing their local health clinic, which was dangerously run down and had been ignored for years by governments who kept passing the buck. This clinic, of course, is Yadu Health, a clinic I've spoken about many times in this chamber, a clinic riddled with mould, asbestos, water damage, 
where a staff member said that they had been electrocuted at their desk trying to plug something into the wall, another staff member talking about the roof falling in during the rains. A clinic where too many people walked in said, oh, that's terrible, and just kept on walking. This clinic will now be rebuilt by the Albanese Labor government. I am so proud of this commitment, and I am deeply grateful to the Honourable Linda Burney MP and Minister Kaya Marin SA for their work here as well. Acting Deputy President, since the election, the most common sentiment I've heard from South Australians in talking about the result is relief. And it's a feeling that I felt on election night too. Relief that something better, fairer and more just was on its way to Australia. Relief that leadership and accountability is back. Relief that our nation's diversity would finally be better reflected in the new parliament. Indeed, it's better reflected in this chamber. Relief that progressive values that prioritise caring for one another, looking after one another and valuing people could once again be at the heart of federal government. So many people contributed to the outcome, volunteers and, of course, all the candidates who ran. I want to acknowledge in the other place my good friends Matt Burnell and Louise Miller-Frost, who have been elected at this election and also the many candidates who put their hands up for Labor values, like Sonia in Sturt, Julie in Gray, Mark in Barker, Marissa in Mayo, and Traman and Joe and Belinda, who all were candidates for Labor's Senate ticket. All of these candidates committed to our values, committed to what we were trying to achieve, to get an agenda of fairness back at the heart of government. And I want to congratulate Tony Zappier MP and Steve Georganis MP in the other place on their re-elections, and note that I'm very proud to continue to serve alongside Senator Grogan, even though, like me, she was not up for re-election this time. And I do also want to acknowledge that in the ministry we have some great South Australians in Senator Wong, Senator Farrell, Amanda Rishworth and Mark Butler, all of whom I congratulate on their appointments. In my first speech in this place in 2019, I outlined my belief that one of the greatest tasks of Labor is to make Australia better for the generations to come. We are custodians of the institutions and the levers of policy within government to make it better, to make it better, to make it fairer, and we're on our way. I've been proud to sit in this place during the Governor-General's address last week where the values, goals and bold ideas of our new Labor government were read into the record. It is an incredibly humbling honour to be part of the Albanese Labor government, which I know will place fairness boldness, urgency and unity at the centre of our plans to tackle the challenges before our nation. Our party, the great Australian Labor Party, is the great reformer of Australian history. Whether it's the establishment of Medicare under Bob Hawke, native title, the NDIS, we do the big things, the hard things, which change our nation fundamentally for the better. And I know the reforms of our government, led by Anthony Albanese, will lead to a fairer and better Australia for the next generation and those to come. And I am especially humbled by the task ahead with the referendum on a voice and indeed to the broader implementation of the Uluru Statement from the heart in full, which Labor is committed to delivering voice, treaty and truth. In Gama, we saw the Prime Minister set the roadmap for the path ahead. This is the start of the public discussion. It's the start of the process which I hope will lead to a voice, and if we, if we get there, I know that voice will make a difference, a practical difference. And I believe South Australians are ready. South Australians are ready for voice, treaty, truth. They want to walk in unity towards that path. As a senator, I'll take my leadership responsibility to walk with Australians towards that goal and to do that in a way which is collaborative and respectful. But ultimately, I deeply hope this parliament, the 47th parliament, that that is something that we can achieve and be proud of achieving together. Thank you. I will take the opportunity before calling the next speaker just to remind senators that it is um, courteous to listen to other senators in silence rather than interjecting. Senator Bragg, you have the call. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I welcome the opportunity to make some remarks in response to the Governor-General's statement at the opening of the parliament last week and to deal with uh, one of the primary issues in the speech uh, where the government has identified 
the Uluru Statement as a priority. I think it is an important issue and I think it is going to take a lot of thought and a lot of care uh, for us to be able to deliver on some of those components or some of those policies that have been sought under that statement. Um, and I guess the first point to make is that there is no question that over the past 250 years that uh, we have failed to institute good policies uh, in Indigenous affairs. Um, we have not been able to uh, provide the sort of uh, country that we want to be, uh, and all you need to do is to look at the often recited statistics in the Closing the Gap uh, reports, which are regularly provided and updates given now by the Productivity Commission. Now, um, yeah, reflecting upon what Senator Smith just had to say, I mean, there's no question that the Labor Party uh, have done some good things over the history on Indigenous affairs, and so has the Liberal Party. Um, and it will take a degree of bipartisanship, or tripartisanship, I believe, uh, if we are going to have any successes uh, in this area, because, of course, we are living in a country that has not had a successful referendum since 1977, uh, which is quite a long way, uh, quite a long time before I was born. Uh, and of course, there have been uh, a series of defeated referenda in my lifetime. Now, in order to achieve uh, broad-based support for a change in the constitution, I think it will be very important to take people along on the journey and to address the issues, some of which have been raised in this chamber and in this building in the past couple of weeks. And I think it is a reasonable proposition that uh, we would seek to achieve uh, what John Howard set out in 2007 when he said that we should have uh, a form of constitutional recognition, but that we also should seek to do a better job on listening to people in communities about government service delivery and do a better job of ensuring that the laws that we make for Indigenous people and policies that we make uh, are, in, are working for those communities. Um, now, it is true that everyone is an individual, uh, and it is also true that when you travel around parts of uh, regional Australia, as I have in New South Wales, Western New South Wales, and you talk to community members, uh, I mean, they are not talking about the constitution. They are not thinking about constitutional amendments uh, in many cases. Uh, the issues that are before them are much more immediate uh, and are often about uh, routine service delivery, uh, getting kids to school and the like. Now, my view is that these changes, if done properly, can address these, this wretched problem of how does government provide services, how does government engage and listen with citizens, particularly in far-flung parts of our states that we represent. So my hope is that that is what can happen in this process. And, and now, with there having been a set of words put on the table last weekend, and as um, our Shadow Minister, Mr Lisa, indicated, it is a reasonable question, it is a reasonable starting point. Uh, the parliament and the community should be given an opportunity to look at the various models or the forms of words uh, that could be applicable, that could be acceptable, uh, that could be acceptable to Indigenous people more broadly, but also something which has a chance of being adopted and something that has a chance of winning at a referendum. Uh, so I think that is a reasonable position for us to, to work on and I will be uh, ha happy to work with other people in this parliament on that process. Um, I, I would make the point though that if, if we are going to focus on the voice, uh, which I understand is the first priority that most people in this place have indicated we should pursue, um, then that is going to take a lot of the effort. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to pursue other significant measures in this space, uh, and so I look forward to making some contributions there. Now, of course, the main reason that uh, we have this parliament, of course, is to ensure that we can put in place policies for the benefit of our people, 
And my view has always been that the foundation of a fair society or a good society is a strong economy. Now, the Labor Party had a few policies they took through the election that they won. Not many, they had a few. Uh, and they had a few policies for the economy, just a few. Uh, and um, let's see how they go with, with those. Uh, but in the first few weeks of the, the government's time in office, the initial agenda appears to be very focused on paying off vested interests at the, uh, the super funds and at the unions and at the class action lawyers. And um, I just say that if, if the job of the government is to work through the list of grievances from its vested interests, um, then that would be a very regrettable start. And I think it will ultimately end up in a position where the government is going to run out of things to do, uh, because um, these, laun these laundry lists of rent seekers are only, uh, only, only so long. And so to step through a few of these misguided uh, agenda items, I mean, everyone knows that the ABCC abolition is purely designed to pay off the CFMEU, which is the major donor to the Labor Party. I mean, why would anyone want to reduce the rule of law and transparency uh, in that key construction sector? And then we've got Mr Jones over in the House of Representatives. Now, he's seeking to hide political donations that have been made by the super funds into the union movement. But he's also seeking, which is very curious, Mr Jones is also seeking to hide payments from the super funds to the union movement as well. Now, um, he is seeking to do that by ripping up regulations that were only made a few months ago, which require super funds to disclose to members in their annual member statements the amount and the detail of the payments that are made to the political parties and to the unions. They're required to be disclosed in detail. Now, Mr Jones wants to rip it up. Now, he's wanting to do that um, before the disclosures have even been made for the financial year just gone, um, I assume because he doesn't want to be embarrassed by what disclosures are going to be made. Now, he is currently having a consultation draft of his regulation through the Treasury Department. And I feel sorry for the Treasury officials. I, I feel sorry for them having to implement this absolute garbage, um, which is basically ripping up the transparency and integrity provisions that have been put in place. And after the Labor Party have uh, lectured everyone else in this place about transparency and integrity, one of their first items is, of course, to reduce <laughs> integrity and transparency. So anyway, so Mr Jones is out there, he's, he's consulting on this regulation to hide these donations and these payments. So the great super cover-up is, is what I kind of call it. And if he decides to go ahead with this, if he decides to go ahead with this and he wants to make this regulation, uh, of course this chamber could disallow that regulation within 15 days of it having been made. And let's see. I mean, we, we will see whether the people that have talked endlessly about integrity and transparency are going to eat their words or are they going to ensure that people who are forced to save into these vehicles are allowed to see where their money is going? That is the question. Can people who are members of super funds see where their money is going? Now, is it going to the Labor Party? Is it going off to the unions? We know that in the last year, 13 million bucks went from the super funds into the unions. That's going to balloon to $30 million by the end of this decade. So it's a lot of money. Now, anyone who's been involved in political campaigns in Australia can tell you that 30 million bucks a year is a lot of money. And so we will see. We will see if Mr Jones wants to pursue this regulation. I suspect that he may not want to, but if he does, we will test the metal of the Senate and to see whether people are really committed to transparency and integrity. Now, of course, the other thing that uh, Mr Jones is pursuing over there in the House is a proposal to weaken the best financial interest duty that was put in place for the super funds, which is designed to stop the super funds giving the money off for non-commercial, non-member focused activities. Uh, it is designed to stop 
these sort of payments to unions, to political parties. It's designed to ensure that the funds can't get engaged in political advertising. It's designed to stop the funds sending money off to th their boondoggle, the New Daily, which is an organisation that they've funded heavily, which is basically just a propaganda outfit. So the whole point of the best financial interest duty was to ensure that superannuation is there for the members. And so Mr Jones has asked the Treasury again, I feel sorry for the Treasury officials, very good officials. The Treasury officials in the market group, some of the best public servants in the Commonwealth. And they're sitting there having to review the best financial interest duty. Now, the only reason you would want to review the best financial interest duty is that you want to admit or permit new payments that are banned today. That's the only reason you would do it. So we will see. And Mr Jones, at some stage, will have to come clean on what other payments he wants to see. Does he want to open the floodgates to more payments for unions? Does he want to set up a new media empire funded by the unions? Maybe he wants to send more money through to the New South Wales branch of the Labor Party. We will find out. We will find out. But uh, until, until we are clearer about what, what payments he wants to admit, then that agenda can only be seen as working through a laundry list of items for the super fund and union movement. Now, of course, the Labor Party have put forward very few policies for small business, and I think that in this term of parliament we should be looking to make it easier. Make it easier for people to run a small business, make it easier to hire, make it easier for people to comply with government regulations, make it easier to pay, pay tax. Uh, we want to make sure that small businesses in this country are very easy to get going. And so, Equally, my own party should have a good hard look at what policies we are prepared to put on the table as a party of government. And directionally, my party should also take time to consider the verdict that was given at the last election. And I believe we should be very focused on our core equities of putting forward policies that are predominantly around driving economic growth, looking after enterprise and ensuring that we are focused on fairness, looking after people. Now, I would say that in the last period of time uh, there have been too many cases where we have been dragged into culture wars and things that didn't really matter to people uh, or people couldn't understand why we were, were pursuing them. And we have been perceived at times as not being focused on fairness. And we need to be a party of government Focus on fairness and enterprise, and we need to consider carefully the feedback from the electorate that we received in May. And look, you know, we can all, there's always room for improvement, and people shouldn't be defensive about these things. And uh, it is my strong view that we, we have to have much better policies on emissions reduction. We have to take seriously the issues that were raised by Australian women, and we have to be. Uh, committed to uh, working with the government and other parties to put in place a serious integrity commission in Canberra. Uh, I think this week has been an important week on that journey, and I very much welcome the opposition leader's commitment that the Liberal Party and the Coalition will develop a stronger policies on, em on emissions reduction. Uh, we have had the 26 to 28 per cent reduction at 2030 for too long, and it's not been good enough. And I am very keen that we can go to the next election, well before the next election, with a vastly stronger policy on emissions reduction. It's important. It's important that the parties of government are presenting to the community, but also to investors who we want to fund this transition, because we don't want taxpayers to be funding the transition, we want the market to fund it, that the parties of government are committed to emissions reduction and are committed to doing it in a competitive way and that we are going to keep pace with our competitors and we are going to do our fair share of the heavy lifting. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Say well. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Bragg. We do look forward to hearing from you again at a future point. Uh, Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
On 21 May this year, Australians voted for change. They voted for change because they were tired. They were tired of an almost decade-old government that failed to address the major issues our country was facing. They were tired of a Prime Minister who refused to take responsibility, who would respond to questions about his failure to act with, that's not my job or I don't hold a hose, mate. They were tired of the Prime Minister's failures during the COVID pandemic, the failure to roll out vaccinations quickly enough, the failure to secure rapid antigen tests when they were needed and the failure to get stranded Australians home. They were tired of government ministers trying to undermine state and territory border controls by calling on premiers and chief ministers to open up before it was safe to do so. They were shocked that the previous government would join forces with a billionaire mining magnate to challenge state border restrictions in the High Court, support they only withdrew when they realised how unpopular it was. Australians were tired of the government treating taxpayers' monies like it was Liberal Party money. They were tired of the rorts and the government's refusal to establish a national anti-corruption commission with real teeth. They were tired of seeing scandal after scandal when it came to issues of transparency and accountability. The sports rorts, the car park rorts, the overpriced land sales and overpriced water buybacks, the forging of documents to make a political point, the million-dollar blind trust used to fund court action against the ABC, and the list just goes on and on. The previous government took corruption and malfeasance to a level not seen since Joe Bielke peterson Australians were tired of the government refusing to take real action on climate change and continuing to make excuses for their lack of action. They were tired of seeing their wages stagnate while the cost of everything else was going up, yet the previous government had no plans to do anything about low wage growth or the cost of living. Haven't they changed their tune? They were tired of the neglect of older Australians in residential aged care. They were tired of the Prime Minister showing up for photo ops doing inane things like building a chicken coop, cooking a curry or playing the banjo—not that well, I might add—yet he would go missing whenever there was a crisis or need for real leadership. Australians voted for a majority Labor government because we offered them a positive alternative. We offered a vision and a plan for a better future. In my reply to the Governor-General's address, I will outline three areas that are of particular interest to me in which the Albanese Labor government offers a positive alternative to the abysmal record of the previous government. Those areas are early childhood education and care, skills and training, and housing and homelessness. Turning first to early childhood education and care, I've chosen this focus, to focus on this area because of my more than a decade past experience as an early childhood educator. We know that childcare is important for families because it helps them to juggle their work and family responsibilities. And this is particularly important for women who tend to take the bulk on the bulk of caring responsibilities. We know from evidence, both in Australia and overseas, that subsidised childcare helps boost women's participation in the workforce and is an important contributor to closing the gender pay gap. Given the importance of subsidised early childhood education and care, I found it particularly galling to hear this measure described by those on the other side as communism, a money pit and the hand of government reaching in and taking away our children's youth. If that was the attitude of the previous government, then it explains a lot about their childcare policies. Out-of-pocket costs for childcare went up more than 40 per cent under the previous government. We even had the farcical situation where parents, mostly women, were sometimes only receiving a marginal financial benefit from taking on additional work. In some cases, it was even costing them more than they stood to earn. The policy Labor brought to the last election will make childcare cheaper for 96 per cent of Australian families. That's 1.26 million families. It will lift the maximum subsidy to 90 per cent for families for the first child in childcare and keep the higher and additional rates for the second and additional children. On top of this, we will get the Productivity Commission to conduct a comprehensive review into the sector with the aim of implementing a universal 90 per cent subsidy for all families, and the ACCC to design a price regulation mechanism to drive out-of-pocket costs down for good. 
Subsidising early childhood education and care is about a lot more than just driving workforce participation. As a former early childhood educator who understands the industry and the work that the educators do, I know that the benefits flow not just to the parents but also, importantly, to the children. This is why workers in the sector are called educators now instead of carers. Yes, they provide all the important care needs for children, such as feeding, changing nappies and wiping runny noses, but educators also provide an age-appropriate program of play-based learning aimed at specific learning outcomes. They train for years, learning how to plan and implement this learning. They also undertake continuous professional development to maintain their skills and keep up to date with the latest knowledge and research on early childhood learning and development. This is a highly skilled professional occupation that provides the foundation skills necessary to set children up for their school education. We know from research that children who engage in early learning get better learning outcomes for life. The early years before the age of five are considered to be a key time for learning development. Early childhood education contributes to so many aspects of learning motor skills, social and emotional development, language skills and comprehension, and the list goes on. When we on this side of the chamber talk about cheaper childcare and when we talk about it in the lead up to the election, we're not just talking about reducing the cost of living for struggling Australian families. We're not just talking about driving workforce participation, getting more women into work and closing the gender pay gap, as important as they are. We are also talking about improving the learning outcomes of preschool aged children with skills that will potentially set them up for life. As a former educator, I know the power of early childhood education because I've seen how it has transformed the lives of the children who were under my care and who I taught. Now, I mentioned earlier the importance of Australians engaging in the workforce, but to do that we need to give them the opportunity to get secure, high-paying jobs. The most secure and best-paying jobs are skilled jobs. The COVID pandemic has laid bare the extraordinary depth of the skills crisis that Australia is facing. While Australia will always have a need to fill skills gaps with skilled migration, most Australians would agree that we should prioritise getting Australians into skilled Australian jobs. Employers are crying out for skilled workers, yet there are still over a million Australians either looking for work or looking for more work. The previous government just didn't fall asleep at the wheel when it comes to tackling Australian skill crisis. They crashed through a safety barrier and drove the car right over the cliff. Since coming to government, those opposite reduced Australia's apprentice and training numbers by 70,000. They cut billions of dollars from TAFE and, and university. And their decision to abolish industry skills councils meant that Australia was flying blind when it came to identifying and filling skills gaps. In one of my previous jobs, I was a training coordinator for the Australian Services Union, and I was the Tasmanian branch representative on two industry skills councils. Um, in, with, on two industry skills councils, with representatives from employers, employees, and relevant unions, training providers, and government representatives, these all collaborated to try and improve the skills of. Tasmanian people. The councils undertook such tasks as skills audits, curriculum development and writing, and advising on the implementation of training policies, as well as overseeing the process for approval of accredited training. This role helped me appreciate the importance of assessing skills needs, predicting future skills needs, and working with stakeholders in the process. This capability is vital if you want to know where to invest to develop the skills you need. If filling skills shortages is like driving a car, investing in training and education is like putting petrol in the car, while having an authority to identify the skills needs is like having a map to navigate. There's no point driving around burning petrol if you don't know where you're going. Sadly, the previous government has spent nine years draining the fuel tank, dismantling the engine and throwing the map right out the window. And so it's now left to Labor to fix the skills crisis and we will. The Albanese government will establish Jobs and Skills Australia as a national partnership to strengthen workforce, workforce planning by working together with employers, unions and the training and education sector. 
We will provide 465,000 fee-free TAFE places for students studying in industries with skill shortage, including 45,000 new places. And we will deliver up to 20,000 extra university places over 2022 and 2023 with a particular focus on national priority areas like clean energy, advanced manufacturing, health and education and where there are skill shortages. But even when Australians can get a secure, well-paying job, the dream of home ownership is becoming increasingly out of reach, particularly for young Australians. With soaring house prices, people who are renting are facing the double whammy for having to save for a bigger deposit while spending more of their money on rent in a tighter, more competitive rental market. For the first time in Australia's history, median house prices have passed a million dollars. It's very appropriate that my colleague Julie Collins, the member for Franklin, in whose electorate my local office just happens to be based, has been appointed the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. Minister Collins' electorate of Franklin covers most of the outer suburbs of Hobart, which now has the distinction of being the least affordable capital city for rental accommodation. We can see the disastrous consequences of this, with over 4,000 Tasmanians on the housing waiting list and the average waiting time being more than a year for priority applicants. For priority applicants, they have to wait more than a year. This means a lot of pain for people who are couch surfing, sleeping in emergency shelters or living in cars, tents or caravans. I can't begin to imagine how difficult this has been for Tasmania's homeless through the harsh winter we've just had. Only last week Hubbard had snow down to 200 metres. Shelter is a basic human need and as such it's a human right, but it's something that previous governments did almost nothing to provide over almost a decade in office. We have a Prime Minister now who truly understands the importance of social and affordable housing. After all, he grew up in public housing. And not only do we have a Prime Minister who grew up in public housing, our Housing Minister also spent the early years of her life in public housing. Building social and affordable housing works, and that's what Labor intends to do to address the housing crisis. That's why we will establish a $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund, the income from which will fund social and affordable housing in perpetuity. That includes 30,000 social and affordable homes across Australia in the first five years. Of course, providing secure, affordable accommodation also means helping more people and their families to realise the great Australian dream of owning their own home. Forty years ago, almost 60 per cent of Australians on low and modest incomes owned their own home. Now it's only 28 per cent. Labor's Help to Buy scheme will help 10,000 Australians a year reduce the cost of buying their own home by up to 40 per cent. This will mean a smaller deposit, smaller mortgage and smaller repayments. Now, I've outlined a I've outlined our plans in three important areas, but Labor's agenda for the future is so much bigger than that. We've got a lot of challenges to address, including rising inflation and uncertain global trade and security environment, and a trillion dollar debt. Trillion dollar debt. Many of these challenges are the legacy of the mess left to us through nine years of liberal national neglect. Cleaning up that mess is a big job. It will take a lot longer than the two months we've been in government for. No matter what those on the other side say, two months. You had nine years, we've had two months. But we've had one of the most experienced sorry, but we have one of the most experienced and capable ministries in Australian history. And we also have a wealth of new talent on our backbench. We were elected on the promise of delivering a better future for all Australians. With hard work and discipline, we're capable of delivering on that promise and we are getting on with the job of doing just that. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Canavan. Uh, uh, well, I've had a bit of a surreal uh, feeling here in Canberra the last two weeks. Uh, we perhaps face, as a country, the biggest challenges since the 1930s 
uh, yet we have wasted our time in this parliament on issues that are not going to deliver real results for Australians and not going to make our country more prepared and stronger for what might be to come. We face a year after two years of a pandemic, but in 2022 we face a year now where war has erupted in Europe for the first time since the 1940s, where today or this week uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is putting in, into place an effective blockade against Taiwan. And we do not know over the next year or two what might be called upon from Australians and particularly young Australians. Uh, this, this war in Europe now is metastasising potentially to become a world war, and uh, we will not be able to be completely immune from its impacts and effects. We should be preparing for that. We should be making our country more resilient and stronger and getting back to being self-sufficient in basic things that we need uh, to supply any type of economy during wartime. Instead, instead, all this new government is focused on is symbolism and tokenism. Uh, this morning, in the other place, a bill was passed. Uh, to establish a, an emissions target for 2030 in, in eight years' time. Who knows what's going to happen in the next eight years? We do not know. Uh, we do not know, but we are setting a target in eight years. I, I, on the government's own admission, this is something they don't really need. They don't need the legislation. They've, they've said that. They've said, oh, we don't need the ledge. Uh, we're just doing it effectively to fill time. Uh, I think there's other things we could be doing in this place rather than just engaging in symbolism. Another thing, we, we've been told we're going to have an Indigenous voice. But again, we're told, oh, it's not going to have any real power. It's not going to be able to do anything. Uh, it, it won't be able to solve any issues for Indigenous people. It will just be more politicians here in Canberra, more talk. And what this country needs now is action, not talk. And I worry, yes, I agree with Senator Billick. This government is only, only two, a few months old. Uh, and uh, they are still writing off the excuse that it's uh, my first day on the job. Fair enough, fair enough. But there is a lot of talk and not a lot of action coming here. Not a lot of action. And we need action uh, desperately as a country, given the circumstances we find ourselves. This is a, a reply to the Governor General's address, and I was making notes uh, during the uh, Governor General's uh, address to us. And I think often when you, you, you go through political speeches, which uh, in fans of the Governor General, it's not written by him, he just has to say it. Uh, uh, when you look at the political speech the government put together here, it's often what is not said. Uh, than what is uh, actually said that is key. And in the, all of the remarks, the uh, more than 20 minute speech that was provided by the Governor General to this chamber, there was, do you know, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, there was not one single mention in that speech of Australia's mining industry. Perhaps the greatest contributor to our nation's economy, particularly over the last couple of years. Perhaps the one thing I'll come to some of our weaknesses, which we need to be honest about, but it's perhaps one of the shining lights in our economy where we've become stronger and better and more self-sufficient in the last couple of decades is our mining industry, where the world's largest exporter of iron ore, the largest exporter of uranium, the largest exporter of coal, and now in just the last couple of years the largest exporter of liquid nat natural gas. We are an important country because of that. Uh, just today we read news that the the uh, shipment of coal that we uh, donated to the Ukraine has arrived in Poland uh, and will soon uh, be, be providing power to Ukrainians. Uh, uh, and uh, President Zelensky, just in the last few days, has thanked Australia for that contribution. We can make a contribution to the world's security uh, a lot through what we mine and the energy we provide, particularly, particularly given uh, the situation you see from the autocratic Russian regime, who is using energy, using their energy exports as leverage uh, to gain control and influence over a wartime situation. We can help. We can help avoid or prevent those countries having that leverage, having that ability to dictate to weaker and smaller countries over them. But only if we support our mining sector, our coal and oil and gas, uh, and iron ore and other industries. Uh, yet this speech, this speech did not have a single mention. There wasn't even a mention of lithium or nickel or cobalt, which is sort of the flavours of the month, but the big exports currently that we can help contribute are in those fossil fuel industries. Instead, instead, we've had the suggestion over the past couple of weeks—I know the Greens are always going to want to shut down the coal, oil and gas industries—but we've had the suggestion from the government, from the minister, uh, Chris Bowen, that he agrees with the Greens and he will find other ways to shut these industries down. He's not going to do it through this legislation I described, but he's going to use this thing called the safeguard mechanism. Isn't that an Orwellian term? Be very, very scared about something the government calls a safeguard mechanism. But he's going to use this safeguard mechanism to shut down these industries. He's been telling the Greens sweet nothings about this. We don't know what they're saying behind closed doors. 
Uh, and that gives exactly the wrong impression to the, the thousands of Australians that work in our mining industry and, as I say, how that industry can contribute uh, to keeping and maintaining global peace and stability. The government just does not seem focused on that. They should be, they should be because while we have had a generation of success in our mining industry, it's a different story for our manufacturing sector that has been in decline. We need to be honest with that uh, and assess that and change that. It's been going through, going, happening through various different governments. I'm not blaming or being partisan here to any side of politics, but for decades now our manufacturing sector has been in decline. Uh, in the year 2000, we were self-sufficient in raw petroleum. We could, we, could, we could produce enough petroleum for our domestic needs. We exported a lot of it, but we, we still could be, push come to shove, uh, self-sufficient. We had 96 per cent of our raw petroleum needs uh, produced here in Australia. Today, today that figure is below 50 per cent. We've lost two-thirds of our oil refining capacity over that period. A gone. And so what happens if the sea lanes close around us uh, and we can no longer import oil. We cannot. Yes, that's, I'll take that as a suggestion from Senator Antich. The response seems to be, well, well, we've got lots of solar panels also made in China, by the way. But we've got lots of solar panels. We've got lots of wind turbines. Uh, we're going to have these batteries, and we'll be all right. We are not going to be able to defend this nation unless we can be sufficient in oil. That is going to be a key factor in any coming conflict in the region. And there is too little focus in this country right now about our deficiencies in oil, despite the fact there would be a lot more oil in this country if we had the guts to look for it and develop it, and despite the fact there seems to be uh, attempts to shut down the one shining hope in this country to produce more oil and become self-sufficient again in the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. There are people here who want to shut that down. and They're not, they're not talking about making Australians drive less or use less oil. We'll just import more of it from overseas instead of become more dependent instead of becoming independent as a nation and being able to use our, our God-given and abundant natural resources for the benefits of this country in the defence of our great nation. We have also, we've also, I'm going to run out of time here, but I'll be able to pick it up next, but I, I also passionately want to defend our steel industry and where that's going through as well. We're now a net importer of steel, and despite being the biggest coal and iron ore exporter. That should change, and I think I'll be able to pick that up next time we're back and the same bat channel in the same bat place. Thank you very much, Senator Canavan. We'll now move to two-minute statements, and I invite Senator Scar to begin. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I believe in freedom of association. I believe in the right of Queensland nurses and Queensland teachers to choose who represents them in the workplace. Therefore, I am absolutely appalled at the Palaszczuk Labor government's attack on the right of 10,000 nurses, 10,000 Queensland nurses, who through the exercise of their own freedom of choice have chosen to be represented by the MPAQ, and 3,000 teachers who have chosen through the exercise of their freedom of choice, their freedom of choice, to be represented by the TPAQ. Why is the Palaszczuk Labor government attacking the right of the MPAQ and the TPAQ to exist. Why? Follow the money. Follow the money. The National Professional so Nursing Professional Association of Queensland and the Teachers Professional Association of Queensland are totally independent of any political party. They do not make any political donation. Therefore, they can provide quality industrial relations services to the 10,000 nurses and 3,000 teachers who have chosen, who have chosen to be represented by them, at a cost of $250 to $300 a year less. $250 to $300 a year less. Why does any government of any political persuasion have a right to attack the right of our teachers and nurses to choose the industrial relations organisation that they choose to represent them? I stand shoulder to shoulder with Queensland nurses and Queensland teachers to defend their rights of freedom of choice and to defend their right to choose the industrial relations organisation that is unaffiliated with the Australian Labor Party. Senator Green. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I um, it's, it's nice to follow Comrade Scar after his passionate um, embrace of unionism. Um, I uh, joined the Senate today to, um, as the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef on an incredibly important day uh, for the reef. 
Today we have had the release of a report from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. and This report has some good news stories for our reef and the people that rely on the reef for their jobs. Uh, this report released today says that there is coral recovery in parts of the uh, north of our reef and the central part of our reef. Um, this is the highest level of coral recovery in the last 36 years, and that's since the long-term monitoring um, uh, program began. Uh, there are still some challenges on the southern part of our reef. Um, there are some outbreaks of crown of thorn starfish um, that are needing to be managed and are seeing uh, increases since the southern parts of the reef have had warmer waters. Um, but I want to be really clear about this. This report has some good news, but it also makes clear that the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef is climate change on a long-term basis, and that is why our government has today decided to legislate climate action in making sure that we could legislate our 43 per cent emissions target. We said we would do it at the election. We have delivered on that today. And it is shameful, shameful that members of the Liberal National Party voted against this legislation. The member for Leichhardt, the former special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef, voted against this legislation today. If they're really serious about protecting regional jobs and the jobs that rely on the Great Barrier Reef, they will move on from the old dinosaur years and their, their policies that meant that we had a decade of delay and denials and damage to one of our greatest natural assets. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Allman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The world is in the process of transitioning away from fossil fuels towards a decarbonised economy fuelled by renewable energy. Coal is on the way out already, and we must make sure that the workers in the coal industry and their families are taken care of. Regional workers in Australia working in the coal industry deserve a just, fully funded transition to support them, their families and their communities. Workers across regional Australia know that a transition to low, low emissions industries will happen, and they don't appreciate the scare campaigns being run by members of the Liberal National Party. Scare campaigns help no one, and they do nothing to change the facts. The Greens want well-paid, stable employment for people in communities currently engaged in the fossil fuel industry, and we're working to secure that future so that workers will have opportunities for gainful employment in other industries. The Greens are the only party facing the reality of the energy transition, and we're the only party who took a comprehensive and costed transition plan to the election. No coal worker should experience the financial insecurity and anxiety for the future that comes with losing their job suddenly. With a carefully planned transition, we can assure workers that they will have rewarding jobs until their retirement and that their families, especially their children, will have strong services and employment options in the towns and communities that they know and love. Our regional communities will have a bright future, long after the last bit of coal is shoveled out of the ground, but only if we plan the transition well and we start planning it now. Thank you very much. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the repeal of the cashless debit card, which is used by over 4,000 fellow West Australians in both the Goldfields and the East Kimberley. Anyone, anyone who has taken the time to visit these regions will see the benefits to the women, children and elders who are now being far more protected. The card should be extended and not repealed. The reduction of taxpayer-funded access to drugs, alcohol and gambling products has significantly reduced alcohol and drug abuse. It's reduced assault, child abuse, rape and death. The less vulnerable uh, are le uh, sorry, but it also makes people less vulnerable to humbugging. Let me make it really clear. The Albanese government has not properly consulted with the very people who will be so badly impacted by this measure. It is a complete and utter disgrace. It is also a disgrace today, today 
that senators have voted to restrict community hearings around the nation. And can I say shame on the, all of you who voted to restrict the hearings. And I see Senator David Pocock is in the chamber. And can I say through you, uh, Mr Deputy President, I hope you attend every single one of those restricted hearings that you have voted for. You go and look the women, children and elders in the eye and explain to them why you have taken this decision. You go out on one of the night patrols or several night patrols in several different uh, towns to see exactly the consequences on the police and on the other community services, the hospitals, of the actions that you are about to take. It is inconceivable to me and those on this side of the chamber that any government or any senator would knowingly inflict pain on suffering on vulnerable women, children and the elderly. So make no mistake, all who vote for this bill will be culpable for the inevitable consequences you, Senator that you will Reynolds. inflict Senator on local Chacone. Thank you very much, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. This week is Lane Care Week, and I've been very pleased to be here to make a contribution about a cause and organisation that's very close to my heart. Excuse me, Senators. Senator Chacone has the call. Excuse me, Senator Chacone has the call. Thank you, Senator Chacone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I might start again, if that's OK. Uh, this week is Landcare Week, and I was very pleased to be here to make a contribution about a cause and organisation that's very close to my heart. I've had the pleasure of being the co-convener of the Parliamentary Friends of Landcare in the last parliament, and I hope to do so in this parliament, the 47th parliament, and I uh, hope that all my Senate colleagues uh, have received my, co my communication recently with Senator, Dave, uh, Senator Perrin Davey. Uh, and joining the group in that we can celebrate the great work that many land care organisations uh, do right across our country. Since I first became a senator, I've enjoyed engaging with many land care volunteers right across my home state in Victoria. It is a wonderful organisation full of extraordinary people who dedicate themselves to restoring, enhancing and protecting the natural environment in which our communities enjoy. Landcare has been bringing volunteers together to undertake activities and share information for over 30 years. First started in my home state in Victoria with the Victorian Farmers Federation and many landcare groups where it was great to see where it's got to today in 2022. Over 6,000 landcare groups are active right across Australia with over 100,000 volunteers. And unfortunately there is more work than ever for these volunteers to do. With increasing frequency of natural disasters like floods and bushfires, land care has never been more important. The work these volunteers do is invaluable, and they come from all walks of life. So it is th fitting that the theme for Land Care Week is celebrating land care diversity. It doesn't matter if you live in the regions or at the city, whether you work on a farm or in the office, I encourage all Australians Thank to you, seek out Senator their local land care group and Senator get involved. Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Uh, this is not my first speech. Um, the cost of everything is going up. Lettuce, fuel, your mortgage repayments. There's stuff out there to make ends meet. You know what isn't going up, though? Community care funding, at least not by enough for organisations to survive on. Community care helps with all the things that get a little bit harder when you get older. Things like mowing the lawn or fixing a fence, transport to doctor's appointments and clean, cleaning your house. It's an important service that people rely on. This year, funding is increasing by just 1.7 per cent. Community care providers have to put that to increased wages, super contributions, insurance and loan or rent repayments. And those numbers just don't add up. Providers don't deserve it. Their staff are the people we trust to look after our mums and dads, our grandparents, and they need our support. I know because my partner, Tim, he works in the aged care industry. I see the long hours he does. The times he went hours without a drink or a potty break because he was kitted up in PPE. The sadness when he comes home and tells me one of his patients has passed away. The smile on his face when he tells me about their adventures. Glynis felt well enough to dance today, or Tim sang along to John's favourite song. It's a hard job, and when bigger organisations can offer way better money for easier jobs, it's not hard to see how small organisations are losing staff. NDIS funding is going up by 9 per cent this year, almost four times as much as community care. It allows for the increase in minimum wages and superannuation. 
If community care is facing the same increases, then why aren't they getting the same funding? They do similar work. Community care workers deserve more funding, just like the NDIS. It's not asking for the world. It's what they need to cover the bare minimum. Thank you. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. If the new Treasurer and Finance Minister genuinely want to protect the budget, they will ensure that the Brisbane Olympic Games sporting infrastru infrastructure body that was part of the 50-50 funding deal between the Commonwealth and the Queensland State Government is put in place. We know, Acting Deputy President, Queensland desperately does not want the discipline and oversight of this agency. But as we've seen in recent weeks, there is a genuine need uh, <coughs> for proper control of spending and decisions relating to the delivery of the game's sporting infrastructure to the tune of billions of dollars. Just this week, reports came of proposed changes to venues that could cost hundreds of millions of dollars extra, with the Commonwealth on the hook for 50 per cent of that. Queensland Minister Grace Grace describing the Gabba project, saying, we do not know the footprint, we do not know the design, we have a schematic sketch. We are still stabbing in the dark. Frightening warnings indeed. If Australian taxpayers are in any way to be protected from the excesses of the scandal-ridden Queensland government, the decision-making and timely delivery of these major investments the full deal must be insisted on. Let's not forget that the only reason the, the, the 2032 Olympic Games are going ahead is because the Commonwealth Government agreed to fund 50 per cent of the sporting infrastructure costs. The Queensland Government said they would not bid unless we did. These Olympics will be a powerhouse for the country. Thousands of jobs, significant investment, but let's not lose sight of sound planning and prudent investment in the lead-up. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It was just over 10 weeks ago that the people of Australia voted for change, voted to put the hard and hard work back into government. Just 10 weeks ago, new Prime Minister Anthony Albanese promised that Labor would work hard every day to bring Australians together, to build a better, brighter future for all. And true to this promise, we have hit the ground running. Here's my top 10 reforms of our first 10 weeks. First, we successfully supported a wage increase for Australia's lowest paid workers. Second, we wrote to Fair Work for a pay rise for our essential aged care workers. Third, we passed legislation to help fix aged care quality and safety. Four, we established the Jobs and Skills Summit to deliver good, secure jobs. Five, we introduced legislation to tackle the skills crisis. Six, we restored our reputation on the world stage. Seven, we committed to reducing emissions and to today we delivered in the House. Eight, we introduced legislation for paid family and domestic violence leave. Nine, we moved to scrap the cashless debit card. 10. We've taken the first steps towards enshrining a First Nations voice to Parliament, and I could not be more proud. I could not be more proud. Order. We've Order. taken action on jobs and wages. We've rebuilt our global reputation, and we have put respect at the heart of government. And this is just the beginning. So get used to it on the opposition benches. There is much more to do. In just 10 weeks, we've done what the previous government failed to do in almost 10 years. This is what good government can do. This is what Labor governments always do. We work hard every day for the people of Australia, and we get the job done. Senator Shrewbridge. Uh, this week, the government announced a review into the Australian Defence Force, but we don't need a review to tell us what we already know. Former Chief of the ADF, Chris Barry, has made it clear the climate change is one of the largest security threats to Australia and our very vulnerable region, yet it receives little more than lip service in Australia's defence policy. We also know that over the last decade, defence has overseen repeated multi-billion dollar budget blowouts across the portfolio, with chronic project delays despite a budget that grows year on year. It's troubling 
that this review is being undertaken by two of the key architects of the current defence posture, and it's difficult to see how they can turn a genuinely independent mind to the task. For all these reasons, the Greens will be closely monitoring this review and the part major parties' continued uncritical support of excessive military expenditure. Tomorrow, the 5th of August, is the third anniversary of the revocation of Article 370, which stripped away Jammu and Kashmir's constitutional protections and autonomy. This is a day of mourning for the people of Jammu and Kashmir and the diaspora here in Australia, indeed across the globe. The Australian Greens acknowledge the rights of the peoples of Jammu and Kashmir to freedom and self-determination. We also acknowledge and support the work of the diaspora to bring global awareness to this human rights crisis. The Australian government has an obligation to raise the attacks on Jammu and Kashmir in its diplomatic engagement with India. This is about Australia speaking the truth to our friends and acknowledging the universal rights of the people of Jammu and Kashmir to basic human freedoms. Senator Pocock. The Acting Deputy President. This has been a history-making week. Today, the House of Representatives passed the government's climate change bill legislating for the first time a 2030 and 2050 target. Yesterday, the House of Representatives passed the Territory Rights Bill. The next time we sit in this place, we'll have to vote on both of these critical pieces of legislation. Today, I'd like to talk about the latter. To my new colleagues, I look forward to having discussions about the Territory Rights Bill, your support for giving the people in, in my electorate the same rights as the people who live in yours. The people of the ACT and Northern Territory deserve the same democratic rights as those who live in the states. Someone who lives in Tuggeranong or Gungahlin should have the same right as people who live just across the border in Queanbeyan. The bill simply seeks to restore rights that were removed from the territories in 1997. I ask you to join with me in putting an end to this quarter century old injustice. The bill enables the people of the NT and ACT through our elected territory parliaments to have the conversation on whether they want to legislate a voluntary assisted dying scheme. Every state has now had this debate, starting with Victoria and ending with New South Wales. There is no reason the ACT and NT shouldn't be able to engage in those same discussions. I acknowledge the deeply held convictions on this matter, but I also remind everyone that no one is being asked to actually legislate on voluntary assisted dying in this place. This is about territory rights and whether or not we think that people who live in territories should have the same rights as those who live in states when it comes to debating and legislating voluntary assisted dying. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to pass on my extraordinary congratulations to the Australian Labor Party and the Greens. And no, Mr Acting Deputy President, I haven't lost my mind, arguably. Uh, but yesterday, uh, both of those parties took out the gold medal in the hypocrisy Olympics. Uh, in fact, yesterday, the Australian Labor Party, uh, the self-appointed champions of transparency, proved themselves to be really nothing more than the champions of hypocrisy with their partners in pretense, the Australian Greens, by voting against my motion seeking transparency of parliamentary uh, interactions with NGOs like the World Economic Forum. And we weren't talking simply about a referral to change the register of interest. We were talking about a referral simply to a parliamentary committee. The reason I raise the issue about hypocrisy is less than 24 hours earlier in question time in this chamber, uh, we had an, an interaction and a question posed by Senator Lambie, who asked a question about transparency in super funds. And Senator Gallagher responded with, and I quote, no, we are a big supporter of transparency and we will be a lot more transparent in a whole range of areas than those opposite have ever been. And 24 hours later, they vote against a simple uh, referral to committee to, uh, to try to get this investigated on the, on the register of interests. So these self-styled champions of democracy and openness simply wouldn't have it. And they wouldn't have an addition to the register of interests, which in, in essence all it sought to do was to have members of this place to record any association or involvement with lobbying groups or NGOs, charitable foundations or in international societies, like, for example, the World Economic Forum, which is led by Klaus Schwab. Uh, I, I had 55,000 signatures on a social media campaign on this. The people in this, in this area, those opposite, clearly walk the walk 
when it comes to uh, talk, talk the talk when it comes to transparency, but simply cannot walk the walk. My question is, what are they trying to hide? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The Australian Institute of Marine Science annual report has found the Great Barrier Reef central section and northern section now have record coral cover. A natural event, a crown of thorns starfish outbreak, prevented the southern section reaching at record coral cover too. For millennia, the reef has witnessed natural events causing coral bleaching. Bleaching results when periods of high solar activity coincide with low tides when the water cover is insufficient to protect the coral polyps and they die, meaning the reef bleaches, and then recovers just as quickly every time. Tropical cyclones bleach the reef. Floods deliver freshwater plumes onto the reef, killing saltwater coral polyps. Once the plume dissipates, marine life consumes the nutrients in the floodwaters and the sediment turns into sand. The reef and coastal environment is renewed. Recently, in June 2008, Record cold temperatures in Queensland caused coral bleaching. For millennia, natural solar, lunar and rain cycles have caused bleaching. What is new is the late 20th century environmental movement hijacking a perfectly normal climate cycle for their own political benefit. If your party's real objective is to control every aspect of life on the reef and along the coast, then be honest and have that debate. The only argument that climate fraudsters can advance in favour of onerous reductions in farm output is save the reef. Well, the reef does not need saving and never has. The public has been deceived. The left are seeking to shut down agriculture and transfer food production to near-urban intensive food production facilities manufacturing food-like substances. Who will own these facilities? Predatory billionaires. The same predatory billionaires who own and drive the environmental movement for their own benefit. Not nature. Predatory billionaires who own and drive the environmental movement. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we will continue to stand up for our farmers' right to feed and clothe the world. Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Like so many women across Australia, including women here in this chamber, I've experienced sexual harassment in more than one workplace. I know firsthand when such a thing happens, there's nothing more important than having this, sharing your experience and having the support from fellow workers, family, friends, trade unions and specialist support organisations. I personally found such support essential. All women, no matter what their background or where they live or work, should be able to readily access the support they need if they experience assault, sexual harassment or discrimination. In light of this today, I'd like to highlight the important work of independent working women's centres as illustrated by the work of the South Australian Working Women's Centre. And I'd like to recognise that both our party and the Labor Party committed in the election to the implementation of Recommendation 49 of the Respect at Work report, which was to establish and fund working women's centres in every state and territory. The Working Women's Centre in South Australia is a place that I'm incredibly proud of and a model that provides confidential, independent advice to a wide range of vulnerable women who experience all kinds of workplace challenges. In the 2021-22 financial review, some of their achievements included um, raising, uh, recovering over a million dollars in compensation and lost wages and helping nearly 2,500 workers. The centre supports diverse and vulnerable women. Almost half their clients are engaged in precarious work and nearly half live with a disability. These stats just demonstrate the vital and highly effective service provided by the South Australian Centre, and I want to acknowledge their work, their current director, Abby Kendall, and the many directors, board members, staff who have preceded her. They do an amazing job, and every state and territory in Australia needs a centre this good. I look forward to the government acting on their commitment to establish such a centre in every state and territory in the near future. Senator Navajima Price. Thank you, Mr Acting President. In 2007, prior to what was declared an emergency in the Northern Territory, alcohol and sexual abuse was put on a national platform, shocking the rest of the nation. The, Territory Martin, the, ter the Territory's Martin Labor government could not hide its inept leadership of such important social issues. 
The Northern Territory Board of Inquiry into the Protection of Aboriginal Children from Sexual Abuse 2007 co-chair Pat Anderson stated, alcohol is absolutely totally destroying our communities and our families. There is no doubt about that. Something serious needs to be done to curb this river of grog. It's killing people spiritually, physically, psychologically. There's a total breakdown in families when people are sort of drunk most of the time and everyone around them and children are not safe. Senator McCarthy's family community of Borroloola was showcased on national media showing the devastation for the whole community as a result of the high consumption of alcohol. Fast forward 15 years and we are back to the rivers of grog flowing, thanks to an again inept Territory Labor government claiming that the Strong Futures legislation introduced in 2012 was racist. I ask, racist to who? The drunks, the victims of financial and physical abuse, or racist to the children who are born with FASD and have to live with the disorder for the rest of their lives? What was an emergency is now a crisis. I will hold to account this Labor federal government for the failings of the Territory failures because they are one party and they have power over vulnerable constituents. Meanwhile, communities like Borroloola are expressing grave concerns about the return of alcohol to their communities back to the old ways. I call on this federal Labor government to hold to account their territory Labor counterparts, as the member for Ling Lingiari has so bravely done, for their future to reduce alcohol-related harm and violence despite the coalition's billions of dollars of investment in the name of human rights for all Territorians. These are the practical measure th measures that I'm focused on for all Territorians, holding to account those that have been funded to deliver services and save lives, but who have failed. Thank you, Senator yes. Nambajinka Price. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. More than 1,000 people have died in truck crashes since the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was abolished by the Liberal National Government in 2016. Now, there's a whole lot of blood on the hands of those, every person in this chamber who voted to abolish the RSRT and replace it with nothing. And you were warned. Because my friend, the late Senator Alex Gallagher, said during the abolition debate in 2016, lots Senator of Cash. these owner drivers will work themselves to death. Senator Cash. And that's exactly what has happened. And things are only getting worse, with Amazon and now FedEx driving down standards right across the industry. We need safe rates. We need a system where owner drivers earn enough to make a living and where companies at the top of the supply chain are held to account. Because when you don't earn enough to make a living, you push yourself, you rush, you can't afford to maintain your vehicle properly, and you put everyone on the road in danger. It is just the Transport Workers Union saying this. Owner drivers and employer associations are crying out for reform. Frank Black, who was the owner driver representative of the Australian Trucking Association, says, if we've got uh, safe... Thank you, um, Senator Sheldon, and I believe um, Senator Farrell is seeking the call. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. I wish to advise the Chamber of changes to ministerial arrangements for today. Senator Wong is absent from question time on account of ministerial business overseas. In her absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for International Development and, and the Pacific, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel and the Minister for Defence Industry. Um, <laughs> no, that'll happen. That'll happen. Uh, Senator Gallagher will represent the Minister for Climate Change and Energy and the Minister for Environment and Water. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, I'm calling Oh, I thought I was calling Senator Reynolds, but I'm not. I'm calling Senator Rustin. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator Farrell. Um, I refer the minister to the announced cessation of Operation COVID Shield from the 1st of August. I asked the minister, could he detail the advice the government received that led you to remove this effective operation at a time when vaccinations remain at the primary defence? to the pandemic. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, uh, President, and thank the uh, <coughs> Senator for her, uh, her question. Um, look, I think we start any debate about the issue of uh, COVID and uh, uh, what's uh, happened in the past uh, with an understanding of <coughs> what your government failed to do when you were in... Uh, in uh, um, oh, yes, Senator Farrell, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. 
Uh, on a code of order on relevance, um, uh, President, um, I would just ask you to draw the uh, minister's attention to the fact that I was actually asking very specifically about advice received mm -hmm. about the uh, cessation of Operation COVID Shield and nothing else. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. Um, the minister has just started his uh, answer. I'll um, pay particular attention uh, that he remains relevant to the question. Thank you. Continue, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Um, as I uh, had started to uh, answer the, uh, the question, uh, um, President, um, any debate about what's happened uh, with, uh, with COVID-19 in this country has to start right back where this government Sorry, the, the opposition, which is, was the government at the time, uh, failed um, the people of Australia. Um, we saw it first of all with the issue of closure, closure of the, uh, the borders. The government was too slow uh, to close the borders uh, when Minister, the issue. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, President. Um, look, with the greatest amount of respect, I would draw uh, on, on a point of order on relevance. I would draw to your attention. Um, that the minister is not being even remotely relevant to my question, uh, and uh, I would ask you if you could draw him uh, to the substance and only the substance of my question. Thank you, uh, Senator Reynolds. Um, I do believe the minister is being relevant. He is talking about the COVID pandemic, which um, he's entitled to do as part of his response to your question. Um, as you know, I can't. Um, direct him to answer the question, but I can be cognisant of relevance, which I am. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President. And, uh, oh, I think it's Senator Rustin who, who asked the question. Um, the COVID shield will cease on the 1st of August um, 2022, and from this time the, the functions of the National COVID Vaccine Task Force uh, will return to the arrangements within the Department of Health and uh, Aged Care. The uh, Coordinator General of the COVID Shield, General Fruin, who I had the uh, good fortune to uh, meet uh, last night um, and uh, congratulate on the role that he has uh, performed um, in, this, uh, in this area, uh, will return to his role as the Chief of Joint Capabilities in the Department of Defence. Now, the Australian Government has ensured that the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program is providing support for people in Australia uh, and uh, who need to um, remain, uh, maintain their protection. Uh, thank uh, you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, what are the current third and fourth dose rates in residential aged care and what is the lowest dose rate? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, and thank uh, the minister for uh, for her question. Um, I don't. Uh, obviously, this is not my <coughs> normal area of uh, responsibility. Um, I know that um, the uh, the country has continued to um, increase and improve the uh, level of um, um, vaccination um, in this area, and I'll be very happy to get those figures uh, for the uh, minister. In fact, I. Right now, have the answer um, to those uh, questions. I thank uh, Senator Gallagher, um, who does represent the uh, Minister for uh, for Health. Uh, that very hard-working uh, Mr. Butler. Over three quarters of residents estimated to be eligible for a fourth dose have received a four, fourth dose, dose, up from around 50% in June 2022, uh, following efforts uh, by the uh, uh, the government. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired, and I think uh, you undertook to take that on notice um, for the rest of the question. So I'd appreciate you taking yes, the rest I on did, notice. Yes, I did, and I will come back as quickly Thank as you. I can. Second to supplementary, the, um... Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, President, and uh, I'll look forward to clarification of the accuracy of the answer that was just given. Um, with fourth, fourth the dose rates reported to be as low as one in five residents in aged care, how is the government going to ensure the safety of older Australians without the support of Operation COVID Shield? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank the uh, Senator for, uh, for her question. Um, look, I mean, it's incredible that a government that yeah. so failed Australians on the issue of vaccination 
is now is now raising issues, raising issues about how we how uh, we are rolling out the uh, the vaccination program. Was it um, you failed to close the borders when you should have. That's right. You failed to order enough vaccinations. Right. I know you. <coughs> um, Shaking your uh, head, Minister, Senator Birmingham, but that's Minister, the absolute please truth. Your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, on a point of order on, on a matter of relevance, um, I was specific. Uh, um, order. was specifically asking in relation to uh, the current wave of COVID and aged care facilities and how the government intends to ensure that residents are vaccinated. Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. I will remind the Minister of the question and call the Minister again. Thank you, President. Um, Look, this opposition still doesn't understand why you lost the last election. You lost the last election because um, you failed Minister, the people of Australia. Minister, on please resume your seat. Sorry. Senator Rustin. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, President. I would draw um, to your attention that I believe that the minister is being wholly, completely and utterly irrelevant to the question, not just being not relevant, thank you. and I would ask you to draw thank his you, attention Senator to Rustin. the question. Um, the minister's got 15 seconds uh, to go. Minister. Thank you, President. Um, at every stage of this vaccination process, the, uh, the opposition, which was then the government, was simply too slow. Uh, minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, on the question of direct relevance, mm -hmm. You do have within your power the ability to draw the minister to the question. The question was precisely about what this government's plans are. The minister has spent the entirety um, of the answer you, talking Senator about Birmingham. the previous you government. Will, please resume your seat. You will note that I did draw the minister to the question. Um, uh, I'm not asking you to debate. I did draw the minister back to the question. not. The last time Senator Rustin stood up, but the time before that, I directly drew the minister back to the question. Minister, please continue. Question uh, directly. Yeah. <clears throat> but look, you have to understand. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. <laughs> Senator Walsh. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Gallagher. How is the Albanese government helping to put the climate wars behind us after a decade of climate denial and inaction? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, thank you, President, and I um, thank Senator Walsh uh, for the excellent question. Uh, the Albanese government's climate change bill is a move to end the climate wars, to say goodbye and good riddance to the nine years of delay, dysfunction, denial denigration from the previous government. The fact is that Australia just didn't stand still under the former government. We went backwards. Our reputation on the international stage uh, and investment and confidence was stifled. The, the legislation that's passed the House is good for jobs, for power bills, for the economy and for our future. The climate change bill um, that we have introduced and passed and will come to the Senate legislates both a 2050 net zero target and the 2030 43 per cent emissions reductions target, tasks the Climate Change Authority to assess progress against these targets and advise the government on future targets, requires the Minister for Climate Change to report annually to Parliament on progress in meeting our targets and makes the targets relevant to key agencies like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and Export Finance Australia. The Albanese government's climate change bill is an opportunity, an opportunity to vote on the side of progress, to vote for our children's future, to vote for a stronger economy. The government knows this, the business community knows this, and Australians know this. The only people who continue to fail well, I'm not Senator sure what Thorpe. Senator Thorpe is screaming at me for. Senator Thorpe, I mean, order. the last I heard, you were agreeing with this um, bill. Um, I know Minister, responding to interjections, um, but if you have someone yelling at you from down there, it is very Minister, hard to I'm ignore it. Calling a point of order. Please resume order. your seat. Senator Thorpe, you are being disorderly, and I would ask you to show the respect deserved to the minister as she answers the question. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, the business community knows it um, and the Australian people know it. The only people who continue to fail to understand it are those opposite. Passage of the legislation will mean this parliament collectively draws a line in the sand, saying enough is enough, and our legislation is Thank sensible you, and Your achievable. Time has expired. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. 
What will policy certainty mean for Australian businesses? Minister. Thank you, President. And this is an important question uh, about why we are seeking to legislate the target and why it is so important. While our government is acting Order. and working with the parliament in a constructive and open fashion, those on the other side have learnt nothing. Or well, maybe some of them have. We think some of them may have learnt something. They're ignoring the message the Australian people sent them in May, but they're also ignoring the broad coalition of support for the bill from right across the business community. The Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group, the Minerals Council of Australia, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, the Investor Group on Climate Change, the Australian Energy Council, the Governance Institute of Australia, Responsible Investment Association of Australia, the Australian Council on Superannuation Investors, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Rio Tinto, and the NBA NAB chair. There are plenty of others that also support these, these bills, and it's time for the opposition to support it too. Thank you, Minister. Minister uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. How will Australian households benefit from increased action on climate change, driven by the Albanese government's climate change agenda? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. We haven't wasted a day on getting on with the job of cleaning up the chaos and division and dysfunction left by the previous government, with Australian households who have been paying the price. The fact is that climate change policy is energy policy and it's good economic policy. We can drive down emissions and drive down power bills at the same time. Our detailed Powering Australia plan will create 604,000 jobs, with five out of six of them to be created in the, in the regions. It will spur $76 billion worth of investment and it will deliver 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030, consistent with AEMO's step change scenario, which projects 83 per cent renewable energy. The Powering Australia plan includes modernising our ageing electricity grid, investing in renewable metals, renewable energy, 85 solar banks, 400 community batteries and 10,000 new energy apprenticeships and a new energy skills program, just showing how we can seize the opportunity that comes from this change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. I refer the Minister to the very sensible question asked by Senator Lambie on Tuesday this week. Are there any circumstances in which it would be in the best financial interests of a superannuation account holder for their superannuation fund to make payments to a political party or to a trade union? If so, in what circumstances? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bragg, for, uh, for that question. Um, I had the great privilege um, in a previous life of being a director of uh, one of the best um, superannuation funds in the, uh, the country, the REST, um, the REST superannuation uh, fund. Well, I'm just about to answer this. Senator Rustin. Um, Senator I Farrell. Uh, don't take the bank. All right. All right. But no. Yeah, yeah that would be handy. Um, uh, look, I will preface, despite uh, what uh, Senator Rustin said, I will preface uh, my, my my comments because I had 15 years' experience um, on uh, one of the best and the biggest superannuation funds in, in this country, and on not one occasion, and not one occasion was a political donation made um, to either the Liberal Party, the, the uh, Labor Senator Party or, or any other party. So um, this idea that um, industry, particularly industry um, um, super funds, are out there handing out monies to political parties, particularly the Labor Party, um, is simply untrue. It's a, it's, you know, <coughs> We used, to talk about, we used to talk about fake news. You don't hear it that much more the, the, so often since um, President Trump has gone. But it, Ms., um, Senator Bragg, this is fake news. This is fake news. Um, the, job, the job of industry superannuation funds is to get the best return for their members. And in my experience, in my experience, Every one of those funds has been doing exactly what they were asked to do by their members, and that is get the best Thank result you, possible. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Thank you very much. 
Can the minister guarantee that Australian super funds will not be making any payments to political parties or to trade unions or any other politically affiliated organisation without publicly disclosing the details of such payments to their members? Minister. Uh, conversations across the yeah. chamber are disorderly. Thank you. Senator Chisholm and the minister was on his feet to answer the question. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, look, I can only go back to the first answer I gave you, uh, Senator, Senator Bragg. And I know you've got, you've, you know, the whole history of um, the opposition has been one of opposition to industry superannuation. So any chance, any, any chance that you get to bring down or uh, uh, to denigrate. Yeah, that's, that's the word I need. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Senator Billick. Uh, any chance the opposition gets to denigrate um, industry superannuation funds, they will use. Now, the reality is, I, I mean, I can only give you my own experience um, of this. I haven't seen any evidence of, of what you're implying goes on in these uh, industry superannuation funds, but I know from my own personal experience in this area that this is not what union funds do, this is not what industry funds do. Their whole priority, their whole preference— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. I thought they were super funds, not union funds. Why is the government ignoring the views of Super Consumers Australia and the Grattan Institute and many others to unwind the provisions requiring the detailed disclosure of payments to political parties, unions and other organisations? Isn't it just because the Labor Party wants to see these funds flow back into the Labor Party. Minister. Let's talk about where the Liberal Party does. Senator Billick. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. No, Senator Bragg, what the Labor Party wants to see is the best retirement possible for Australian workers from their industry superannuation fund that that fund can deliver for them. That's, that's what the Labor Party wants, um, and I think that's, what, that's actually what the members of industry superannuation funds want. They, want. they want the people who represent them on the boards of those organisations uh, to do their level best to get the absolute best returns. That's what the, the board members of those funds um, should, be, uh, should be working on. <coughs> Just remember— um, I can, just, just, just remember uh, that the job there's there's an obligation on every single member of a superannuation board uh, to deliver the best results for their members, and that's that's what I believe you, every Minister, single industry fund expired. is doing in this country. Senator Shoebridge. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The Prime Minister has said that the government has been working behind the scenes and engaging in quiet diplomacy regarding the extradition of Julian Assange. But quiet diplomacy can't be no diplomacy. What exactly is the government doing to secure the release of this Australian citizen, journalist and whistleblower? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank uh, uh, Senator Shoebridge for his question and congratulate him on his uh, election. I think this might be your first question? Well, good luck. And it's on, it's on a very um, important topic, and that um, relates to uh, Mr Julian Assange. Um, the Australian government has been clear, in our view, that um, Mr Assange's case has dragged on for too long and that it should now be brought to a close. This is the view that we continue to convey to the governments of both the United Kingdom and the United States along with our expectations that Mr Assange is entitled to, uh, to due process, humane and fair treatment, access to proper medical uh, care and access to his legal team. But as the Prime Minister um, has pointed out, not all foreign affairs is best conducted with a loud hailer or a megaphone, as we saw from the previous uh, government. It's also worth noting that the uh, extradition case is, is between uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, a legal system that we, uh, we respect. Australia, of course, um, is not a party 
to uh, Mr Assange's uh, case. Um, and uh, as the uh, legal operations uh, uh, still stand, uh, our government, uh, I'm advised, uh, cannot uh, intervene uh, in the legal matters of uh, another country, um, just, just like we wouldn't want um, those countries to intervene in our, uh, our legal uh, process. Um, Order. We will continue to monitor uh, the case uh, closely, and uh, we continue to seek uh, assurances from the United Kingdom uh, government about Mr Assange's uh, welfare and his treatment. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shubri, uh, first supplementary. Mr Assange's family has been seeking a meeting with Prime Minister Albanese. In fact, they're here in the building today, and I acknowledge his father, John Shipton, and brother, Gabrielle, who are in the gallery yeah. chamber just behind yeah. us. Order. Senator, Order. why won't the Prime Minister meet with the family and hear yeah. directly their concerns, which challenge what you say, concerns about Mr Assange's health, his safety and his future. Why won't you meet? Minister. I have met. Uh, uh, well, Senator Shoebridge, you are disorderly. If you have a point of order, stand and make it. You don't just stand up and shout out. Minister. Minister, I'm calling you. Uh, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Uh, thank you. Look, um, the Prime Minister can speak for himself uh, on this uh, issue, but, but I, I, have, I have met Mr Shipton. I met him a couple of years ago. Um, Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, S Senator Shrewbridge, please resume your seat. You don't half stand and then start shouting out a point of order. In this chamber, you stand and you wait for the call. So if you'd like to stand, and I will call your name, and then if you have a point of order, please make it. Senator Shoebridge. Point of order, President. The minister is here in his capacity representing the Prime Minister, and that's the, that was what was put to the minister, and he was not being relevant in his answer. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I believe the minister is being relevant, and I will continue to listen carefully. And if he's not relevant, I'll point that out to him. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Um, I have met. Mr Shipton. Um, it was a very uh, moving meeting and I personally can't think what it would be like um, to have one of my children uh, incarcerated like um, Mr Assange um, has been incarcerated. Um, but look, as I said before, we don't control the legal systems of other countries. We're offering all the support that um, we can under the consular arrangements uh, for uh, Mr Shipton's uh, son. And um, the Prime Minister has said he wants an end to these uh, proceedings. I mean, I don't think he can be clearer. Thank you, Minister. Uh, than, Your time uh, than... has expired. Senator Shubig, second supplementary. President, um, through you, President, the Prime Minister has previously said enough is enough, and you've repeated it here today, Senator. And the government has called for the USA to bring this matter to a close previously. By bringing matters to a close, do you mean allowing Mr Assange to be extradited to the USA, charged and convicted and sentenced for over a century in jail, and then perhaps seeking a prison transfer? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Um, thank you, um, uh, thank you uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Shoebridge for his, um, his question. Um, look, the, the Prime Minister has been extremely clear about what the policy and the position of the Australian government uh, is. We want, we want to bring this uh, matter to, uh, to a close. I think it's worth making a couple of, uh, couple of points. Um, that Mr Assange actually withdrew in June uh, 2019 his consent for us to inquire about his health and his personal circumstances. And we've sought to receive assurances. Well, despite no, I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming him, Senator uh, Shoebridge. I'm not blaming him. I'm simply pointing out that he withdrew. He withdrew um, consular assistance that the Australian government was providing. Order. Um, well, I've told you what I've done. I've, um, I've Minister, met with Mr. Minister, uh, Shipton. Minister Farrell, please direct your answers to the chair. Please continue. 
I believe the time has expired. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Exotic animal diseases such as foot mouth disease and lumpy skin disease have the potential to pose a very serious threat to our livestock industry. Can the minister please update the Senate on the steps that this government is taking to ensure that our nation is prepared should an outbreak occur? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone, for your ongoing interest in this important matter. As I have consistently said, the first point to make in anything regarding this matter is that Australia remains foot and mouth disease free. And the Albanese government is working hard in partnership with the states, territories and industries to keep it that way. While the risk of foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease entering Australia is low, it is not zero. And as I've said before, experts have assessed the risk of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in Australia over the next five years at 11.6 per cent and a lumpy skin disease outbreak at 28 per cent. We cannot assume it will state that way and that's why we, keep ne we need to keep doing more. I've previously spoken of our two-pronged approach, taking action at home and abroad, and I'm pleased to announce today a new third prong, taking action now to ensure we are fully prepared if an outbreak were to occur here. That's why earlier today I announced the creation of a new exotic animal disease task force to ensure Australia is fully prepared to respond swiftly to growing biosecurity threats. The task force will thoroughly assess our current level of national preparedness and advise of any improvements needed. While the federal, state and territory governments all have well-developed biosecurity response plans in place, we will leave no stone unturned to ensure that we are ready should an outbreak occur. Importantly, this task force will be a vehicle for collaboration across the Commonwealth and will be co-chaired by senior officials from the Department of Agriculture and Emergency Management Australia. It will also include officials from the Defence Force, Border Force and Animal Health Australia. By bringing together the best expertise from across government, we can ensure there are no, there are no gaps in our response. I note the National Farmers Federation has welcomed this announcement, saying that, quote, it's, a, it's the right idea. And this continues the close partnership between the Albanese government and industry in managing biosecurity. Good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst. That's exactly what we're Thank doing. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And I'm sure the industry is very much appreciative of the decisive action that you're taking on this matter. Could you please explain to uh, the Senate the role that the state and territory governments will play in preparing for a potential biosecurity outbreak in Australia? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, as I've said before, biosecurity is everyone's responsibility, from the federal government through to state and territory governments, as well as farmers, importers, exporters and international travellers. Last night, I spoke with each state and territory agriculture minister to inform them of the establishment of the Federal Exotic Animal Disease Preparedness Task Force and to discuss their own efforts to prepare for a foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease outbreak should one occur. While the task force will be comprised of federal officials, it will work closely with states and territories. We have also spoken with industry to ensure that their views are being heard and they will be engaged to assist the task force as required. It is this spirit of collaboration and desire to work together to ensure that state and federal government response plans are robust that is a hallmark of the Albanese government and is something that is deeply appreciated by all levels of government as well as industry. Uh, on this side of the chamber, we're focused on getting the job done because this Thank issue you, and Senator the people it affects are more important than politics. Senator second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, no doubt uh, preparedness is the key to when it comes to dealing with these outbreaks, as we've heard from the minister's uh, answer to my uh, first and second question. Can the minister please advise the Senate what lessons have been taken from the management of previous, previous disease outbreaks in this country? Minister. Thank you again, Senator Giacconi. Uh, as we all remember, the response to COVID-19 was the most important global human health response in recent memory. If we have learned one thing from this experience, it is that the Australian government needs to be prepared ahead of time for an event as potentially catastrophic as an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. And that means working with all levels of government in a constructive and respectful way. We are determined to not make the same mistakes the previous government did. When COVID hit, the former coalition government wasn't prepared. 
They were slow to close borders, leaving management to the states, slow on rats and too slow on vaccines. And of course, Australians paid the price. When floods and fires hit, the former coalition government wasn't prepared. When the ex-fire chiefs tried to warn them about what was coming, the former government wouldn't even meet them. We won't make the same mistake. If there, if there were to be a major biosecurity outbreak in Australia, there is simply no time for delay, and that's why we've implemented the strongest biosecurity response ever and why we will Thank keep you, working White, on preparedness. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Gallagher. Minister, there are a lot of elderly people in my neck of the woods who rely on community carers to get transport to and from doctors' appointments, mow their lawns and clean their house. Like all of us, the people running community care are paying more on fuel, wages, insurance and rent. But the funding for home care packages and the Commonwealth Home Support Program is only going up 1.7 per cent this year. How does your government expect community care providers to survive on so little? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President, and I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question. I think it's your first question, Senator Tyrrell, so congratulations on that. And, um, appreciate um, a bit of the heads up that you gave on this as well. Um, you raised the issue of uh, support for home care and community care uh, services and the indexation rate. This is an issue that has been raised with me in my role as the Minister for Finance, uh, not just um, from an aged care point of view, but um, from, uh, from the majority of those working in the non-government non sector at the moment. Um, so this is something that I am looking at closely. There are a range of different ways that um, indexation applies across payments um, and programs and even differences between um, particular programs get uh, indexed differently. So I am having a pretty close look at that. My understanding is that the Department of Health and Aged Care is aware of the issue. They're working with the sector um, and looking at a range of approaches to manage some of these um, impacts on, on the service provision. Um, I would say that there has been significant investment into the service system over the last couple of years, but the government accepts that um, with inflation running as, as high as it is, that, that is having costs on services and um, you know, it's a matter I'm looking at as Minister for Finance. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Uh, we have organisations in Tasmania who say they'll have to close up shop within the next couple of months. They can't afford to survive. Will the government consider emergency funding to keep the lights on for community care? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would say if there are organisations that are, um, are in that position, then I hope that they would be actively engaging with the Department of Health and aged care in particular, uh, or the relevant department for which they receive their funding. As I said, there are a range of different ways, uh, different indexation arrangements across government. Um, the government would not want to see um, essential community services cease um, providing services. Um, they are essential, and particularly um, in in areas where you know there might not be choice of service as well, where um, restrictions are. In, are there just because of the nature of the service system? So I would say, in the first instance, well, I would say the government doesn't want to see any of those services close uh, based on escalating costs, and we would ask that the um, organisations either engage with the department or with the minister's office. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, residential aged care is getting a 10 per cent increase in funding in October, but the new Australian National Aged Care Classification won't apply to organisations who help older Australians in their family home. Why shouldn't aged care, community care sorry, get the same support as residential care? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would say, uh, yes, residential aged care gets a lot of, I think, the public attention, uh, but the government accepts that home care and community care is an essential part of our um, service system for supporting older Australians. Um, it, it, it has received increases in funding. I would note that in, uh, since we've come to government, we have delayed um, the implementation for the new in-home aged care program by 12 months. 
um, because we had been getting feedback from people about it being too rigid to support older Australians and the conditions and circumstances and the, the nature of how support is provided. So that is something that we're doing and, and we will consult widely and, and talk to all of those organisations about the best way forward. But our position is that we need that extra 12 months. That's in line with the Royal Commission. Uh, and whilst there are significant resources, I think in the order of uh, over six billion dollars a year going into you, um, Minister. Your home time care has at the expired. moment. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Uh, in 2012, when announcing an additional 450 gigalitres of water recovery over and above sustainable diversion limits detailed in the Basin Plan, then Prime Minister Julia Gillard said the water will be recovered via Water, and I quote, water recovery projects that minimise the impact on communities to ensure there is no social and economic downside for communities, end quote. This intent was then written into the 2012 Basin Plan. Does the new Labor government stand by the 2012 commitment to communities for no negative social and economic impacts? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minute, Davey, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Davey for her uh, for, for her question. Um, what the um, federal uh, Albanese uh, government uh, stands by, uh, Senator, and what uh, Minister Plebisic stands by, is the commitment that uh, we made when we were last in government. Uh, to restore the health of that mighty river system, the Murray-Darling uh, River system, uh, and in, in doing that, uh, ensure that the 450 gigalitres of water that was promised to that river system uh, is delivered upon. Um, we don't want life to be any harder for um, inland uh, inland communities in this country. Um, there was significant consultation at the time that that uh, plan was, uh, was, uh, was delivered. Uh, I, I, in fact, was the, the deputy uh, um, water minister to Minister Burke, no, to Minister Burke who delivered that system. Um, we made a promise to the people of Australia. We made a promise um, to all of those people who, whose um, Life, livelihood um, survives along that, uh, along that river system. Uh, and the promise that we made was uh, we'll deliver that 450 gigalitres of water. Now, it wasn't just the federal government that entered into that uh, um, understanding, that promise. Uh, it was all of the state governments, uh, including um, those governments that uh, are of a liberal persuasion now, like New South Wales. So the federal government, uh, the state governments, all committed to the delivery of that 450 gigalitres. Thank you, Minister. And Your we time intend to for do it. answering has expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. So I take it as a no about your commitment to communities. But uh, in 2018, you, you mentioned uh, Basin State Ministers, and I appreciate the segue. Senator in 2018, Davey. all Basin State Ministers, including the Labor South Australian Minister and the Labor Victorian Minister agreed to a set of criteria by which they could assess that there would be no negative social or economic impacts from this water recovery. Does the new Labor government respect the oh, consensus Sorry, of the Senator Ministerial Davies Council? Time. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Davey, for, uh, for her follow-up uh, question. Um, let's look at what the nine years of the previous government delivered for these communities and what they delivered uh, Minister, for— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator, uh, Senator Davey, wait for the call. Senator Davey. Uh, point of order relevance. It was a very specific question. I wasn't asking about a history lesson. I was asking about the Basin Ministerial Council. Well, the minister had just uh, started his response, and I will listen carefully. And if he's not relevant, I will draw him to the question. Please continue, Minister. Um, thank you, President. 
I don't see anything inconsistent with what you've just read out as that has been the commitment of the state governments to what the Labor Party committed to when we were in government um, more than nine years ago, and that is the delivery of 450 gigalitres of water. I notice we haven't got one of the South Australians uh, asking this, uh, this question. Um, no, yes, no, no. They're, they're the South Australians haven't asked this question because they know that the most important um, thing for the South Australian community, and I'm speaking now as a South Australian uh, senator, is the delivery of that 450 gigalitres. How much did you deliver in Thank the you, nine Minister, years of your government? Your time has Two gigalitres. Senator Davey. Second supplementary order. Uh, thank you. Both New South Wales and Victoria have said on record that they are opposed to buyback. Yeah, yeah. The states are integral to delivering other aspects of the basin plan, such as constraints management. Uh, in an interview with the Adelaide Advertiser, Ms Plibersek has said that she is open to buybacks. What will the government do if the states walk away from the basin plan? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. Well, I, I would plead with the states not to walk away from the basin plan, because the one, the one, the one bit of hope that the Murray-Darling Basin has is that we deliver on what was agreed more than nine years ago, 450 gigalitres of water. If we don't, if we don't, we risk the ongoing survival. If we don't, we risk Senator the ongoing McKenzie. survival Senator of McKenzie. that. Fan Senator Sorry. McKenzie, the minister's answering. Please listen. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that protection from Senator McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we want a, live, a, a life and a life-giving river system in this country. We know from the, the, uh, uh, the droughts in the early part of this century, just what it did to the communities along those rivers, and we know what it did to people in South Australia. Uh, what um, Minister Plebisek says Minister, is right. Time we will expired. do whatever. Minister, uh, Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Gallagher. Minister, the CSIRO states that energy production is the largest contributor to Australia's carbon dioxide output. The government has made it clear that it intends to ramp through legislation which would see a reduction in carbon dioxide output of 43 per cent. I am concerned that this will cause energy prices to increase. Australian families are already struggling with the cost of living pressures. Can the minister make the senator aware of how the government Will achieve these cuts in emissions, and will this result in increased power prices for the average Australian? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Babette for the uh, question and also for the heads up of, on the question um, today. And also, I don't think I congratulated you last week on the first question. I know it's your second one because I got you first. So congratulations on both of them. Um, in terms of our in in terms of our plan, um, the legislation that has passed uh, the House uh, earlier today and will come to the Senate now implements our election commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43 per cent. We went to the election with uh, very detailed modelling on how we would achieve that. Um, the Powering Australia plan, which is available uh, to all online, um, but the clear uh, impact of that modelling showed that um, if we were to implement it, which is um, you know, to ensure that we are building a new grid uh, to enable 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030, um, that we are providing the investment certainty that is needed to um, allow those investment dollars to flow and to invest in new energy technology, to invest in solar banks, community batteries, uh, to build the workforce, uh, to also uh, reduce taxes on electric vehicles, uh, that it would also uh, put downward pressure on energy prices. Now, I think we all accept that um, you know, the previous government did nothing for nine years and left us in a situation where we have 
escalating electricity prices in particular that they hid from the community before the last election—19.7 per cent increase in electricity prices. Uh, our plan, which is the cheapest form of energy at the moment, is renewable energy. Uh, the cost of coal is expected to be $141, um, gas $133 by 2030. In contrast, the cost of renewables, which we want to invest in, is $63, Thank you, Minister. Your $63 time has per megawatt hour. Uh, Senator Babette, first supplementary. According to the CSIRO, energy production accounts for approximately 33 per cent of Australia's total carbon dioxide output. What other sectors will be taxed or potentially axed in order to achieve your 2030 target? Minister. Uh, thank you. And our plan uh, details how we would achieve the 43 per cent reduction by 2030, which uh, doesn't involve tax or axe. Uh, it's a comprehensive and transparent plan. Uh, it involves modernising Australia's ageing energy electricity grid through the Rewiring the Nation plan, the $3 billion investment in renewable metals, renewable energy, uh, component manufacturing, renewable hydrogen, electrolysers, 85 solar banks, 400 community batteries um, and investments in um, our workforce to make sure that we have the workforce to deliver on those. 604,000 jobs, five out of six of them in the region, $76 billion worth of investment. Uh, this is the opportunity that the Australian people need their government to seize, to drive jobs, to lower power prices, to invest in the new technologies of the future and ensure that we can seize um, the, e the energy improvements that we need uh, to bring down our gas, um, greenhouse Thank gas you, emissions. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Agriculture accounts for approximately 14.6 per cent of carbon dioxide output. Can the minister guarantee our hard-working farmers that the government will not sacrifice their livelihoods in order to achieve any of these targets? Minister. Um, again, thank you, and th uh, thanks, Senator Babbitt, for the question. We've been upfront about our plans. We won't be cutting agricultural production. The National Farmers Federation supports our updated targets. There are huge opportunities, I think, in the agricultural sector. I know that. Uh, Minister Watt is engaging with all of the stakeholders on, on those, and we have broad-ranging support right across industry for this plan because they know after 10 years of this lot, they see what's happening out there, they see the opportunities, the jobs and the improvements for their areas that will come from having a government that can provide industry with the certainty they need to make the investments and make the change that is coming. It's not only important for, any, for our power bills and prices, it's important for jobs and it's important for those essential industries like agriculture who will be part of the change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. As Australia is a proud sporting nation, and I'm sure senators across the chamber are watching closely the performance of the Australian team at the Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Can the minister update the Senate on the performance of the Australian Commonwealth Games team in Birmingham? Minister. No, I've given you the call. Sorry, Minister. Um, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, uh, Senator Green for that uh, question. I know she's an avid sports fan, and uh, will be looking forward to the Olympics um, in her great state of Queensland uh, in uh, um, just under 10 years' time. But yes, I can give you some uh, good news there, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, Australia is leading the medal board at the uh, Birmingham Games. Um, too many medalists uh, to name them all today, but I'll just go through a few highlights. Uh, Emma McKeon is the greatest Commonwealth Games athlete of all times, with 14 total medals uh, and six won at these uh, uh, Games. Ariana Titmus uh, finished her extraordinary Games campaign with gold and, has, uh, and a Games record in the 400-metre uh, uh, freestyle. Sprinter Evan O'Hanlon uh, claimed the uh, Australian athletics team's 200th Commonwealth uh, Games gold Gold, uh, gold medal. Oh, now, Senator Birmingham, how could you say that? That's an reflection. Ah, Birmingham, Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Um, our oldest, 
Our oldest team member and national treasure, 63-year-old lawn bowler Cheryl Linfield, uh, has made a remarkable Commonwealth Games uh, de debut at that uh, age, uh, winning the silver medal with uh, her uh, partner Serena uh, Bonnell. Um, we wish uh, the remaining participants all the best for the, uh, the rest of these games and uh, look forward uh, to greeting them uh, triumphantly when they, uh, when they return to, uh, to Australia, uh, which, which, uh, which hopefully will be very soon to uh, a glorious uh, reception. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green, first supplementary. Oh, thanks, President. Thank you to the Minister for the fantastic news. Many of today's Commonwealth Games athletes owe their success to the pre previous investment by Australian governments in grassroots sports. Can the minister outline the importance of proper investment in grassroots sports for the success of our Commonwealth Games teams? Minister. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, President, and thanks uh, once again for that uh, very incisive uh, question from uh, Senator Green. And yes, I can uh, tell you uh, a little bit about uh, the, uh, the matter that you raised. Um, Grassroots sport uh, investment uh, has been a feature of Australian governments uh, at uh, both the uh, federal and uh, uh, state level, and certainly was so under Minister uh, Colbeck, who is now probably now very proud about our, uh, our achievements uh, in, uh, in Birmingham. Sporting clubs uh, promote and train uh, junior athletes uh, who are the future representatives of, uh, of our country. Those uh, future sports stars rely on uh, change rooms, ovals, lightings that sporting grants programs have provided. In those sporting clubs that have put their faith in government to provide unbiased funding through a fair system across the board. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our new sports minister who took over from, uh, from me. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time Annika has Wells. expired. Uh, Senator Green, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, and after such positive news, I, I, I really do regret to ask this, but has there been anything which has negatively impacted investment in grassroots sporting teams across Australia, which may put at risk the performance of the Australian Commonwealth Games team into the future? Minister. What could that be? Thank you, President. Look, I am, yeah, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Green, for that question. Look, I am disappointed. Uh, to, go back into, uh, to go back into time, but who could forget the sports rorts affair of this former government uh, and uh, the so-called colour-coded spreadsheets, which we still haven't yet got an explanation for. And uh, despite an inquiry that was conducted by uh, uh, minister, uh, minister, yes, uh, Assistant Minister uh, uh, Chisholm. We still haven't got answers to what went on there, and uh, all Minister, of the electorates. Minister, that... please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Senator Watt. Hmm. Yeah, we just thought we'd let you dig your own grave. I'm waiting to call Senator Rustin. Hmm. Senator uh, thank Rustin. you very much, um, President. I was just wondering, on the matter of relevance, whether the minister thought that our Paralympians were relevant of maybe a mention. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not a point of order. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Green. Um, of course, of course, they are Senator uh, Rustin, and uh, they uh, uh, their uh, achievements have been um, absolutely amazing as well. And thank you for drawing that. Well, I, I, just, I don't ask the questions. Uh, Senator Green, ask the questions. Uh, Senator. <laughs> Um, Senator, the electorates, order, the electorates that missed out for order. being on the wrong side of the. Thank you, Minister. I thought... Your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Order, order, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for, wait for it, wait for it, Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. I refer the Minister. Order. I, I, I refer the minister to the importance of technical innovations in land management, agronomics and seed varieties. Will the minister guarantee that trade agreements and negotiations will not contain any provisions that detrimentally impact Australian farmers' ability to access the most modern farming techniques? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Well, I certainly will stand up for Australian farmers uh, and manufacturers 
uh, and wine producers and uh, barley producers, barley produ meat producers, crayfish producers, all the people, all the people that you have failed to look after over the last nine years. What a disgrace. When we, when we lost those markets, when we lost those markets Order. to the sort of farmers that no the sort of farmers that uh, <coughs> Senator Brockman is talking about on the uh, Air Peninsula or the York Peninsula, who make amazing products, uh, we are going to look after them. And I can assure Senator Brockman that in every single um, enter, uh, free trade agreement that we enter into, uh, we will ensure the interests of our farmers are protected in a way that was never done that was never done that was never ever done by the former government in the last 9 years now i can i can tell you a few things Order. about this senator brockman look look this government this 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 opposition when they were in government negotiated a free trade agreement with the united kingdom that would have would have very significantly benefited both the farmers in your state senator, uh, senator brockman and uh, f farmers in my state. What happened? That was negotiated, what happened? That, that was negotiated last December. Exactly. There are requirements under our legislation to implement those free trade agreements. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Um, my question did not refer to what occurred under the previous government. We are asking. Um, What's what, your point you're going to laugh about the importance of trade agreements to Australian agriculture, you, Senator, Senator Brockman. What? Senator you're Brockman. going to laugh about that. Senator Brockman, resume your seat. Order. There is uh, no uh, point of order because uh, Senator Farrell is being relevant. Please continue. Thank you, President. I, I thought they were I thought they were being so well behaved. Uh, I wasn't sure why it was, but. Look, um, but I can tell you, I can tell you that 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 free trade agreement was negotiated last year, and by all accounts, it was a very good agreement. I'm not criticising the agreement, but not a single uh, step. Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Uh, point of order, President. Uh, both in terms of relevance to the question asked by Senator Brockman, but also in terms of honesty, seeing as members of the uh, Joint Standing Senator Committee Birmingham. on Treaties from the Labor Party Senator who Birmingham. wanted more hearings and delayed Birmingham. conclusion resume of consideration of it. Senator Birmingham. I am order. Senator O'Neill. I am going to remind senators that a point of order is not an opportunity to debate points. You make your point of order, I make a ruling which you may or may not agree with, and then we continue on. I believe that. Uh, the minister is being relevant. He's got five seconds remaining. Please continue, Minister. Um, Senator Brockman, I'll guarantee and I'll ensure that we look after all Thank of the— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Will the minister guarantee to protect the right of Australian farmers, farmers to use important agricultural chemicals such as glyphosate and atrazine that have been approved by the Australian regulator and used by Australian dry land farmers to prevent erosion and preserve soil moisture. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Brockman, for your for, for your question. Um, we'll continue to do um, exactly what uh, we've said to do in said we would do in opposition, uh, and that uh, we are now in government, and that is ensure that we negotiate the best possible uh, enterprise uh, uh, what am i saying uh, free trade agreements um, free, tr <laughs> free trade free trade flashback Order. flashback well let Order. me I'll minister. Take, I'll take minister I'll take I'll take minister Order. I'll, I'll take that intervention minister. because because let me Minister tell you. Farrell. Let me tell you, Senator Birmingham. Minister, let me. Minister, I have asked you to resume your seat, and I would ask senators, particularly on this side, Senator Cash, to Senator Brockman. I will come to you. I will ask you to listen.
quietly and not be so disorderly that it took me about four times shouting to sit the minister down. Now, Senator Brockman. On a point of order, Madam President. On a point of order. Yes. Uh, the question was very narrow on direct relevance. The question was very narrow. Glyphosate and atrazine dry land farmers. The minister has gone nowhere near it. I believe that a minister is being relevant, but quite frankly, with the with the disorderly shouting and carrying on, particularly from the left, it was impossible for me to hear the minister. Uh, minister, you have 21 seconds remaining, and I believe you have been relevant, and I would expect you to remain relevant to the question. Please continue. Yeah, thank you, uh, President, for that exhortation, and I certainly will continue to remain uh, relevant. Um, <laughs> Senator Cash, Senator Cash, calm down, calm down, Senator Cash. We, we, will, we, we will do everything we can in terms of our international negotiations. This morning I met with all of the ambassadors— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Will the minister guarantee to protect the right of Australian farmers to use GM technology, such as, such as genetically modified canola, which is approved by the Australian regulator for use by Australian grain farmers? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Brockman for the, uh, the question. Uh, I won't disappoint Senator, uh, Senator Cash. Um, I met with all of the um, European uh, ambassadors this morning uh, to discuss the very subject matter that you're talking about in terms of uh, a European uh, free trade agreement. Um, these discussions allow both parties to um, raise issues. Um, from our point of view, we'll be seeking to re represent the best interests uh, of all um, our uh, agricultural producers, as well as manufacturers and everybody else, uh, our miners, <coughs> all of those groups who've got an interest in this, uh, in this free trade agreement. Um, we intend to get the best possible results for this country. That includes um, everybody who works uh, in the farming, uh, farming sector. Senator McGrath. Yes. It, well, you can take Senator it. You can, McGrath. You can take it as a guarantee, uh, Senator McGrath, because um, Thank you, Minister. all of, Your my, time has all of the schools. Minister. Um, it time's up. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Order. Order. I, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Senators, before we move to taking note, I um, have a statement on a matter of privilege. By letter dated 25 May 2022, the Chair of the Environment and Communications References Committee, Senator Hanson Young, has raised a matter of privilege relating to the failure of representatives of a resource company, Tambaran Resources Limited, to attend and give evidence to the committee when ordered to do so. I table the letter. The matter was the subject of an interim report of the committee's inquiry into oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin. Senator Hanson Young seeks to have the conduct of the company's representatives referred to the Privileges Committee for inquiry as a possible contempt. Where a matter of privilege is raised, my role is to determine whether it should have precedence in debate. In doing so, I am guided by the Senate's privilege resolutions, which seek to reserve the Senate's contempt powers for matters involving substantial obstruction to the Senate and its committees or to senators performing their duties. The Senate has declared in Privilege Resolution 6 that disobedience of lawful Senate orders and refusal to attend before a committee when ordered to do so may be dealt with as contempts. On the question of obstruction, the Chair's letter notes that the committee has been prevented from examining key evidence as a result, completing its inquiry and reporting to the Senate. Only the Senate can remedy such conduct, so in my view the relevant criteria are met. I have therefore determined that it would be appropriate to grant the matter precedence as a matter of privilege. However, given that the matter was raised by a committee of the previous parliament, I intend to ask the newly established References Committee 
whether it wishes to proceed in the Senate at this time or whether it wishes to consider other actions first. This might include reiterating the requirement for the witnesses to attend with the knowledge that preliminary steps have been taken to have the matter dealt with as a contempt. If the committee wishes to proceed with the matter in the Senate, it will be dealt with as a matter of privilege. It will then be for the Senate to determine whether the matter warrants investigation as a possible contempt. Minister. In question time today, in response to a question from uh, Senator Rustin about the rates of third and fourth doses in residential aged care, I undertook to come back to uh, the Senator with the, uh, the figures. I can confirm the third dose rate is 94 per cent of the eligible population in residential care, and the fourth dose rate is 79.4 uh, per cent of eligible population in residential care. And I uh, hope this uh, assists the uh, senator and the promptness of the reply. Yep. Uh, senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Yesterday in question time, Senator Hanson asked Senator Wong whether the government would legislate for aged pensioners to be able to take on more work without penalty to their benefits and give independent retirees, who are no burden on the taxpayer, the same opportunities to fill our critical work shortages. In response, Senator Wong indicated that she would answer what she could and ensure that if there was more information that can be provided to you, that that is provided to Senator Hanson. In Senator Wong's absence and as Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, I table a response I have provided to the Senator uh, to Senator Hanson. I table that now. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, as much as it pains me, but um, because the, the minister has been so kind today, uh, I move that the Senate takes note of the answer given by Senator Farrell to the question from Senator Brockman. Uh, Deputy President, the, the current negotiations in relation to the EU uh, free trade agreement are extremely important, and the questions raised by Senator Brockman likewise are extremely important. Australian farmers uh, are some of the least subsidised in the world, unlike a lot of their counterparts in other jurisdictions. Uh, and, and so, consequently, uh, they are the most innovative uh, and some of the most competitive in the world. Mr. President, sorry, uh, Deputy President, um, they need to retain access to all of the innovations that they have um, developed and built over time through significant investment, I might say, by themselves and by the Australian government through the Australian uh, government's research and development corporations. It's important to note, Deputy President, that uh, over the, last, the term of the last government, the last nine years, the most successful government in history in relation to the uh, negotiation of free trade agreements, commencing uh, with the free trade agreement with uh, Korea very early uh, in our time back in government, but increasing the share of trade covered by free trade agreements from 27 per cent to over 70 per cent. And if the government were to uh, ratify the free trade agreements that sit there with India and the UK, that number will go to over 80 per cent of Australia's trade. Very important figures. So I would urge the government to ensure that uh, the work of the um, uh, committee that's considering the free trade agreements is progressed, but to ensure in the negotiations that, as Senator Farrell said in his answer, our farmers are protected in, the re in respect of the use of those critical uh, farming methods and tools uh, that go to our capacity to maintain our land quality, which is extremely important. And Australian farmers have done a brilliant job in developing those technologies and those systems, 
uh, all over Australia, I might add, uh, and also those critical um, uh, chemicals and supports that allow them to do that. Uh, as, as we indicated during the question previously, not only does it prevent erosion, does it uh, help to support soil quality, but it also helps them to sequester carbon. So important elements and maintaining access to those things and not disadvantaging Australian farmers in trade is going to be extremely important. The record of the previous government in respect of free trade agreements with agreements signed with Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Peru, Indonesia and, of course, across the Indo-Pacific um, have opened up enormous opportunities for farmers in this country. Uh, we need to maintain those opportunities. We continue, need to continue to grow them. That's why we commenced and completed the negotiations with the UK. It's disappointing that in the previous parliament uh, the proceedings inside the uh, treaties committee uh, was delayed by seeking additional hearings. Uh, I certainly hope that that can be progressed quickly now that we're into this new parliament so that the farmers do get those opportunities that come from the UK, UK free trade agreement and also the free trade agreement with India. Because those opportunities, that expansion of, of, of markets, as we've seen through the disruption over the last couple of years, is extremely important to Australian agriculture. Uh, the, the, the option to be able to look at different markets when a, a disruption occurs in one significant market is now very well understood by us all. But let's not forget that the previous government, through all of its work, opened up so many opportunities more than any other government in history, and bearing in mind that the government before us did not complete a single free trade agreement, the challenge sits there right now for this government to not only ratify the two free trade agreements that have been completed just before the election—the challenge sits there for them to do that—but particularly in the negotiations with the free trade agreement for Europe, and I know Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell would understand that only too well from his involvement in the wine industry, there are some particular protections that are very, very sensitive to Australian agriculture, and he needs to protect those. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And uh, I rise uh, in response to the contribution we've just heard from Senator Colbeck. And to enhance the comments that have been put on the record today by our fine new Minister for Trade, uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, minister Farrell happens to be a good friend of mine, and I particularly uh, felt encouraged by his deep knowledge of the wine industry uh, from his own life experience, uh, because I'm sure that he'll be out there fighting not only for the wine industry but for all elements of the agricultural industry, which is such a vital part not only of Australia's economic sense of uh, engagement with the world, but also in our sense of our, ourselves as a nation. We know that we are critical to the way in which the planet can eat food moving around the world we know has been profoundly interrupted by what's going on in the Ukraine. And I know that there are calls on Australia right now to step up and interact in, uh, in trade in markets that have been profoundly disrupted, not only uh, by that war but also the supply chain problems that we see as a consequence of the COVID-19 reality. Now, trade opportunities for Australians are vitally important to the Australian people. And not only will Senator Farrell be leading the charge on that, uh, I and other members will be new members on that treaties committee. And I find it very disappointing, given how important it is to our economy, that we've had questions that seek to really create by a, 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 partisan, a partisan view of what uh, should be happening in the area of trade. On parliamentary delegations, I'm pleased to let people know that as we move around, the world, we go out as Team Australia to fight for our country. And it should be the same case with trade negotiations and the establishment of uh, trade deals that benefit the country. It doesn't help our cause that the, government, the previous government, now in opposition, are going to moan and bleat about uh, what's going on right now when they actually failed on their own, uh, on their own evidence here before the, the parliament today, 
that there are the India and the UK free trade deals are just sitting there waiting to be implemented. And that's classically what we saw with this government. So many failures to show up and actually do the day job of government that's required to get on with the hard yards of actually bringing those agreements to fruition, undertaking the necessary work through treaties and through good conversation behind the scenes to bring forward a good outcome for Australia. As uh, Senator Colbeck said, the India and UK, UK trade deals are just sitting there. That former government allowed them to sit there and failed to manage the processes of the government properly to deliver an advantage to this country. And because of that, that, for that very common phenomenon that we saw with this previous government of sitting on their hands, waiting for things to get done that they were responsible for, that they failed to enact, we are in a situation where we could be at least six months down the track in advancing the India and UK deals. Senator Farrell spoke also about his work this morning in meeting with the trade ministers of the, uh, with, with a delegation from the EU. A bigger market we could not hope to actually deliver a trade deal with. And I'm very pleased that the negotiations are no longer being done by those opposite, but uh, Minister Farrell, who will act in the national interest, and I know that he'll do everything he can to uh, diminish the partisan nature of the sort of question that we had today. A bipartisanship in these matters is absolutely critical for the success of this country. Um, in terms of Australia and our free trade, we do need to have a continuing growth of arrangements put into force. At the moment, we've got 16 free trade agreements in force, and I think that we can do much better than that as a Labor government who's willing to talk to the key participants and who is willing to actually show up in this place, do the work here in the parliament and the work in the sessions in between where we reach out and we work with business, we work with integrity with our partners across the world to make sure that we get the very best possible outcomes, and not just for agriculture but for the, entire, for the entire sectors right across the Australian economy. We know that it's critical that trade deals with Asia are further enhanced, and I have confidence once again in Senator Farrell to make sure that the necessary relationships to make those deals work, to make them stick and to enhance them to the benefit of this nation will be undertaken. 65.2 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was with Asian countries. And uh, the fact that China was a major partner of trade worth of $251.1 billion. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I'd like to support the contribution and the motion moved by, by my friend, Senator Colbeck. And there is a fascinating fact I want people to know about. And that is, when it comes to free trade, it's a fun fact that, you know, for the kids up there to take home and tell their mum and dad, did you know this? Um, how many free trade agreements were signed by the Labor Party when they were last in government? How many were signed? Like, show us your fingers. How, how, many, how, how many do you think were signed as uh, uh, skilled students? I'll tell you how many were signed. It wasn't five, it wasn't four, it wasn't ten, it wasn't seven. It was zero. A big, fat zero. It was a big, fat, ugly zero. That's how many free trade agreements were signed by the Labor Party when they were last in power. Now, uh, just a terrible record when it comes to free trade. Because the issue with the Labor Party is, when it comes to free trade, there's a word in free trade that they don't like, and that is free. Because the Labor Party don't like freedom. They don't like the fact that businesses can get out there and make a buck. They don't like the fact that businesses can get out there, make some money, employ some people and grow the economy. Because as, as, as my good friend, we all like Senator Farrell, when he was talking about free trade agreements, he made a, a Freudian slip, and it was a classic Freudian slip, because he wasn't talking about um, a, a negotiating a free trade agreement, it was about negotiating an enterprise agreement. So what we see here is the mindset of the modern Labor Party, which is a Labor Party that is driven by the union movement. And the union movement were the biggest handbrake on, on the development and the signing and, and the ratification of any of the free trade agreements that the previous coalition government signed. And we signed free trade agreements with countries all over the world. Because guess what? 
Australia is an island. We're a trading nation. In Australia, we make enough food, we produce enough food, we manufacture enough food uh, to, to feed our population plus another 50 million people. We make enough food, we grow enough food in this country for 75 million people. So we need to make sure that food for those 50 million people doesn't sit in the warehouses, in the paddocks, that it gets off this country, whether it's through a, by a plane or a boat or a slingshot. I don't get how it gets out of Australia, but it gets overseas and it feeds the people overseas. Because we should also remember, when it comes to, to trade, and I, I, I don't want to raise it, but the Labor Party is the party who, when they were last in power, not only did they not sign a single trade agreement, free trade agreement, that they cut off a country's main supply of protein. That when, when, a, when a previous senator in this place, well, the agriculture minister, the Labor senator, Joe Ludwig, uh, you know, watched a program and had a bit of a bit of a something happen upstairs in, in his brain, and he cut off the protein supply to Indonesia, one of our most important neighbours, one of our most important trading neighbours, one of our most important neighbours for geopolitical reasons. And because of a, a TV program, the Labor Party cut off, cut off the protein supply to that country. And not only did they do that, they devastated the cattle industry in Queensland and the Northern Territory. So we won't take lessons from the Labor Party and, and, the, and their allies there in the Green Party who think food comes from you know, the fridge uh, and thinks it's made by a magical mystery Senator machine. Billick, point of order. Uh, the Senator just seems to have completely lost the Plot. He's just talking complete rubbish at the minute. Right, We've then, never said food just comes out well, of the fridge. A, unfortunately, that's, uh, the, the member may be or may not be talking rubbish, but he is, uh, I've allowed a bit of latitude on all speakers at all sides, and he is vaguely irrelevant. What is interesting, Mr. Acting Member President, is a member of the Labor Party has come to the defence of the Greens. So we've got the coalition here, this access of economic dunces. We've got the Greens who think the money, who runs this economy, comes from a sort of a magical mystery money tree at the bottom of the garden. And then we've got the Labor Party who thinks money just comes from, I don't know, brown paper bags, if you listen to the New South, or New South Wales Labor Party. And that's how you govern the country. Well, welcome to the new paradigm that is Australia. It is the Labor Party running a protection racket for this mob, because this mob over there, Mr. Acting Deputy President, or Mr. President, Deputy President, sorry, don't know where food comes from. They think it comes from the fridge. Well, guess what? It comes from the farmers and graziers of Australia. And what we saw in Question Time today was a failure of this government to stand up for the farmers and graziers of Australia, those who feed us, those who will feed the Asia Pacific, and those who will feed the world. And that's what we've got to do as Australia: is stand up for those who look after us. Because without farmers, without Without grazies, without all those people who are in the towns and villages, people like where I come from on the Darling Downs, without those people on the Darling Downs, Australia starves. We need a government who stands up for them instead of a government who just gives them, you know, goes Thank on. You, Senator, you know, McGrath. Just... Senator McGrath. That was probably unparliamentary. Senator Billick, please bring some decorum. Uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to take in that. Well, whatever, yeah, rant, thank you. That rant from the other side, based on some ideological view that, you know, they know everything and we know nothing. And, you know, I mean, so much rubbish I just heard, complete waste of five minutes of my life. And let me tell you, every minute of my life is very important to me. Um, complete waste of five minutes of my life. As my colleague, Senator O'Neill, was saying, We've got a brilliant new minister in Senator Farrell, and we are, well, I am talking him up because I know that Senator Farrell understands agriculture. I know that he understands agriculture. I know that he knows what we're doing. I know that he knows his portfolio area. So he's, he's, I'm happy to build you up as much as I can, Senator Farrell. But the point is, the point is, as Senator Farrell said earlier, we'll continue to do exactly what we said we'll do in opposition. We will look after everybody in that supply chain of agriculture. We will do that. There's been 16 free, tra there's 16 free trade agreements in force. 
and the Australian government, that's us, that's us, you guys, it's us now, not you, recognises the importance of opening new trade opportunities for our agricultural industries, and we're working really hard with trading partners to do this. Senator Farrell said in his answer he'd met with um, the European ambassadors today. Great. That's so good. It's amazing that, you know, after two months, we're off and running. We're in nine years, nearly ten years you guys were in government. You did bugger all. Bugger all. You did nothing. He had a meeting. It's called consultation. It's called negotiation. It's not just a meeting, Senator Scar. It's, it's what countries it's what leaders of countries and, and ministers of countries do to come to agreement. You might not understand that. We know your government had a different way of working. Your government was all about the photo ops, not about the delivery. It was all about announcements, not about any delivery. Your government, and to hear Senator McGrath carry on about something that happened when we were previously in government 10 years ago, when you guys jump up every question time and take points of order on the fact that we haven't done something in two months when you had that nine years, is just laughable. The people out there listening will be just falling off their chairs listening to Senator McGrath's rant, knowing how ideological it was, understanding that we on this side are working for the betterment of all Australia. Some of the accusations that Senator McGrath made, quite frankly, I think were, were disorderly. I understand that the Deputy President did think he was, and I quite vaguely relevant, and I'll take that point. Yeah, yeah. the line of reflecting on our deputy president when she was uh, casting aspersions with respect to whether uh, or not I things Senator were disorderly. I think Senator Billy was trying to cast aspersions on uh, Senator McGrath. <laughs> but uh, I just ask you to restrain your, your language and raise the decorum of the chamber. <laughs> lift us up. <laughs> okay, up. Let me lift you up. I'll lift you up. We know how to do the job. We will continue to do the job. Senator Farrell will reprimand represent us fantastically doing the job. I hope you're all feeling a bit more uplifted. I did note you were all very quiet in question time until it came to that question, actually. I wondered if you were sort of a bit fatigued, you know. And I'm not surprised you were mesmerised. What a great job Senator Farrell did today, stepping into the breach. This just shows you how good he'll be, he is and will be, continue to be as the minister. So, In 2021, 65.2 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was to Asian countries. In 2021, Australia's top three agricultural experts were wheat, beef, veal, beef and veal and, sh and sheep meat. Senator Farrell was quite competent, more than competent, at being able to understand how free trade agreements work, to be able to negotiate them to be able to come to agreements with other countries, not to scare countries off, not to stop other countries wanting to deal with us in whatever way, shape or form that we were dealing with them, not to have us embarrassed on the international stage. I don't think Senator Farrell will do any of that, but let me say your government certainly didn't mind doing that. Your government were happy to, in to embarrass Australia on the international Thank stage. You, Senator uh, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, the coalition government has an excellent track record on developing trade relationships and promoting Australia's interests. One in five Australian jobs is trade related, which is why getting our trading relationships right is so important for the Australian economy. An economy, mind you, which is hurting now more than ever and the Labor Party do not seem to have the slightest idea of what to do about it. However, let's get back to trade, as that's what Take Note is about today. When the Coalition was in government, we implemented nine free trade agreements since 2013. I can list them to, for you, like uh, Senator Birmingham can, if I have time at the end. 
lifting the share of trade covered by FTAs from 27 per cent under the previous Labor government to over 70 per cent now. That is what you call a commitment to promoting Australia's interests and supporting Australian jobs. What I question is Labor's commitment and ability to protect and promote our interests overseas. Now, let's just look at it. Prime Minister Albanese recently visited in Indonesia and said he wanted to strengthen ties between our two nations. However, I don't know what he said in those meetings because it was only a couple of weeks later that President Widodo flew to China to meet with President Xi in Beijing. Clearly what the Prime Minister was offering was not good enough. Compare this to when the coalition, um, when the coalition was in government. In February 2020, we had the same President of Indonesia visit Australia and did address the joint sitting of parliament where he described Australia as Indonesia's, and I quote, Indonesia's closest friend. We are simply not seeing that sort of commitment or effective engagement despite Senator Farrell's little powwow this morning by the Labor Party to support and develop our international trade. Now, Mr Deputy President, we know Labor like to criticise the government over our handling of the French submarine contract as a rebuttal to that point of how we handle international relations. However, let's not forget that Labor are on the record in Hansard stating that the French program was not keeping Australians safe. We heard over and over, and over in estimates, in foreign affairs, defence and trade estimates, Labor senators criticised that program over and over. It was incessant. And I, I won't name all the senators that, from that side that were doing it, but it was incessant. And it was when, when we did do something about it, when we acted in the national interest, they still criticised us for that. Unfortunately for you lot over there, you can't have it each way. Now, Senator Wong, and it's a shame she's not here, and Senator Estimates criticised the French submarine deal quite heavily herself. And I quote, she said, that's not keeping Australians safe. So we see Labor's criticism over the submarine deal was just a form of cheap political point scoring which truly came at a cost to our national interests. And that's what has impacted the EU free trade agreement. Nothing what we did on the, when we were in government. The coalition government acted and took the necessary steps to keep Australia safe. And out of that, the AUKUS agreement was born. Those in government now like to pretend that they would have handled it better. However, there is no truth to that, and it's on the record from Senate estimates. The reality of the situation is that we recognise the French were not delivering on the submarines, and when Senator Reynolds was Minister of Defence, she initiated monthly phone calls to try and get the program back on track. When the French could still not deliver, we did what was best for Australia and our national security and made arrangements to acquire capability that would protect Australians. Now, those opposite we've not been able to accomplish such a feat. And we still worry that they're going to screw up the AUKUS agreement. They're making horrible noises about defence and how they're going to change it. You know, a review from uh, you know, the previous defence minister has all the hallmarks of just shifting a, a, a few things around on, on the notice board. Let's see what they can actually do. But so far, it's clear to everyone that their record has been far from stellar so far. Thank you. I'll put the, I'll put the question. No, I just. No, we're not. We're, we are no. We are long. We've got a bit more of a journey. To, we've got a bit more of a journey to go. I'm going to put the question. Then, then Senator Shoebridge, I'll give you the call. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Colbeck. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I rise to take note of the response given by Senator Farrell to the question I asked regarding Julian Assange. You have the call. The Australian Greens will continue to call on Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to just pick up the phone, to pick up the phone, call the UK and US governments and work to obtain Julian Assange's freedom. 
The answers given today by Senator Farrell on behalf of the Prime Minister uh, lead to some very disturbing conclusions. The most disturbing conclusion is that it appears quiet diplomacy, at least so far as Senator Farrell has been briefed, quiet diplomacy amounts to very little, if any, diplomacy. And our, the very troubling conclusion we have from the government's answers in the Senate today is that their intention is actually to so-called bring this matter to a close, but bring, it to a matter, bring the matter to a close by doing nothing to prevent the extradition of an Australian citizen, Julian Assange, do nothing to prevent his charging, his prosecution and his conviction in a US court, and do nothing to prevent him being sentenced for up to 175 years in jail for the crime of telling the truth. Now, for the Australian government to do nothing when that's the fate of an Australian citizen today, and whether you like Julian Assange or not, let's be clear to every Australian citizen that today the Australian government abandons Julian Assange, but tomorrow it might be your son or your brother or your father or your daughter or your cousin or your friend. Once the Australian government sets the standard so low that they are willing to do nothing, nothing, when two of our closest allies between them are extraditing, persecuting, charging and potentially jailing for life an Australian citizen who did nothing other than expose the war crimes of the United States government, what will they do next? Who will they betray next? Now, what is equally troubling is we've had a change of government here in Australia. We've gone from, notionally, from heavily conservative to notionally Labor. And in the United States, it's gone from Trumpian to the Biden administration. And the 18 charges that Julian Assange is facing were all laid under the former Trump presidency by the US Department of Justice. 18 charges brought by Donald Trump against an Austra by Donald Trump's administration against an Australian citizen, trying to put him in jail for 175 years for an alleged crime that never happened on US soil. The US government has admitted never harmed a US citizen. And all it did, all it did, but it was a powerful thing, was tell the truth about US war crimes. And, and, and expose the evidence and the disclosures from former US intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning that detailed appalling war crimes and human rights abuses committed by the US government. Julian's crime, if you can call it that, is telling the rest of the world the ugly truth about the war. Now, the US seeks Julian's extradition from the UK, and in that process itself, Julian's rights have been abused. He's been held now for three years in maximum security in Belmarsh Prison and, if convicted, faces effectively a death sentence. Yet the speaking notes given to Senator Farrell here are that the Australian government is satisfied about Julian Assange's health and is satisfied that his health and welfare is being looked after in this system. How could you be satisfied? Three years, three years in maximum security, potentially another lifetime in maximum security, when all of the evidence shows that Julian has seriously deteriorated in health, evidence that was accepted by the UK courts, clearly accepted by the UK courts. And the evidence is that his rapidly deteriorating health is actually due to the prolonged arbitrary detention. It amounts simply to torture. And indeed, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture not, or the former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, has stated that Julian is a victim of ongoing psychological torture. That's not the Greens. It's not Julian's lawyers. It's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture who said that. And UK magistrates and the High Court have accepted expert testimony. It's not challenged that if extradition were to become imminent, Julian would have an irresistible urge to take his own life. So I say to Julian, if you're listening here, the movement is growing to free you. You have more friends than ever in this parliament to free you. And it's about time that your government and your Prime Minister understood their obligation to Australian citizens. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, hence no. The ayes have it. We now come to 
tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates. And on behalf of the Chair of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, Senator Pratt, I present a report of the committee on its examination of annual reports. Thank you, Wally. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. At the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport and Environment and Communications References Committees on matters referred to the committees during the previous parliament and move that the reports be adopted. And for the information of senators, the report of the Environment and Communications References Committee recommends new terms of reference for the committee's inquiry into Australia's extinction crisis. Yeah. I put the question that the reports be adopted. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. We now come to consideration of documents. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages three to five of the notice paper. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. And I rise to uh, speak on document number 11. The unfortunate response of the Minister for Agriculture to foot and mouth disease. He has been caught flat-footed since the disease uh, became uncontrollable, obviously, in Indonesia and spread to Bali, 22 um, provinces, incredibly quickly. Uh, and July 5, uh, we were notified of that. And on July the 6th, industry was out on the front foot calling for foot baths, calling for action from this government as the catastrophic impact of foot and mouth disease uh, was to be borne upon us. They wanted to see some action on the 6th of July. Well, you know what? Uh, there wasn't much said by the minister. It was quite dismissive, shall we say, of beefing up our border response. And it was on the 12th of July that he made those infamous comments, the comments that absolutely offended our farmers, when he basically said, you know what, we're not going to rush to get the foot baths in, guys. Uh, you know, they've got chemicals in them, like citric acid. Uh, you know, people coming back from Bali, they're usually wearing thongs, um, so we don't want to hurt their feet, uh, so we don't want to have to put them through this. But that's a synopsis. So, when we talk about farmers' response to this government's flat-footed response, no wonder they were concerned when they heard their own agriculture minister saying, you know what, uh, we're all worried about people wearing thongs back from Bali and long queues at airports than we are about ensuring this catastrophic disease does not get into our farmers. And so the opposition rightly called uh, for the government to get the foot mats into our airports, to make sure they're talking to everybody that's come back from Bali to say, have you been on a farm? Have you gone for a walk in a uh, paddy field? Because you're probably technically on a farm and you need to be aware of the risk that you're bringing in. And Australians will do the right thing, but that's not what this government did. We stood up in this place and we asked genuine questions because we, want, we want them to succeed on this. We want them to stop foot and mouth at the border. Well, we also have a responsibility to hold them to account. And thanks to our pressure and the sensible conversations that industry has been having, they suddenly went from dismissive to defensive. And so it was this week, this last sitting fortnight, that we have seen the Minister for Agriculture um, turn to personal attacks, um, blaming the opposition instead of actually answering simple questions about what did you know? Why did it take you so long? And how many Australians coming back from Bali since we knew in the 5th of July actually went across foot mats? He told us it was 100 per cent. Turns out the foot mats weren't anywhere near our airports and our returning passengers until Monday, Tuesday last week, when we could confidently say they were installed in airports. So it was too little too late. What about banning food products? If you talk to the experts, 
The biggest risk of foot and mouth, like it occurred in the UK, is it coming in from imported products and getting into our food supply chain. Unlike New Zealand, another country so special like Australia that doesn't have foot and mouth disease uh, on its shores, where agriculture is incredibly important to its economic uh, future, they've banned the importation of food products from hotspots, foot and mouth hotspots. Smart. We're an island. We can do this. We need to also scan every bit of luggage coming in from these countries so that we know if there's food product in there and can hold it. We need to make sure we're helping Indonesia um, ensure that that's not coming on by giving them the technology that we have. These are very real questions that, as an opposition, we've been asking. And you know that minister's response today was a, yes, and yesterday was appalling. Because we haven't tweeted about it, the opposition doesn't care. Well, I'm sorry. We, I can talk to you ad nauseum about the farmers that have contacted my office and me personally uh, since this outbreak. Incredibly concerned. And just because uh, senators haven't tweeted about it doesn't mean it's not an issue. It just shows how um, immature and unready for the responsibilities of government they are. This is a serious issue. Thank goodness the Prime Minister has had to step in over this hapless fool, and he is taking responsibility and putting this on the agenda at National Cabinet because the states are critical to our response in this. Thank you. My remarks. Are there, do, the, do the whips have any other documents that they wish to keep on the notice paper? Mr Deputy President, yep. I rise to take note and will seek leave to continue my remarks in relation to the following documents, if I can list them, please. Yes, okay. On page three, document one. On page four, documents two, five, six, eight, nine, ten. And then I have similar comments in relation to the committee reports. Yeah, we'll, come to to committee reports. To we'll come to committee reports and audit reports in a minute. Senator Urquhart. Um, Senator Scarf has done my job. Thank, uh, Senator Scar, sorry, has done my job for me. So thank you. Senator Scar, perhaps thirteen. Thirteen, of course. Yes. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to take note of and seek leave to continue my remarks of document number seven on page four. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution in relation to documents? As any documents to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. We go to further consideration of reports and responses. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses and Auditor General's reports, which are listed on pages five to seven of the notice paper. I remind honourable senators that any report or response to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senator Urquhart. I'll, I'll just, if, if others don't mind, I might just um, take note and seek leave to, conti to continue my remarks. Yes, thank you. So on page five, take note of documents six and seven and seek leave to continue my remarks. On page, do you want me to keep going? Deputy President, on the pages? Might, yes, and yep. then, I, then I will give the call. Okay, thank you. Um, page 6, document 8 and 14, and seek leave to continue my remarks. And on page 7, um, Auditor General report at um, point 10, uh, I'll take note of and seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. I rise to take note. Uh, of the Auditor General Report Number 24 of 2021, addressing superannuation guarantee non-compliance. Uh, I understand that it's not printed on the notice paper today, and that that is an error. Uh, and I've been advised that uh, to seek leave uh, to take note on that report, Auditor General Report Number 24 of 2021. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. President, this report exposed yet again the crisis of unpaid superannuation in this country. On the watch of those opposite, Australian workers have lost $5 billion per year in stolen super—$5 billion, missing from the retirement savings of Australian workers, because those opposite sat back and allowed the ATO to take a light-touch approach 
to dodgy employers. A light touch approach, which has done nothing to stop employers stealing super from their workers and has resulted in less than 15 per cent of unpaid super being recovered by the tax office. The Auditor General found that the ATO's failure to proactively enforce superannuation compliance means that it is workers themselves who are relied on to do all the heavy lifting, with the largest portion of recovered superannuation resulting from workers reporting a problem themselves to the ATO. But we've seen what happens when workers make the decision to report their underpayment to the ATO. They receive no or completely inadequate communication. They are still likely um, to have to fight um, for months or years to be paid what they are owed, and their employers aren't even slightly deterred from doing it all again to the next worker. Earlier this year, the Economics References Committee heard from a group of early childhood educators and members of the United Workers' Union that have had over $82,000 stolen from their retirement savings by their employer. These workers, with their union, did everything right. They reached out to their employer with no avail. They contacted the ATO with no avail. And still, over two years after reporting the theft of their super, they have not received a single cent. Not a single cent. One worker told me, and I quote, I feel betrayed by my employer and failed by the ATO for allowing this to happen for such a long time. Super theft totals over $5 billion every year, affecting almost a quarter of the entire workforce, leaving workers to retire with smaller retirement savings, forcing more people onto the aged pension and racking up a future bill for all taxpayers. But those opposite, they don't see it that way. Those opposite gladly sat back for almost a decade while employers stole their workers' super to get ahead, allowing their departments to believe that employers that steal super are just making uh, what was called pragmatic business choices. And now they've gone straight after workers' retirement savings themselves. Their seats on the op opposition benches uh, weren't even warm before they started their attack on our superannuation system. Opposition members have said government should not proceed with the legislated increase to superannuation. They've called super, and I quote, a massive drain on the economy. They've suggested that the government increase taxes on superannuation. They've called, for the they've called for the requirement for employers to pay super to be removed altogether. They've called for super not to be paid to low-income earners. Those opposite are completely out of control when it comes to super and out of touch. They have never supported our superannuation system. The Albanese government knows that superannuation is one of the greatest strengths of our economy. Our universal workplace right to financial dignity in retirement is unique to our country, and it's the envy of the world. I was proud uh, earlier today to be elected as the chair of the Senate Economics Committee this morning. Uh, and in this role, I look forward to delivering our government's plan for an economy that works for people, not the other way around. That plan includes strengthening our superannuation system, making sure super is paid to workers, preferably at the same time as their wages, ensuring the ATO can and does crack down on dodgy employers with urgency and with force, getting the super guarantee to 12 per cent and, once it does, looking at whether and when we should aim for 15, and finding the best way to make super payable on paid parental leave. Superannuation is a Labor government legacy and we will always stand with workers to protect and strengthen it. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the Foreign Interference Through Social Media Select Committee progress report. Uh, in December 2021, the committee handed down its first interim report. And I want to commend the work of the chair in the previous parliament, Senator McAllister, and the deputy chair, Senator Mullen, for the work of the committee. Uh, in the interim report, the committee recognised the risk of platforms being used to spread misinformation and disinformation, and they recommended that a signal body should be established that is dedicated to keeping social media platforms and other government entities accountable in preventing cyber-enabled foreign interference. The committee said the need for such an entity would continue to grow in importance 
as the use of cyber-enabled technologies to interfere in foreign elections and referendums had increased significantly in recent years. The committee also issued a further progress report in April 2022, and in that report it noted that it had not yet completed its, its work uh, nor its final inquiry report as it had intended due to the parliament proroguing uh, the, the committee. Um, the chair, Senator McAllister, made a recommendation uh, that the Senate consider re-establishing the committee in this new parliament. Uh, and I want to add my support to that call from Senator McAllister in the previous parliament. Uh, I agree that there is important work for this Senate Select Committee to continue to do in this parliament, and I hope that the Senate does agree to re-establish it. I note for the record in the previous parliament it was chaired by an opposition senator and the deputy chair was a government senator, and I hope that if the Senate agrees to re-establish it that it should again be chaired by an opposition senator with the deputy chair uh, being from the government. Um, and in particular, the reason why I think it is necessary for this committee to continue its work is there's been significant developments in this space since the committee handed down its interim report, which it acknowledged it was not complete. And that is in particular in relation to one social media company, TikTok, who made a submission and appeared before the committee and gave evidence to it. Uh, at, in its submission and in its appearance before the committee, TikTok assured the parliament and through the parliament the Australian people that the data of Australian users on their platform was safe because it was ultimately stored in the United States and Singapore. What they did not highlight was that that data, although it was stored in the United States and Singapore, uh, is accessible in uh, mainland China and had been repeatedly accessed in mainland China. We only now know about this because of a leaked report from a whistleblower to BuzzFeed News which exposed this practice and on the 17th of June. And following that, I wrote to TikTok Australia to seek clarification about their evidence before the committee and to ask them whether or not uh, this practice, which had been identified by BuzzFeed in the United States, had also taken place in Australia. I did so on the 3rd of July, and they replied to my letter on the 12th of July, acknowledging, yes, it is the case that Australian TikTok user data is accessible on, in mainland China. Now, this is important because Chinese companies, all Chinese companies individuals, are subject to a whole suite of national security legislation in China, in particular the 2017 National Intelligence Law, which requires all entities and individuals to cooperate with Chinese intelligence agencies in the national interest if required and to keep that cooperation secret. So it does raise concerns that it is possible that Australian user data has fallen already or could fall in the future into the hands of the Chinese government. I've written to the Cybersecurity Minister, uh, Ms O'Neill, on the 13th of July, encouraging her to take up all possible regulatory options uh, in addressing this problem. And in more recent days, uh, we've had reports from the cybersecurity company Internet 2.0, which demonstrates the enormous breadth of data collected by this app. We've had reports, uh, we've had a, a recognition by the Independent Australian Information Commissioner that this is a serious issue that they will investigate in relation to TikTok. And just this morning, Max Mason of the Financial Review, who has followed this issue particularly closely, uh, reported that it, members of parliament have been warned that they need to have a second phone if they are using social media apps like TikTok. This follows reports uh, in recent days from New Zealand that its MPs have been warned not to use TikTok, TikTok on their personal accounts. Um, so well, I'd like to see the government investigate all regulatory options and the opposition stands ready to support the government should they propose any proactive steps to protect the 7 million Australian users of TikTok. I also think it is time that the parliament consider re-establishing the Senate Select Committee into foreign interference through social media, as recommended by the now Assistant Minister, uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, and I look forward to working with all members of the chamber to ensure these important cyber security and privacy issues are dealt with. Unfortunately, so far, all we have had from the government is a comment by the minister that she is concerned about these developments and she hopes other Australians are also concerned. It is not the job of a minister simply to be a commentator. It is a job of the minister to take action, and I hope they take action on this very serious national security issue. Senator Waters, do you have any documents to take note of? Senator Scar. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I seek to take note of uh, item three under the Auditor General's reports, please. And I'll give you all the items and then I'll seek leave if I could. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and item four under the committee reports on page five. So item four under committee reports on page five. 
and under Auditor General's reports, item three, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I didn't. I wish to now put the um, question as put to the chamber by Senator Patterson. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution at this stage? Are there any ministerial statements? Um, thank you, uh, Deputy President. I table a document relating to an order for the production of documents concerning claims, uh, claims for deaths and injuries arising from COVID-19 vaccines. Sorry, I just sat in the chair. <laughs> it's one moment. Would anyone like to take note of the document just tabled? No one's uh, rising, so I stand right. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Public Sector Superannuation Salary Legislation Amendment Bill 2022 without amendment. Call the clerk. General business, notice a motion number 12, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young regarding corporate tax and cost of living. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I move general business uh, notice of motion number 20, which is that the Senate agrees that corporate super profits taxes could offset the cost of providing cost of living relief including the provision of free childcare, truly free public education, abolishing student debt and putting dental and mental health into Medicare. So I, I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to this really important question of choices. We have a government that's crying poor and that's uh, warning us of impending cuts and an austerity budget come October. And yet they are refusing to raise much needed revenue which could be used to address the cost of living crisis. They are persisting with Mr Morrison's stage three tax cuts for the very wealthy that would of course benefit uh, men more than women and would deliver uh, an approximately $9,000 tax cut to the likes of Mr Clive Palmer, who doesn't need the help in that regard, or he certainly needs help in other ways. So this government is persisting in wasting money and giving tax cuts to people who don't need the help, while at the same time saying to Australians, no, we can't afford to increase job seeker, no, we can't afford to make childcare free, no, we can't afford to put dental or mental health care into Medicare. Well, it's bollocks. It's nonsense, and people expect better from this new government. We are in a cost of living crisis on top of the climate crisis that we are in, and people expect the government, rather than throwing their hands up and pointing the finger at the RBA and seemingly not being able to do anything about it, people expect this government to actually take action and deliver cost of living relief for them, not deliver tax cuts to the very wealthy that don't need it. So that's our first point of contention, $244 billion over a decade for the stage three tax cuts. Now that could be used to make childcare genuinely free, never mind the complicated um, CCR and CCB rebates that currently exist that are incredibly complicated and a disincentive for people to work it out in the first place. We could actually make it free. That's what we had in the pandemic. People know it can be done. It really helped, and yet this government isn't proposing to do that. They should be, uh, and they're not. While they're at it, they should be paying uh, early childhood educators a decent wage for that matter, and that's something we'll keep pushing on as well. Those stage three tax cuts, they could fund free childcare. They could also fund putting dental care and mental health care into Medicare. We have a universal health care system, and yet it doesn't cover your teeth or your brain. Now, last time I checked, your teeth and your brain are part of your body. 
You should be able to go to a dentist, you should be able to go to a mental health care specialist and get the help you need when you need it using your Medicare card. That's what universal health care provision is about. I think that's why we pay taxes, so that we can have those services provided to us as citizens of this wealthy nation. Now, we took many of these proposals uh, to the election, and so, of course, as a budget integrity measure, we asked the Parliamentary Budget Office to cost them. Um, and we think it's important that when you make um, a promise as to how you can improve people's lives, that you show how you can raise the revenue to pay for it. So we've done that, and we have all the figures, and I'll bedazzle you with them now. Now, free childcare, which I mentioned, it's about $9 billion a year. It's quite a big spend. But you know what that enables? It enables women to return to the workforce, which pays economic dividends beyond the amount that it costs, and which is the right thing to do. If you want women's workforce participation to increase, and if you want real equality in the workplace as well as in the home, which is something we're also pushing for, um, then make childcare free. It is good for the kids. They get fantastic quality early childhood education, and we know at that stage of their development that early input is crucial and really sets kids up to be good learners as they go through the schooling system. Um, it's good for the parents. It's good for our economy. It's good for gender equality. Okay, let's make childcare free. And let's pay early childhood workers the wage that they deserve for the crucial role that they play in educating the next generation. Um, now, we campaigned on free public education and making university and TAFE free like it used to be, like many of the people in this chamber uh, received, and on making sure that public schools could be fully funded. Now, that would cost about $5.5 billion every year. Again, these are quite substantial figures, but importantly, we can pay for them by axing those stage three tax cuts for the very wealthy that don't need the help could also pay for them in a myriad of other ways. A corporate super profits tax is another excellent revenue raising measure. And the proposal that we put to the election that the Parliamentary Budget Office costed would raise $286 billion over 10 years. That's what the Parliamentary Budget Office has costed, our corporate super profits tax. So that could fund the provision of dental and, mental, dental and mental health care into Medicare, which would only cost about a third of that, um, and that could cover the cost of making childcare free. These are the decisions that governments make, and it's very interesting to see who this government is making wait for help and who they're prepared to hand out money hand over fist without any questions asked. They're making people wait for free childcare. It's not their policy, although it's something they have said they might consider in future terms if they're re-elected. Why wait? It should be a principal commitment, and you could actually fund it if you raise the revenue by axing those stage three tax cuts by placing a corporate super profits tax on some of our very wealthy corporations who are uh, increasing their wealth during a pandemic at record rates. Uh, and in fact, when we just had the figures released earlier this week that show that the share of profits um, the corporate profits is the largest it's been in 70 years. We have a 70-year record high of corporate profits. While we're in a cost of living crisis, the inequity of that and the widening gap between ordinary citizens and big corporations and billionaires is obscene. It, it cannot stand. So let's raise that revenue by making those big corporations and billionaires pay their fair share so we can provide the services that people need and rely upon and should be provided in a wealthy nation like ours. We've got a few other suggestions for revenue raising. We're in a climate crisis as well as a cost of living crisis, and yet this government, and the last for that matter, paid out $11 billion every year in cheap fuel and accelerated depreciation to fossil fuel companies. We call them fossil fuel subsidies, so they're freebies and perks that other people don't get. $11 billion a year. In fact, over the decade, it's $117 billion. So not only are these companies, which are making record profits and often paying zero tax, one in three of them pay no tax, not only are they getting $117 billion in free, in free public money, they're also doing us the lovely favour of cooking our climate even more. So we are paying 
This government, in our name, is paying these fossil fuel companies to pollute and make the climate crisis worse as the inequality crisis is worsening. It makes no sense. Now, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister have said they'll look for savings. Cut those fossil fuel subsidies. $117 billion over 10 years to big companies who don't need the help. Their bottom lines are very healthy indeed, and they shouldn't be getting the help to pollute this beautiful planet when we are in a climate crisis and should be transitioning to clean, renewable energy that will create jobs and not make the problem worse. So cancelling those fossil fuel subsidies, having a corporate super, super profits tax, axing those stage three tax cuts, these are revenue raising measures that could allow government within our budgetary means to really address the cost of living crisis, to increase job seekers so that people who are below the poverty line still don't have to make the choice between paying their rent or getting their kids a school uniform between paying the rent or having some fresh vegetables on the plate at dinner time. These are the choices that people are making because this government and the last wasted so much money giving it to fossil fuel companies and proposing to give it to the very wealthy with those uh, stage three tax cuts that kick in in a year or so. And yet the government is crying poor and saying how broke it is adopt these revenue-raising proposals, which can achieve multiple objectives of actually servicing the community and not making the climate crisis worse. Now, um, we don't stand alone in these suggestions. In fact, it was just yesterday that the UN Secretary-General, um, Mr Guterres, said uh, that governments should be taxing excessive oil and gas profits. Now, that was music to our ears, because of course that's what we've proposed for many a year. Um, and these concepts are becoming normalised and socialised, and many, many countries and uh, leaders are calling for it. So Mr Guterres says it is immoral for oil and gas companies to be making record profits from this energy crisis on the backs of the poorest people and communities. He also says this grotesque greed is punishing the poorest and the most vulnerable people while destroying our only home. So his proposal, and it's one that the Greens took to the last election, is that we tax the super profits of oil and gas and coal companies. It is obscene that those companies are making record profits when we're in a, uh, an inequality crisis. It is, it is obscene that public money is being used to fuel uh, their profits, which are worsening the climate crisis. And it is obscene that this government says they're broke and can't do anything about it. That is not at all what people voted for, and they expect uh, this parliament to deliver for them. I'd like to mention housing as one of the other things that is contributing to a real squeeze in people's cost of living. It's contributing to skyrocketing rates of homelessness. And we know now that women over the age of 45, there are almost uh, 450,000 women who are on the brink of homelessness. And that it is the fastest growing cohort of people uh, without a home is women in that age bracket. Um, we know that young people have given up on the idea of ever buying their own home, and they're now facing increasing rents that they can't cope with either. This is a serious problem. And yet, rather than raise the revenue in those ways that I've just outlined, by making big businesses and billionaires pay their fair share so that we can build social housing, this government is crying poor, and they're proposing just a scintilla of new build for social homes. I think it's 30,000 homes that they're proposing. Of course, that's better than nothing, but it is nowhere near what the scale of the problem requires. Now, we took to the election a plan to build a million homes over 20 years. Now, that would wipe the housing, social housing waiting list, which is 50,000 people in my home state of Queensland and, of course, far greater across the whole nation. We could wipe that homelessness list and we could then build uh, beautifully designed uh, accessible for people of all sorts of different abilities, um, climatically appropriate homes that are cheap to run because they're powered uh, by renewable energy, and that mean that no one in this country goes without a roof over their head. The government can't cry poor when it's giving away $224 billion to people that don't need the help 
when it's giving away $117 billion to big coal and gas companies to make the climate crisis worse, and yet say that it doesn't have enough money to fix homelessness and the housing crisis. And that's not even to mention changing those negative gearing and capital gains tax settings, which Labor used to have the guts to talk about and sadly seem to have lost all spine in the last election and didn't, didn't dare mention it. Well, we're proudly saying we think those perks should be phased out. They are worsening the housing crisis. They are inflating the bubble. They are making it harder for people to own their first home. How dare taxpayer money be used to subsidise the profits of people who are accumulating more homes than they will ever need when some people don't have any at all? How dare our taxpayer money be used for that? So we could address homelessness. We could make childcare free. We could put dental and mental health care into Medicare. We could make university and TAFE free again. We could do these things if we raise the revenue by making those big corporations pay their fair share, by not giving those free billions to fossil fuel companies, which are cooking the planet anyway and not paying tax, and by cancelling those stage three tax cuts to go to the very wealthy who don't need the help. The budget is about choices and governing is about delivering for the community. It's not about delivering for the people that make political donations to your re-election campaigns. And I will be urging the government, as will all of my party members, to think about these choices as the first budget gets closer and closer. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, I also rise to speak on this motion from Senator Hanson Young. Um, the Australian economy is still growing. We know that we've got significant challenges out there. The economy is still growing. High inflation we read every single day in the paper. That high inflation is impacting, impacting people all across the country. 6.1 as the most recent number. Now, obviously. The result of that is significantly increasing interest rates, and that has an impact on every single person across our country. One full percent between June and July. That's huge when that gets applied to every good and service that people are interfacing with. We know this, and we know that the Reserve Bank has been clear that there's more to come. So yeah, we need to do something. We need a plan. There needs to be things done to make, things, make it easier on the people across our country to cope with this economic scenario. These rate rises hurt every single person, their mortgages, and that's becoming— the numbers were quoted in this House earlier today and yesterday, and no doubt will be quoted again and again as they keep increasing. The causes of this inflation are primarily, but not exclusively, global. We've inherited nine years of mess, nine years of debt, debt to the tune of a trillion dollars, and there's nothing to show for it. In nine years where there were opportunities to pursue renewable energy opportunities, innovation, things that would have strengthened our country, that would have made us more prepared for an economic downturn that would have made us better prepared for those things like global influence that we cannot, deal, we cannot influence terribly well when they happen, but we can prepare for them. We can build a stronger economy, but we didn't do that. Those opposite, when they were in government, wasted nine long years. They left workers worse off, particularly. Um, and to quote the former finance minister, Matthias Cormann, he said that they were intentionally making workers worse off by making low wages a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. Now, that is a shameful thing to do, and it is a shameful thing that has been done to the workers in this country the workers who have contributed, who work hard, who try and put food on the table, pay their rent, pay their mortgage, and they've just been so totally disrespected over the last nine long years. 
The coalition left us in an economic mess through a decade of domestic failure on skills, on supply chains and on energy. In the skills area, we, we've just gutted some of our excellent training facilities. Our whole system of building the next generation of young people trained in the skills of the future, trained for the jobs of the future, as our skills mix changes, as industries change. And nothing has been done to prepare for that, which is a disgrace. We now have a skills shortage that we didn't need to have. Some foresight, some planning would have addressed that. But no, we did not see that. So we do have a plan to tackle these issues. The Albanese government has a plan to tackle the economic crisis that was left to us by those opposite. And the Australian people endorsed that plan in May at the election. And as the Treasurer laid out earlier, the convergence of challenges, the kind of which comes around once in a generation, um, facing us, it's a once in a generation challenge that represents a once in a generation opportunity. We have an opportunity and we're going to take it. The opportunity to build a better future, to make sure that people can get good, solid, well-paying jobs that, they are, that are sustainable, that they can see a future, that they're not grappling from day to day, from month to month, that they actually can look with hope towards the future. So our plan started very, very early on with, the, with us ensuring that the lowest paid workers in our economy got a pay rise of 5.2%. Now, it's not enough, but that is a huge leap forward and the first time in a long time that those people have seen any sort of sense of hope about where their wages are going, that they're not constantly going backwards, that they are starting to catch up. So the audit of rorts and waste that's being conducted by the Minister for Finance and Treasury is going to go through that budget from March line by line and unpack all of the waste, all of the terrible decisions that were made that do nothing to build our country. Nothing. And we will ensure that spending is building value, is focused clearly on building value and building a better future that it is not spent on buying votes, giving money to your mates. That's not how we are going to behave. That is not how we intend to manage our budget. So importantly, we have a plan to lift the speed limit on the economy and stop the decade of stagnation that we've seen. Firstly, we will help everyone with the cost of living by doing a couple of key things. Now, childcare is obviously a critical issue. People's ability to go to work is impacted significantly by the childcare that they can find and the childcare that they can afford. So one of the things we will be doing is cutting the costs of childcare. Cutting the cost of childcare for 1.2 million families so that they can work out their family budget, have the children in childcare, know that they can afford it and go and build their careers, engage in some of the great training opportunities that we will be bringing forward so that they can build a future for their family. We're also cutting the cost of medicine um, by up to $12.50 uh, a script. Now, medicine is a really important aspect of people's budget and we know that when faced with a choice about what they're going to drop when there isn't enough money to put food on the table, pay the rent, pay the bills, people will often drop their medication, which means that their health is significantly impacted and sometimes spirals into more serious health problems. 
So this um, cutting the cost of medicine will address some of that as well. We'll ensure that wages grow over time by supporting decent wages in the care economy um, and investing in the industries that are going to deliver secure and well-paid jobs. We'll invest in the skills necessary. We'll be working with business, with unions, to ensure that businesses can hire the people they need and that Australians are trained for these new industries that are coming forward, for the opportunities that we really, really clearly see. Opportunities in renewable energy, obviously. Um, certainly in my home state of South Australia, we're all very excited about the hydrogen future that may be available to us. And there's an awful lot of work going on there that we're very proud of. Um, we're also going to fix our supply chains and deal with the supply side of inflation challenge by investing in cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy. And as I've said a couple of times this week in this chamber, our plan for our energy grid, our plan for renewables, our plan to lower the cost of, of energy for households. These things are all on foot. These things are going to make a big difference. They're not only going to create jobs, they're not only going to put us on the map in terms of innovation, but they are also going to deliver solid future jobs, well-paid jobs for people. <coughs> and when we turn around and look at tax reform, our priority, our significant priority at the moment will be to ensure that multinationals pay their fair share of tax here in Australia. Multinational companies operating across borders are far too able to shift their profits to low or no tax jurisdictions to avoid paying tax in countries like Australia. These practices have become more sophisticated as companies use intangible assets such as intellectual property and they hold them in low tax jurisdictions. The rapid growth of the digital economy has completely exacerbated this issue. Um, and as the Treasurer referred to earlier today, one of the key things that we'll be doing is supporting the OECD's two-pillar solution for a global 15 per cent minimum tax and ensure that some of the profits of the largest multinationals, particularly digital firms, are taxed where the products or services are sold. The, um, so this is going to assist with our budget repair and it will help level that playing field for Australian businesses who are far too often negatively impacted because a multinational or an overseas based company can exactly do this and Australian companies are not able to and nor should they want to. We should be paying our taxes and we should be proudly paying our taxes. Um, but our taxes should not be creating an extra burden on legitimate business activity. So we have an economic plan and it's clear, it's deliberate and it's a direct response to the challenges left to us by those opposite, opposite a wasted, wasted decade almost of coalition governments. Labor's five-point economic plan is calibrated to reduce costs of living, drive productiv productivity growth um, and expand the capacity of the economy to alleviate supply-side pressures. We will get wages growing so that Australians aren't held back or left behind, as I've said, and invest, in public money, invest our public money in a way that delivers a genuine economic value for Australians. These are the critical points in our economic plan that we will deliver on, that will make a difference. And we will do it with transparency and we will do it in conversation and in partnership with businesses, with the unions, with the community. This is all of us working together. That is what we will deliver. So, We won't be supporting this motion. 
We have been upfront about the growing challenges facing our economy, including high and rising inflation, rising interest rates, skyrocketing, skyrocketing cost of living and a trillion dollars of debt. These challenges have been exacerbated by nearly a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities by those opposite. Our economic plan, as I say, is deliberate. It's very deliberate, direct response to the growing pressures that we have been left with. We will continue working hard to provide responsible and permanent cost of living relief. These things will be laid out fully in our budget in October as we work through the March budget, find the savings, redirect the money and actually start to look at how we can improve the lives of people across this country. Our priority, as I've said, in tax will be the multinationals. We will work very hard with our international partners and right here at home to deliver on those promises and deliver those savings, which we can then turn into opportunities for Australians, opportunities to address our cost of living pressures. Thank you. Senator Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Before I uh, move to address the, the substance of the motion, I do want to respond and take this opportunity to respond to some of the points which were raised by, by Senator Grogan. And at the outset, I should say uh, that I think it's a good thing that Senator Grogan is not supporting a super profits tax super company profits tax, and I think that's a responsible thing for uh, a member of one of the two governing parties uh, in this country to, uh, to adopt. So I do commend you uh, in relation to that. But there were uh, two points I think I should rebut uh, in relation to my contribution in this place. And the first is the statement that there is nothing to show in terms of the government debt that was incurred during the last term of parliament. The reality is the reality is, and the Australian public knows this all too well, that Australia faced the biggest pandemic crisis this nation has ever faced for decades and decades and decades. And I'm sure Senator Grogan has met, as I have met, as all senators in this place have met, small businesses, large businesses, and most importantly, employees of those businesses employees of those businesses who were kept employed because of the previous government's JobKeeper program. It was absolutely essential, absolutely essential in terms of keeping the connection between those employees and their businesses. And I'm proud that I served uh, in a government that adopted that as a policy. So it is not correct to say that there was nothing to show for the debt. There was great things to show for the debt, including the fact that this country achieved record levels of employment not seen for, for decades not seen for decades in the aftermath of the major impacts of the pandemic the second point i wish to raise and this is a point i will be returning to constantly over the next term of, of over this term of parliament is this concept that there's all this low hanging fruit waiting to be plucked in terms of addressing tax avoidance measures uh, engaged uh, tax avoidance measures to be mobilised against international multinationals. Mr. Dep Mr Acting Deputy President, this shows a lack of knowledge of the measures which have been taken by the Australian Taxation Office over a number of years. The ATO has brought a number of cases, a number of cases addressing this exact issue. All of the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. There is no more low-hanging fruit in this space. There is no low-hanging fruit in this space. And I suggest to Senator Grogan that she attends uh, the inestimates, uh, when no doubt uh, Commissioner Jordan and his team from the ATO will be present, and they will advise you the magnitude, the magnitude of, of, of tax which has been identified, in particular, in particular potential future deductions for loan interest repayments that have been uh, identified as not being legitimate, that have been identified as not being legitimate, it, it runs into the billions of dollars, 
the ATO has already gone through with a fine tooth comb the largest multinationals and largest companies in this country with respect to those exact issues which you legitimately refer to. But the concept that there's this magic money tree which you're going to be able to go to and pluck the dollars off in this regard is just totally misconceived. And people listening to this broadcast don't have to believe me. They can look at the results in the next three years. The low-hanging fruit in terms of international transfer pricing has all been picked from the trees. There is no more. There is no more. I've got a great deal of confidence in, in the ATO and the work they've done in that regard. Senator Grogan also mentioned, also mentioned the OECD's project with respect to the minimum uh, corporate tax rate of 15 per cent. And, and she's right to refer to that. And that's an appropriate segue for me to then move on to the Greens' supposedly fully funded, fully costed super corporate profits tax. I interjected disorderly in a disorderly way during uh, Senator Waters' speech in relation to whether or not she would actually refer to the Parliamentary Budget Office costings. And I note Senator Waters did not refer to the detail. Did not refer to the detail. I've got the detail here. In fact, I've got 500 pages, 500 pages of detail with respect to the costings of the Greens policies. I've got 500 pages of it, Senator Waters. 500 pages of it. Now, I believe in truth in political advertising. I believe in truth in political advertising, and it's something which I have advocated over many, many years. And in that respect, in that respect, I believe, if as the Greens policy says, that something is fully costed and fully funded, that you should be able to take that, you should be able to take that on face value and actually believe it. You should be able to take that on face value and believe that it is fully costed and fully funded. But the reality is, the reality is that when you look at the PBO's costings, that is not the case. And this, this isn't my analysis. This isn't Senator Scar's analysis. This is the PBO's analysis. So let's read what they say. This is on page one in their summary. Page one of the 2022 election commitments report, July 2022. PBO office. This is what they say. The Greens platform, if fully implemented, would be expected to result in larger deficits. In larger deficits. So how does larger deficits equate to fully costed and fully funded? Fully funded by debt? I don't think that people reading the Greens policy statement would assume that when they said fully funded, they actually meant fully funded by debt. But this is the result. Larger deficits over the same period relative to the pre-election economic fiscal outlook, reflecting higher levels of both receipts and payments as a share of GDP. The impact of the Greens' commitments on both receipts and payments are significantly higher than the other major parties. This is what the PBO says in their own costings. That does not equate to fully costed and fully funded. You shouldn't have higher deficits if it's fully funded. That's, that's a simple proposition. You don't need a PhD in economics to work that out. You don't need a PhD in economics to work that out. And then you move to page three of the PBO's election commitments report with respect to the Greens' fully funded, fully costed policies. And this is a, the result of the fully funded and fully costed policies. Fully funded, fully costed. So what's it going to lead to? Well, the financial implications of election commitments by party 2022 to 23 forward estimates, underlying cash, headline cash and fiscal balance basis in billions. And under the Greens, they all go backwards. Each one of them goes backwards. Greater deficits, greater deficits does not equal fully costed, fully funded. Not a magic quiz. No, no, Senator <laughs> Stuart John, this is, what, this is what the PBO is saying, not me. This is the PBO. And in terms of the headline cash balance, the headline cash balance, this is what they say in terms of the Australian Greens policies. The coalition net impact of election com commitments is a positive 1.1 billion. The Australian Labor Party's net impact of election commitments headline cash balance in that period through the 2022-23 forward estimates is negative 40.5 billion. The Greens is negative 112 billion. 0.1 billion Australian dollars. Does it sound fully costed? 
$112.1 billion. No wonder you didn't mention it, Senator Waters, in your contribution on this debate. $112.1 billion. That's out of the PBO's work, not mine. So let's see what the PBO says about the super profits proposition. The super profits proposition. I am pleased that those opposite in government are not supporting this resolution. The first point to make about the PBO's own costings, these aren't my words, this is the PBO. This is the PBO. I've read their work carefully. I have a lot of respect for the PBO and, and pay tribute to everyone working in the PBO. This is what they say. There is a very high degree of uncertainty associated with this costing. There is a very high degree of uncertainty associated with this costing. Now, I used to be a company secretary and general counsel of an ASLEX-listed company. If I put something out into the market that said it was totally, totally costed and fully funded, when you've got $112 billion of community deficits and you've got the PBO talking about a high degree of uncertainty and there's no safety warning in terms of the Greens policy document, ASIC would be all over me like a rash. And that's why we need truth in political advertising. That's why we need truth in political advertising. So the PBO says there is a very high degree of uncertainty associated with this costing. The other thing they say, and, and this is a point which leads on to other observations, the super profits tax paid have been reduced by 20 per cent to account for an estimated behavioural response by companies. Because you know what happens? You know what happens? When you increase taxes, then the people who are investing in capital in this country, which provides jobs to Australians, which provides markets to small businesses all over this country, they consider their options. They consider their options. And can I tell you in my previous role in the mining industry, one of my roles was to look at different jurisdictions and whether or not our, country should, our company should invest in them. And one of the things you looked at was the corporate tax rate. And companies have options. They don't have to invest here. They can invest in other countries. They can invest in other countries. And so those in the Greens should consider, and I'm happy to lend it to them. I'm going to quote from a book I've got called Basic Economics. Basic Economics. I'm going to quote from this book. Basic Economics. Economics 101. Economics 101. I'll buy you all a copy. And this is what it says. This is what it says. When tax rates are raised 10 per cent, it may be assumed by some, i.e. the Greens, that tax revenues will also rise by 10 per cent. But in fact, more people may move out of the heavily taxed jurisdiction or buy less of the heavily taxed commodity so that the revenues received Order. can be disappointingly far below what was estimated. Funny that. People actually respond to higher tax rates Order. and they'll invest in jurisdictions with lower tax rates. And this has been the economic experience all over the world, from the United States to India to Iceland. In Iceland, I'll quote from the text, in Iceland, as the corporate tax rate was gradually reduced from 45 per cent to 18 per cent from 1991 and 2001, and I note the 18 per cent is higher than the OECD minimal uh, amount which has been negotiated. So in Iceland, as the corporate tax rate was gradually reduced from 45 per cent to 18 per cent between 1991 and 2001, what happened to tax revenues? Did they fall? Did they fall? Did they go up? Proportionately, did they fall when the tax rate went down from 45 to 18 per cent? Is that what happened? Tell us, no, they tripled. The tax revenues paying for schools, for hospitals, for roads, for the mental health care you talk about and which I care passionately about, dental care, the revenues tripled. The tax rates came down, the revenues tripled. Tripled. That's the experience. That's basic economics. Economics 101. There is, a, there is a deeper issue here, Mr Acting Deputy President, and it is an issue. It is an issue for a centre-right party such as mine and indeed for the Australian Labor Party. There is a deeper issue. And the issue is this, that when we go to elections and the Greens falsely, fraudulently, claim that their policies were fully funded and fully costed, when that wasn't the case, because if it were the case, you wouldn't have increasing deficits. The issue is 
The issue is they say to voters at the polling booths, you will get free dental care, you will get free mental health care, you will get free child care. And on the face of it, on the face of it, this sounds good. It's very, it's very tempting. But there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. The only question, the only question is who pays. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. The only question is who pays. And the introduction of a corporate super tax would drive investment offshore, drive jobs offshore, and people who are considering whether or not they should invest in Australia would take their money somewhere else, invest it there, and provide jobs and prosperity overseas. I believe, Mr Acting Deputy President, that both my party and the Australian Labor Party need to shine a brighter light, a brighter light on the ridiculous, fanciful Greens policies and their e disastrous potential economic consequences for this country. And I, it, is, it is so well summarised, so, so, so well summarised in, in, in summary, that the Greens policies say totally funded, totally costed, and yet when you look at the PBO, you go to the source document, $112 billion of additional debt. $112 billion of additional debt. The flying unicorn, the fairies at the bottom of the garden. And the devastating impact that would have on the Australian economy needs to be considered by every single Australian who voted Green at the last federal election. Senator Norman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Australians are facing a cost of living crisis, which may well have gone unnoticed by those across the chamber. This is a crisis that was not of the Australian people's making, and yet they are paying for it, literally, while mega corporations are seeing record, pro record profits from their price gouging. When we talk about no such thing as a free lunch, the groups in this country that are getting the free lunch are the big corporations and the mining companies who are getting away without paying their fair share of tax. When we talk about the question of who pays, we are talking about the Australian people who are not getting the services that they need and deserve. Inflation is rising significantly faster than wages, and people are not keeping up. We've heard the Treasurer speak often about the pain that Australian households are facing, but so far he has failed to take action to meaningfully address rising prices for people in our community. The Reserve Bank of Australia's response to inflation has been to slug us with increases to the official cash rate, which is raising interest rates, which in turn are being passed on to people with mortgages and to renters, the people who can least afford it. Attempting to curb inflation by reducing the amount of money that first home buyers have to spend on essentials is a particularly unjust policy tool. It's also doing nothing to address the true causes of inflation shocks to supply and corporate profiteering. Massive corporations are using inflation as a fig leaf to cover up record levels of price gouging and this corporate profiteering. The share of national income that is going to profit is at an all-time high. The share of national income that is going to workers is at an all-time low. This is why we need a tax on windfall profits, and we needed it yesterday. A combination of a tax on windfall profits, closing corporate tax loopholes and fixing the structural flaws in the way that the petroleum resource rent tax is calculated could deliver hundreds of billions of dollars 
in additional revenue over the next decade. This would put a handbrake on corporate profits, which are currently skyrocketing and could serve to meaningfully reduce inflation. As has been correctly identified across the chamber, the Greens took a policy of imposing corporate super profit taxes to the last election because we knew that the revenue from corporate tax could be used to make a real difference in people's lives. We knew that the government could use that money to reduce the cost of living for people. Things like free childcare. We saw during the early stages of the pandemic what a fundamental difference it made to people's household incomes <clears throat> when childcare was made free. We've done it already. We need to do it again. Childcare is a huge portion of the household budget for so many families. In my first speech, I talked about the fact that I had to rely on the assistance of my mum to help me to afford to go back to work because of the high cost of childcare. There are many women in our community who don't have the luxury and the privilege that I had of having family members or friends who can help them in that task. If we want women in this country to be able to fully participate in the workforce, to continue to engage in careers that they find meaningful and sustaining, if we want their families to be able to afford for them to do that, then we need to have fully universal free childcare in this country. And we can pay for it by taxing the big corporations and the miners and making sure that they pay their fair share. It costs around $9 billion per year to provide fully free universal childcare. That is much less than tax cuts that are being proposed. In addition to that, funding childcare creates 20 times more jobs than tax cuts, dollar for dollar, according to the Australia Institute. That seems like a really sensible thing to do. What else could we do with the additional revenue that would be created if we taxed big corporations and billionaires and made them pay their fair share to ease cost of living on families? Well, we could make public education truly free. As I said in my first speech earlier this week, funding to private schools in the last decade has increased at five times the rate of public schools, and public schools are sitting currently at 91 per cent of the schooling resource standard. The schooling resource standard is not an aspirational target. It is the minimum, minimum amount of funding that is required, the bare minimum, so that students can meet minimum benchmarks. And it's parents and carers and families and teachers at the moment who are making up the difference in that shortfall of funding. Parents are having to pay ever-increasing fees in their public school. It is not unusual for a family to get an invoice at the start of the school year for anywhere between $500 and $3,000 for their public school, depending on where they live in the country. That money covers things like excursions, supplies in art classes, supplies in classes like industrial design and technology. And increasingly, parents and carers are being asked to dig into their own pockets to fund their children's public education. 
That places an increased burden on the cost of living pressures on families. By fully funding our public schools, not only do we give every child in this country the opportunity to have the best start in life, but we also, also ease cost of living pressures on those families. I have worked up until very recently in a public school. I have witnessed firsthand what cost of living pressures are doing to people in our communities. I have seen families who are struggling to put food on the table because their power prices are going up, the cost of rent is going up, the amount they're having to pay for their public school fees is going up, and they are skipping meals and their kids are going hungry. That should not be happening in a wealthy country like this. As I said the other day, one in eight people in my home state of Queensland are living in poverty. These are the impacts of the decisions that get made in this place. When governments decide not to tax those who can afford to pay, when governments allow big corporations and billionaires to not pay their fair share, it is the people in our communities who suffer. It is the people in our communities who can't afford to put the petrol in the car to go to the job interview. It is the people in our communities who can't afford to pay their power bill this month. It is the people in our communities who can't afford to pay the rent. I'm pretty sure that the people back in our communities are expecting us to make decisions that will make their lives better. By taxing big corporations and billionaires and making them pay their fair share, we have the capacity to do that. We could also use the revenue from taxing big corporations and billionaires to put dental and mental health into Medicare. We know that dozens of people in our communities put off going to the dentist because they can't afford it. It is not uncommon to hear of people putting off going to the dentist and then eventually going when they can no longer put it off and being told that they have to pay $6,000 for root canal treatment that they can't afford. Not including dental and mental health into Medicare is a false economy. We end up paying long, more in the long run when people's health needs are not addressed. The Greens went to this election with a plan to introduce a corporate super profits tax to tax billionaires, to tax the mining companies and to get them to pay their fair share. And what we heard when we spoke to people in the community was that they want that too. They want to be able to afford health care. They want to be able to afford to keep a roof over their head. They want to be able to afford to send their kids to school with the things that they need. The Australian people deserve to have what they need to live a good life. People on JobSeeker deserve to have that doubled. If we make big corporations and billionaires pay their fair share, we can do that. 
we saw what a massive impact that had on so many people's lives during the pandemic. Health appointments that had been put off were made. Children who needed clothes for winter were able to get them. Students who hadn't been on a school excursion for months were able to go on them. People were able to live a dignified, good life because they had what they needed, and that is the job of government. My colleagues and I stand for making sure that the people in this country who can afford it pay their fair share. That means big corporations and billionaires, not the people of this country who deserve so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Steele John. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, in, in commencing my contribution to this uh, debate this evening, at the end of this first two weeks of sitting, I'm forced to, uh, and, and really quite happy, to have the opportunity to reflect upon uh, the different state of Australian politics that now confronts us um, at the end of this uh, two-week period, um, as opposed to the last sitting before the election. Um, we have in the, in the chamber tonight um, excellent new colleagues um, and comrades in the Greens cause, uh, such as uh, Senator Elman Payne, and I want to thank you for a fantastic uh, contribution to this debate, uh, one which grounded it back in substance and detail um, rather than the, the rather rhetorically high points we were reaching just before. We have the opportunity to discuss issues. Uh, such as the need uh, to tax big corporations in this moment of time uh, when uh, they are making such outrageous profits, not because they're doing anything new or good or beneficial, simply because they're taking advantage um, of the fact uh, that there are global factors at the moment, wars in the world and uh, shortages of food, uh, that allow them to make extraordinary profits doing exactly the same as they were doing last year. Uh, we also uh, sit in a chamber right now that's being chaired uh, by Dorinda Cox, my uh, colleague from uh, Western Australia, a proud First Nations woman. Um, and we have debated through the course of uh, the week many pieces of legislation important to the community. And it is the Greens that have taken uh, the initiative this evening, at the end of this sitting period, to put on the agenda of the Senate a rather important question. That being whether these chambers should, at this incredible moment in time when so many in our community are doing it so tough, whether at this particular time these Houses of Parliament should proactively take steps to make the rich richer. That's ultimately what we are debating tonight. And we are only able to do that because of the contribution of a Greens movement, 30 years in the making, supported by tens of thousands of people across the country. Senator Cox sits in the chair this evening because of the work of the Greens WA movement and the work of many great candidates across the country in the run-up uh, to the election. And so before I move uh, to the substance of the debate this evening, I just want to place on the record uh, our thanks uh, to the candidates and individuals that played such an important role in the election, without whose contribution this very conversation uh, would not be happening. Uh, first of all, uh, our lower house candidates, the fabulous uh, Caroline Perks, um, in uh, Fremantle, Felicity Townsend, uh, in Curtin, Cameron Pigeon, uh, in Swan, uh, Clint Ewing, in Brand, Heather Lonsdale, uh, in the seat of Burt, Daniel Garlett, in Canning, Jodie Moffat, 
uh, in Cowan, Isabella Tripp, uh, in Durack, Bianca McNair, in Forrest, Christine Tarrantry, uh, and in Hasluck, uh, Brendan Sturk. Uh, in Moore, we had Mark Cooper, uh, and in uh, O'Connor, Giz Watson, alongside Donna Nelson in Piers, and Adam Adol, uh, Abdul Razak in Tangney. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be good uh, to, to not to mention uh, the fantastic support candidates uh, to uh, Senator Cox on the ticket, uh, River Clark, Simone Collins, Donald Clark, Jordan Carhill and Alex Wallace. Now, all of these individuals and their campaign teams gave so much time and energy to our Greens movement throughout the course of the campaign because they understood, as the millions of Greens uh, voters uh, understand, that there is something deeply wrong, deeply broken at the heart of the major parties. Both sides have now congealed into a centre-right lump, unable or unwilling to challenge the vested interests, the mining companies, the gas giants, the coal barons, that for so long have applied pressure on this place, have made donations to the major parties, have lobbied and greased the wheels in this place, and now both sides in this parliament have decided basically on this particular issue, on the issue of whether fairness and justice should be the guiding principle of our tax and contribution system to give up the conversation. Now let's be really clear about what is happening here. The Australian community believe in fairness. Our community believes in compassion. Our community believes in working together. And from this belief comes a support for a contribution system which sees those that have more pay a bit more and those that have less pay a bit less. That's the basic premise of how we pool our resources to get things collectively done. And it's been the working principle of Australia for decades. Now, the corporations and the gas companies and the coal barons have worked furiously alongside their millionaire mates to undermine that system, to claw back the little bit more they're asked to contribute to the pool for themselves because they are selfish and greedy. Selfish and greedy. Not wanting for others what they have for themselves. Now, in the past, it has been the role of parties in this place who proclaim themselves to be of the left to challenge that greed, to call it out, to object to the idea that selfishness is acceptable in public policy. Well, this evening, the reality as we sit here tonight is that both parties, Liberal and Labour Party, in the face of a moment in time when so many are struggling, where the cost of education is going up and people are wondering, where is my next meal going to come from? How am I going to pay that bill? How am I going to convince my landlord not to kick me out? How will I keep my kids warm in my car? Both of you, at that moment, when it has never been more urgent that we pull our resources and decide to use them in ways that are fair and just, that support people to work together, both of you want to indulge the selfish and the greedy rich. 
the Clive Palmers and the Gina Reinharts and the Andrew Forrests who slime around in the background of Australian politics, popping up every now and again to suggest a basics card or a new version of the Inju scheme, or to offer their thoughts on high on how somebody that's getting by on the viciously low level of job seeker could better make ends meet. You've decided to get in bed with those people and give them a tax break. Now, I am not at all surprised, having the, given that they put this idea for, uh, forward in the first place, that the Liberal Party uh, would be sitting here tonight contributing in, in, uh, to this debate uh, supporting this terrible idea. It was their pro proposition in 2018. It is, however, so soul-rackingly disappointing that even after the Australian community chucked out the Morrison government with a joy unsurpassed in recent electoral history, even after your primary vote went backwards, the Labour Party sits here tonight proposing to plough ahead with this redistribution of community funds, which, by the way, will cost in just one year almost as much as one year's value of the entire uh, pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Fifteen billion dollars in one year you are going to give back to people like Clive Palmer, and Gina Reinhart and Andrew Forrest when instead we could be using it for free childcare, to bring dental and mental health into Medicare, to do so many good things together. And why? Because you are too scared to do otherwise. It really is a flimsiness that you are bringing to the debate tonight when there is a parliament ready and willing to ensure that those funds remain in the public service, in the public good, that you will instead back selfishness and greed, despite the fact that our community has just voted for fairness and compassion and a collective working together in greater numbers than ever before. It is such a deep disappointment. Finally, I want to speak directly to this question of a windfall profits tax. Now, this is a proposal uh, put forward and championed uh, by our Treasury spokesperson, Nick McKim, and it is a very, very good idea. It is being backed globally by some of the best minds in socially uh, progressive theory and indeed even find support uh, in some areas of more traditional economists purely because it seeks to address an absolute breaking down of the traditional economic theory. A traditional economic theory, by the way, which is completely morally bankrupt, always has been, but now is failing even against its terms of success. Corporations, particularly energy companies, are right now making billions of dollars, not because they are doing any more than they once did. They're not producing more. They're not creating anything, they're engaging in vicious price gouging. Why? Because they can. Because they can. And who is paying for it? The Australian people are paying for it. A windfall profit tax gives us the opportunity to bail up people like Jerry Harvey and others, and demand that those resources be put back into the community pool. 
and made available for collective works and social endeavours that are so urgently needed in this tough time for so many. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. Uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. What a great topic to be debating at this end of the Senate week that the Senate agrees that corporate super profits tax could offset the cost of providing cost of living relief, including the provision of free childcare, truly free public education, abolishing student debt and putting dental and mental health into Medicare. This was a pro proposition that we took to the election and which resulted in the Greens having a record vote of electing six more members of parliament to this place. The idea that we should be taxing the very wealthy and using that ta those taxes to be funding services that people need and people want resonates with the Australian community. And it's not a surprise, because we have seen the tax that's being paid by the super wealthy decrease in Australia at the same time as we have seen the services being provided to Australia being decreasing in quality as well over the last, well, for decades basically, under neoliberal governments. We need to shift this. We need to acknowledge that by increasing ta taxes, by having a corporate super profit tax, by taxing the mining companies, the coal and gas companies who are making an absolute monster at the moment, by taxing them properly, by having a billionaire's tax to tax the billionaires who made massive profits out of COVID while the rest of us were suffering. We had billionaires like Jerry Harvey making profits out of JobKeeper and they doing exceptionally well. And particularly, we should not be going ahead with tax cuts that are going to be reducing taxes, incoming, increasing the income of the very wealthy in our society. Why on earth this incoming Labor government, who claim to be speaking for the people, are supporting the previous government's staged three tax cuts is beyond me. Because the, the critical figure that just I find astounding is the cost of those stage three tax cuts to the budget bottom line over the 10 years, over $200 billion. And we know that if that $200 billion was instead being spent in services, in supporting people, it would have a much greater impact on the health of the economy. Because we know that every dollar that you put in the pocket of somebody on a low income, it gets spent. If you're putting a dollar in the pocket of somebody who earns over $200,000, the likelihood is it just gets put away in investments, or it gets on spent on overseas travel, or it gets spent, spent on other, other things that are not generating the same amount of economic activity if you spend that money. If we increase income support, if we increase the income of the lowest people in our society, the people are absolutely struggling to get by, who are living in poverty. Every extra dollar you put in the pocket of somebody who is surviving on JobKeeper at the moment will be spent. It will be spent at the local shops. It will be spent buying, food, buying basic food, vegetables, clothing, shoes. It will be spent on the absolute essentials in, in, of life. And we know that by spending money in that way, that's going to be, have a much greater contribution to our economy than giving tax cuts to the very wealthy who do not need those tax cuts, who absolutely do not need those tax cuts. So, as I said, this was a platform that we took the election. This resonated with people. The concept of the basics of free dental care and mental health care being included under Medicare so people could afford to go and get their teeth fixed. The idea of fr genuinely free education from childcare right through to tertiary education. These are the uh, ideas that resonate with the Australian society because they, we know that they are fair. They are creating a fairer, more just, more sustainable society. And we know that by doing that, we get healthier people and it leads to a healthier community, community for all of us. These are the sort of measures that the Australian people want to see, and they are the measures that we can afford to take. 
We can afford to be taxing the very wealthy, the people who are making a huge amount of money, and to be spending that money on the services that we need and that we deserve. In the case of income support, we, it is our duty to be lifting people out of poverty. It is immoral that we as a society have a vast number of people, three million families, living under the poverty line. And it's a political choice to be leaving there, living in poverty. 600,000 children sing, as, uh, um, in single parent families living under the poverty line. We need to be taking action to be increasing income support so that that's no longer the case, so that they can afford to be living a decent life, so they can afford to be putting food on the table. It is a political choice that we're not, and the Greens absolutely and unashamedly will continue to speak up for increasing the taxes on those that can afford to pay so that we can spend the money on the services that we all need. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, actually, I think you might need to say the first words here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the President has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. I call the Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Thank you. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. I also table a document relating to an order for the production of documents concerning the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. I rise to take note of the document. I am seeking leave to speak. Thank you. Is leave granted? Think about it, Murray. Tick tock. Five thirty. Absolutely. And I thank the um, collaboration around the chamber um, to uh, to facilitate. Oh, they're, they're words that I'm actually going to mention, Minister, transparency and accountability, and how quickly uh, the Labor government has been unmasked for their mockery of transparency and accountability, particularly when it comes to uh, their response to the foot and mouth um, disease. First, last week, they tried to send an examination of their response that was backed by the Greens, obviously into varroa mite, but ourselves into foot and mouth disease, uh, to a committee that was actually uh, controlled by them. And this week, in response to an order for production of documents uh, lodged, where the questions asked of the Prime, Minister's, Prime Minister and his department and office were, we want to know when you requested advice and when you were alerted to the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia. We also requested uh, for information around the cooperation with state governments from the PMO and the department in response to the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia. You wouldn't think on a matter of uh, public importance such as this, of public commentary such as this, that the Prime Minister, his office and his department uh, would have any issue. You know, Minister Watt, such a fabulous uh, new minister, Thank rang you. us straight away. Uh, our department secretaries met. I was fully briefed. I requested a brief. I wanted to understand how his trip uh, to Indo went, etc., who he's met with, who he hasn't. But instead of actually providing the Senate, the Parliament, and the Australian public and our livestock industries uh, with answers to that, Questions, very simple questions. Instead, what's been tabled here tonight in the Senate is the government claiming a public interest immunity claim over those very, very simple questions, hiding what they knew 
and when they knew it about the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Bali and its impact on our communities, particularly in rural and regional Australia, on our trading status as a nation more broadly. I think he's actually, you know, is it to pre protect the minister, who, whose flat footed response on this has been well canvassed in this place over the last two weeks? Is it actually to protect somebody else? On what grounds is a government failing to answer the basic questions that any minister, let alone the Prime Minister and his office, should be asking with such an issue unfolding on our shores? Uh, in, uh, across the way in Indonesia. When did you know? What did you know? What did you ask for? And heaven help us if you can't stop it in the border. And as I have said repeatedly, we all want you to be successful on this. We want you to stop foot and mouth, a lumpy skin disease, other biosecurity risks reaching our shore. But heaven help us if it, our borders are breached. What are you doing with our state and territory governments to ensure we cauterise that? There should be no secret about that. This was a topic discussed at the Agriculture Minister meeting. There shouldn't be any issues around this. Minister Watt's team should have been briefing the Prime Minister on the outcome of that MINCO, at the very least at departmental official uh, level, let alone if it wasn't Minister to Prime Minister. So what have they got to hide? What don't they want the Australian Senate to know? What don't they want our peak industry bodies to know about their response and who knew what when? For a Prime Minister that's made a lot of noise about a different kind of politics in this place, of transparency, of accountability, well, in this chamber we take these things seriously. And I do thank senators around the chamber for um, assisting to have this conversation tonight and to get this document into the public sphere of a government seeking to cover up at literally two minutes before Senator German, the only place in the Australian parliament that provides the type of oversight and accountability uh, that we need to ensure executive government uh, is held accountable, is held up to the light so that Australians can be aware of what executive government uh, is doing. And on an issue as, as serious as this has been, with the fumbles and missteps that we've seen from the minister, um, you know, we've seen him wanting to run out the Defence Force today. He didn't worry about the, you know, he was dismissive of foot mats three weeks ago, but we're going to get the Defence Force on the case today. Because you know what? It is an issue. You are taking it seriously. And the people aren't being hysterical, but they're concerned with this government's response. And senators have asked the question around this chamber for two weeks. What are you doing? Update us. What are you doing? And you know, what's been tabled by the Prime Minister's office today uh, by the minister is a shame. And we will be pursuing this further. And we will be asking for ministers to attend the chamber and explain when we come back here. It is unacceptable. And Australians expected better. They took him at his word when he said transparency and accountability. And in the first sitting week, he's failed at every single hurdle to provide it. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, uh, Senator Mackenzie. Leave is granted. Uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn and Senator O'Neill. Very much, um, President. And uh, I rise um, to put on the record my response to some material that I've received um, by correspondents and also uh, handed to me in consultations that I've had while I've been here in these first two weeks of the parliament. And, um, it's very clear uh, that as we come to this task of serving our nation, the people around this chamber represent a range of views uh, in, in all areas. Uh, some are people of faith, some are people of no faith, and there are a whole lot of people who might not have made up their mind and could be anywhere on a journey in between those two things. But we bring to our work here 
a common belief in the dignity of each person and the value of that in a democracy. And that is the fundamental oil that we need for this machine to work. Uh, there have been attempts throughout history to silence voices at the, at the margins, particularly the LGBTIQ community, over many, many years. At this time, I fear that there have been also significant attempts to silence the voices of faith communities. Uh, that is not to excuse any of the terrible things that have happened. That is not to say anything of the problem with the faith communities that we know has been documented through institutional abuse. Those realities cannot be denied. But if we are to move forward as a nation, we need to keep returning to that sense of multiple voices. When we get it right, we sound like a choir, and when we don't, we sound like a cacophony. And we've got to find a way forward. So it is important, I think, to put on the record two important things that happened in the recent days. Um, I had a meeting with Alpha Crucis University College representatives this week, or this week, it was earlier this week, and they reminded uh, me of a, a visit that I had to the St Philip's Teaching School in the Hunter region, which is one of seven teacher training hubs that is underway. We know that there is a crisis in teaching. These seven hubs that are being facilitated through a community of faith who believe in the power of education as being transformative and obviously want to prioritise teaching in a particular tradition, which is a Christian tradition, are now being rolled out in Teaching School Alliance Sydney, which is elite sandstone schools, at the St Thomas Aquinas Teaching School in Tasmanian Catholic Diocese. And I see Senator Billick is here, and it's great to see Tasmania being involved in this sort of research as well, not just the mainland. CEM training, Teacher Training School, which is a regional Christian education network, and very importantly to me, in the seat of Parks, a northwest New South Wales cluster in a public school network. Critically, this work is being in inspired by a sense of faith in action in the community to make uh, life better for very many people, and uh, it's proving incredibly successful in keeping 95 per cent of the graduates uh, of the enrollees in the program. Uh, so there is a lot of research being done about that, and I want to acknowledge that leadership. Um, I also want to speak very briefly, and I encourage people to look at a document that was provided to me by the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference. Um, the Australian Catholic uh, Church is celebrating Social Justice Sunday on the 28th of August, and there is a report um, that I have read from them in which I think there is some very significant truth-telling. This will just give you a little taste of the humility, I think, that is important for the church to bring to the public conversation. The voice shouldn't be silenced. The work can be done. But this is a telling truth, I think, that is important. And I read about Ellen and her sister Frances, who were adult survivors of an abusive relationship in their Christian family during their childhood. And this is what they write. Domestic abuse is not restricted to Christian culture, but it's important that we realise the power of religious manipulation to keep people in abusive relationships. Abusers and survivors can use various religious lenses to justify their reasons. The church must begin to recognise and condemn the use of biblical references to justify abuse. Male headship in the home does not give a man the right to abuse his wife. Yet to both the abuser and the abused, biblical interpretation plays a crucial role in how the relationship is perceived. Many Christian women who experience intimate partner abuse feel it is their duty as a Christian wife to sacrifice and forgive their spouse. The children in these relationships often feel they must respect the father and not say anything about what is truly going on in the home. When it comes to sharing our story with our Christian friends, we must both feel incredible resistance from people listening and to accepting our family narrative. They think we are lying. Important to have those conversations. The language of faith, the language not of faith, should never be allowed to continue to result in the terrible tragedy of Thank you, Senator. home Your violence, time has family violence. Senator Billy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was waiting for someone on that side to get the call. Thank you, President. I was pleased to hear about the Albanese Labor government's decision on the 1st of July this year to approve the Grace Tome Foundation for deductible gift recipient status. This means Australians can make monetary donations or donations of property to the Foundation and can claim a tax deduction for the value of their donation. 
The Foundation offers lived experience-based advice to promote the prevention and control of sexual abuse and raises public awareness of sexual abuse in institutional settings. I've met Grace Tame um, a couple of times. I've spoken with her a couple of times, and I've got to say she's one of the most impressive young people I have met. She's a fierce, powerful and courageous advocate for ending the practice of grooming and child sexual abuse. And the way she's confronted her own trauma and used that story as a weapon in the fight against child sexual abuse is inspiring. She is one very strong young woman. I'd like to thank Minister Rishworth and Assistant Minister Lee for adding the foundation to the Register of Harm Prevention Charities within six weeks of the election. Sadly, the foundation's application for charity status was first submitted on 1 July 2021, and that means the previous government held the application back for 44 weeks, almost a year, without approving it. And I'd be interested to hear the previous government's <laughs> excuse for delaying the approval for so long. I mean, we do know that Ms Tame revealed publicly that she'd been threatened before the election to support the former Prime Minister or risk losing the government's support for the foundation. Was that what happened? This delay was at best an egregious failure in administration by the previous government or, at worst, ideologically motivated. This is just one of the multiple harm prevention charities that should have received DGR status long ago, but now it has fallen to Labor to clear the backlog. Among the other charities are Consent Labs Limited, a charity that aims to promote the prevention of sexual abuse, uh, physical and emotional abuse. Carlton Respects, established by the Carlton Football Club, which promotes the prevention or control of abusive behaviour, in particular violence against women and increasing gender equality. The Healthy Minds Club, a men's mental health organisation. KY Up Project Limited, a charity that aims to promote the prevention and control of self-harm, physical, emotional and sexual abuse. The Jack Beasley Foundation, the Jack Beasley Fund, my apologies. Jack Beasley Fund Incorporated, whose purpose is to bring about changes to the culture around knife crime. The Australian Jewish Association Incorporated, whose purpose is to protect the Jewish community within Australia, particularly from anti-Semitism, anti and to facilitate cooperation, harmony and peaceful coexistence within Australian society. Ping Health Community Association Incorporated, whose purpose is to promote harm prevention through combined education. And I mentioned lastly this one because it's one of my favourite charities. I've got three or four but, um, that I spend a lot of time and effort with, and that's A Fairer World. Based in Hobart, A Fairer World provides ways for schools, workplaces and the Tasmanian community to learn, connect and act together for positive social change. I've had a fair bit to do with the Fairer World over the years, attending and supporting school expos they ran with their diversity education program and their Are You Making a Difference or Are You Mad program. I've also seen the amazing work they do um, and that they've done more recently with their human libraries, which used trained volunteers known as, known as human books to promote understanding and inclusion through telling their personal stories. In fact, I'm proud to say I've remained one of their members for many, many years. So it is to the great shame of those opposite that they've held up these DGR status applications for so long. We know that DGR status provides a great incentive for donors and every day of delay in applying for DGR status costs the charities money. It's now fallen, like a whole lot of other things, to the Albanese Labor government to clear the backlog of delayed applications left by the previous government. These are all very deserving charities, every single one of them. They're all doing amazing work in the community and they deserve to have their applications dealt with in a timely manner, not to be held up because of some ideological view and because somebody opposed or, or said something that the Prime Minister didn't like. That is absolutely abhorrent behaviour. Thank you, Senator Billick. Your time has expired. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, President. Now, this month, the AFL will make a decision on the Tasmanian bid for an AFL team, a 19th team, a standalone team. And to put it simply, Tasmania should have a team in the AFL. 
We are, in fact, a foundation AFL state. We are home to some of the oldest AFL clubs in the country, the club where I played, the club where my sons played, the Devonport Football Club, was founded in 1881, before many of the current AFL clubs came into being. Ta Tasmania is, on, is an AFL state, and for the AFL to be a truly national competition, Tasmania should have a team. The Tasmanian government has submitted a bid to the AFL, which seeks, as I said, a standalone team, a 19th team in the national competition. That submission clearly shows that a Tasmanian AFL team stacks up. A subsequent report commissioned by the AFL, conducted by Colin Carter, likewise concludes that a Tasmanian team stacks up. In fact, the Carter report says, today the AFL's purpose is to progress the game so that everyone can share in its heritage and its possibilities. Presumably, this also applies to Tasmania. It seems fair to argue that the onus of proof is not on Tasmania to justify its inclusion. It is on those who say it should be excluded. That is the quote from the Carter report. Having established the case for a team in the AFL, at the last minute another hurdle has been put in the way of Tasmania. Apparently now we need to have a new stadium. What's happened all of a sudden? It wasn't part of the submission from the Tasmanian government. It wasn't required in the Carter report. In fact, the Carter report talked about having a stadium strategy. We're very comfortable with that. We have two very good stadiums in Tasmania at, um, at Bell Reeve Oval uh, and at York Park in Launceston, which currently host AFL games. So, what's, so, so why this sudden requirement? Has the AFL suddenly got cold feet? Are they trying to put a last-minute hurdle in Tasmania's way? It, they shouldn't. And if you look at the history of new teams coming into the AFL, none of them have had that hurdle. Brisbane came in in 1987. They started at Carrara before moving to the Gabba in 1997. Uh, and those two ovals both have had development over the years, not a pre-requirement pre for the team to come into the competition. The West Coast Eagles came in in 1987. They didn't get a new stadium for more than 30 years. Adelaide in 1991 didn't see new major development for over 20 years. Fremantle in 95, obviously benefiting from the new stadium in Perth. And likewise, uh, Port Adelaide, uh, 20 years after they came in until a new stadium was built. The Gold Coast came in in 2008. Their advantage was the Commonwealth Games in 2018, where their stadium was significantly upgraded for that um, uh, event. Uh, and of course, GWS are still developing their stadium. So, given that history, on what basis does the AFL think it can suddenly put a hurdle in Tasmania's way? Can I say congratulations to Tasmanian Premier Rockliffe? for saying it how it is. We have two stadiums. We're not going to be dictated to by the AFL. We won't be stood over. And we won't be patronised by the, uh, the AFL like we have for years. In the AFL Hall of Fame, there are 24 legends. Four of those are Tasmanian. Baldock, Hart, Hudson, Stewart. Tasmania has as many legends of the game in the Hall of Fame as South Australia and Western Australia combine. We have a very proud heritage in the game. I've had AFL teams, clubs coming to me over the last three years seeking funding for their community developments. But why can't Tasmania as a community have its own team? So here's the rub from my perspective, President. Perhaps the message from this place should be to the AFL that not a single dollar of Commonwealth money goes to any club until Tasmania has its 19th Thank team you, in Senator the competition. Thank you, Senator Colbert. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. I rise to speak tonight to remember and celebrate the life of Bill Chandler OAM, who passed away peacefully on the 24th of July. At his funeral on Monday, Bill was described as a giant in the world of planning 
a towering figure for more than half a century across the built environment professions, with an immense impact locally, nationally and globally. Rod Duncan, a pretty significant figure himself in the planning profession, went on to say that Bill was not a daunting or overwhelming sort of giant, but mellow, approachable and welcoming, so somehow managing to make everyone feel like they were his special confidant. A sort of Uncle Bill, with his grey beard, bulging briefcase and grey coat, just off the train from Surrey Hills. And that's how I knew Bill. I worked with Bill in the mid-2000s when I was a councillor at the City of Maribyrnong and chair of the Metropolitan Transporting Forum, working for Sustainable Transport, and we engaged Bill to do some research and campaigning work with us. And I stayed in touch with Bill since then, and particularly since I was elected to the Senate, Bill made sure to stay in touch with me. He appreciated in particular being in touch with the politics of action and inaction on climate in this place. Bill had sustained pressure on, federal, on his federal members of parliament over humanitarian and environmental issues over many years, including part of his local climate group, Lighter Footprints. And then Bill stood as an independent in the seat of Kuyong at the 2019 election. And his work in this campaign, alongside that of fellow climate independent Oliver Yates and our Greens candidate Julian Burnside, was a significant factor in paving the way for the successful election of independent Monique Ryan at this year's election. At Bill's funeral, Rod Duncan summarised his career, that Bill joined the Australian Royal Australian Planning Institute in 1966 and was an office bearer from the 1970s. His commitment into what matured into the Planning Institute of Australia extended over 56 years, only recently stepping down as managing editor of its monthly journal. By 1974, in addition to his day job, Bill was lecturing a room full of future leaders in the profession who had enrolled in Melbourne Uni's new graduate diploma program. Beyond occasional formal teaching roles, Bill was a perpetual educator through innumerable conferences, publications and conversations. He was a great communicator and built lifelong connections. And as a vocal advocate of social justice and equality, he was diligent in ensuring female practitioners were heard and encouraged. Bill was early to recognise that planning alone was only part of the toolkit for enriching cities and societies. And so he embraced allied perspectives and professions that also influence urban conditions and outcomes. And in particular, Bill was recognised as being pivotal to the development of the field of urban design in Australia. Planner John Byrne said, Australian cities owe Bill a debt. You cannot conceive how we would have got to here without him, for he was central over decades to the creation and promotion of the critically important national urban design dialogue as activist, teacher, professional, communicator, mentor, catalyst, networker and organiser. Um, I received today, hot off the press, the latest edition of Planning News, the journal that Bill was the managing editor of for so long, which features glowing tributes to Bill Chandler. In remembering him, they, noticed, they noted that they had been overwhelmed at the number of warm and heartfelt tributes to Bill which had been flowing in. And Bill's family have shared some of these tributes with me, many of them from some pretty luminary figures in the field of planning. Rob Adams described Bill as truly a remarkable man who helped so many of us to share his wisdom. He was tireless, optimistic and always humorous campaigner for better people places, and our cities are better as a result of Bill's life's work. Marcus Spiller said, in his passing, I've come to appreciate Bill as the unofficial coach of planning in Victoria, not the belligerent carping type, but rather inspiring his players with his crystal clarity on what planning stands for. And younger planner Ben Cook noted how many generations of planners benefited from Bill's energy, enthusiasm and experience. At events, you always knew when Bill was in the room, centrally positioned, more often than not with a full glass of red, with planners orbiting around him in and out of uh, conversation. And not surprisingly, Bill was also passionate about his local patch, Surrey Hills. He was one of the leaders of a campaign against a massive right road flyover in the 1970s. He edited the Surrey Hills Neighbourhood News from its inaugural edition in 1982. And he said that he see, I see my life as a citizen first and an urban planner second. Bill's health had deteriorated in recent years with his cancer and his cancer treatment, but he continued to contribute. He survived by his wife, Roz, and their children, Andrew, Elizabeth and Thank Kate. You, and Senator I Rice acknowledge and Andrew Pazic and Audrey yeah, in the gallery expired. tonight. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again on Monday, the 5th of September at 10am. Thank you.